Edward's Day Out Once upon a time there was a little engine called Edward. He lived in a shed with five other engines. They were all bigger than Edward and boasted about it. They said, The driver won't choose you again. He wants big, strong engines like us. Edward hadn't been out for a long time, and he began to feel sad. Just then, the driver and fireman came along to start work. The driver looked at Edward and said, What's the matter? Are you feeling sad, hmm? Would you like to come out today, hmm? And Edward said, Oh, yes, please. So the fireman lit the fire and made a nice lot of steam. Then the driver pulled the lever and Edward puffed away. And he blew his whistle. Look at me. 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 The other engines were very cross at being left behind. And away went Edward to get some coaches. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. At last, Edward found the coaches, and they said, Oh, please be careful, Edward. Don't bump and bang us like the other engines do. So Edward came up to the coaches very, very gently. <sighs> and the shunter fastened the coupling. The coaches were very pleased. Thank you, Edward. That was kind. We are glad you're taking us today. Then they went to the station where the people were waiting. Here we are, shh, shh, 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 here we are, Come along, get in quickly, please. So the people got in quickly and Edward waited happily for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. He waited and waited, and there was no whistle and no green flag. Edward was getting anxious. <laughs> Where is that guard? The driver and fireman asked the station master. Um, have you seen the guard, hmm? No. They asked the porter, Uh, have you seen the guard? Uh, yes, last night. Edward began to get cross. Are we ever going to start? Just then, a little boy shouted, Here he comes! And there the guard was, running down the hill, with his flags in one hand and a sandwich in the other. He ran onto the platform, blew his whistle, and jumped into his van. Edward puffed off. Here we go. Shh, shh. 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 He did have a happy day. All the children ran to wave as he went past, and he met old friends at all the stations. He worked so hard that the driver promised to take him out again next day and he told the other engines in the shed that night, I'm going out again tomorrow. What do you think of that, hmm? But he didn't hear what they thought, for he was so tired and happy that he fell asleep at once. Edward and Gordon one of the engines in Edward's shed was called Gordon. He was very big and very proud. You watch me this afternoon, little Edward. When I rush through with the express, that'll be a splendid sight for you. 
Just then, his driver pulled the lever. Goodbye, little Edward. Look out for me this afternoon. Goodbye, little Edward. Edward went off too to do some shunting. Edward liked shunting. It was fun playing with trucks. He would come up quietly and give them a quick pull, and the trucks would scream out, "Oh, oh, 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 oh! Whatever's happening?" Then Edward would stop quickly, and the silly trucks would bump into each other. Oh, 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 oh! Edward pushed them until they were running nicely, and when they weren't expecting it, he would stop. One of them would be sure to run onto the other line. Edward played till there were no more trucks. Then he stopped to rest. Presently, he heard a whistle, <whistles> and Gordon came puffing along, very slowly. And very crossly, <whistles> instead of nice shining coaches, he was pulling a lot of very dirty coal trucks. A goods train, <whistles> a goods train. <whistles> the shame of it. <whistles> the shame of it. <whistles> The shame of it! Oh dear! Oh dear! He went slowly through with the trucks clattering and banging behind him. Edward laughed, and went to find some more trucks. Soon afterwards, a porter came and spoke to Edward's driver. Yeah, Gordon can't get up the hill. Will you take Edward and push him, please? They found Gordon halfway up the hill, and he was very cross. His driver and fireman were talking to him severely. You're not trying, Gordon. You're not trying at all. And Gordon said, "I can't do it. I can't do it." The noisy trucks hold an engine back so. If there were coaches now, clean, sensible things that come quietly, that would be different. Edward's driver came up. Yer,、yeah. we've come to push you. Oh, it's no use at all. Well, you wait and see. They brought the train back to the bottom of the hill. Edward came up behind the brake van. <whistles> I'm ready. <whistles> It's no good. The guard blew his whistle, and they pulled and pushed as hard as they could. Gordon pulled. I can't shh, do it. Shh, I can't shh, do it. Edward pushed. I will. Shh, Do it! I will do it. I can't do it. I will do it. Edward pushed and puffed and puffed and pushed as hard as ever he could, and almost before he realised it, Gordon found himself at the top of the hill. I've done it! I've done it! I've done it! And he forgot all about Edward pushing behind. He didn't wait to say thank you, but ran on so fast that he passed two stations before his driver could make him stop. Edward had pushed so hard that when he got to the top, he was out of breath. Gordon ran on so fast that Edward was left behind. The guard waved and waved, but Edward couldn't catch up. He ran on to the next station, 
and there the driver and fireman said they were very pleased with him. The fireman gave him a nice long drink. Mm. And the driver said, I'll get my paint out tomorrow and give you a beautiful new coat of blue with red stripes. Then you'll be the smartest engine in the shed. The Sad Story of Henry Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. It went into a tunnel and squeaked through its funnel and never came out again. The engine's name was Henry. His driver and fireman argued with him, but he wouldn't move. He said, No, no. I shan't come out, so there. The rain will spoil my lovely green paint with red stripes. No! The guard blew his whistle till he had no more breath and waved his flags till his arms ached. But Henry stayed in the tunnel and blew steam at him. Go away! Go away! I'm not going to spoil my lovely green paint and red stripes for you. The passengers came and argued too, but Henry would not move. No! No! Leave me alone. A fat director who was on the train told the guard to get a rope. Um, fetch a rope, will you? That's right. Now, Henry, we will pull you out. But Henry only blew steam at him and made him wet. Leave me alone. They hooked the rope on and all pulled except the fat director. Um, my doctor has forbidden me to pull, don't you know? They pulled and pulled and pulled, but still Henry stayed in the tunnel. Then they tried pushing from the other end. The fat director said, One, a two, a three, push! But he didn't help himself. He said, my doctor has uh, forbidden me to push. They pushed and pushed and pushed. But still Henry stayed in the tunnel. At last, another train came. The guard waved his red flag and stopped it. The two engine drivers, the two firemen and the two guards went and argued with Henry. Look, Henry, it stopped raining. Yes, but it'll begin again soon, and what would become of my green paint with red stripes then? Mm -hmm. So they brought the other engine up, and it pushed and puffed. <whistles> and puffed and pushed. as hard as ever it could. But still Henry stayed in the tunnel. So they gave it up, and the fat director told Henry, We shall leave you there for always and always and always. They cut a new tunnel through the hill, they took up the old rails, and they built a big brick wall in front of Henry. Now Henry can't get out, and he watches the trains rushing through the new tunnel. He's very sad because no one will ever see his lovely green paint with red stripes again. But I think he deserved it, don't you?
Edward, Gordon and Henry. Edward and Gordon often went through the tunnel where Henry was shut up. Edward would say, <coughs> Hello. And Gordon would say, <coughs> Serves you right. Poor Henry had no steam to answer. His fire had gone out. Soot and dirt from the tunnel roof had spoiled his lovely green paint and red stripes. He was cold and unhappy and wanted to come out and pull trains too. Gordon always pulled the express. He was proud of being the only engine strong enough to do it. There were many heavy coaches full of important people like the fat director who'd punished Henry. Gordon was seeing how fast he could go. Faster, 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 faster. Faster, 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 faster. Faster, 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 faster. And the coaches went. Gordon could see Henry's tunnel in front, and he thought to himself, in a minute, I'll just go <laughs> at Henry and rush through and out into the open again. Closer and closer he came. He was almost there <laughs> when... <laughs> oh, dear! Oh, what's happened? <laughs> <laughs> Gordon was in a cloud of steam and going slower and slower. <laughs> oh, oh, so much else. His driver stopped the train. Oh, what has happened to me? Oh, oh, I feel so weak. And the driver said, You've burst your safety valve. You can't pull the train any more. Oh, dear. And we were going so nicely, too. Look at Henry laughing at me. Gordon made a face at Henry and blew smoke at him. Stop it. Everybody got out and came to see Gordon. The fat director said, Hmm, yes, I never liked these big engines. Always going wrong. Send for another engine at once. While the guard went to find one, they uncoupled Gordon and ran him onto a siding out of the way. The only engine left in the shed was Edward. Um, Edward, Gordon isn't feeling very well. Will you come and pull his coaches for him? Well, I'll try. Gordon saw Edward coming. Oh, he's no use. Edward can't pull a train. Edward puffed and pulled and pulled and puffed but he couldn't move the heavy coaches i told you so why not let henry try hmm? and the fat director said all right i will um henry uh, will you help pull this train and henry was delighted oh yes uh, certainly uh, only too pleased so gordon's driver and fireman lit his fire some plate layers broke down the wall and put back the rails and when he had steam up henry puffed out he was dirty his boiler was black and he was covered with cobwebs oh shh, oh shh, i'm so stiff Shh, I'm so stiff. Shh. You'd better have a run and ease your joints and find a turntable. Henry came back feeling much better, and they put him in front. Edward said, I'm ready. Shh. So am I. <laughs> Pull hard. Shh. Pull hard. Shh. We'll do it. Shh. We'll do it. Shh. Pull hard. Shh. We'll do it. Shh. The heavy coaches jerked and began to move. <laughs>
slowly at first, then faster and faster. We've done it together. We've done it together. We've done it together. We've done it together. Hooray, you've done it. Hooray, you've done it. Hooray, you've done it. All the passengers were so excited, the fat director leaned out of the window to wave to Edward and Henry. But the train was going so fast that his hat blew off into a field where a goat ate it for his tea. They never stopped till they came to the big station at the end of the line. The passengers all got out and said thank you, and the fat director promised Henry a new coat of paint. Would you like blue and red? Hmm? Oh, yes, please. Then I'll be like Edward and Gordon. That will be nice. Thomas and Gordon. Thomas was a tank engine who lived at a big station. He had six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler and a short stumpy dome. He was a fussy little engine, always pulling coaches about. He pulled them to the station, ready for the big engines to take out on long journeys. And when trains came in and the people had got out, he would pull the empty coaches away so that the big engines could go and rest. He was cheeky too. He used to play tricks on the other engines. He liked to come quietly beside them and make them jump. One day Gordon was resting on a siding. He was very tired. The big express had been late. He was just going to sleep when Thomas came up in his cheeky way. <laughs> Wake up, lazy bones! <laughs> Do some hard work for a change. You can't catch me! <laughs> and he ran off laughing. Instead of going to sleep again, Gordon thought how he could pay Thomas out. One morning, Thomas wouldn't wake up. It was nearly time for the express. The people were waiting, but the coaches weren't ready. At last, Thomas started. Oh, dear. Oh, ah, sure. The coaches were very impatient. Come on, hurry up, hurry up. We'll be late. Thomas gave them a rude bump. Oh, 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 oh and started for the station. <laughs> Come on, stop dawdling, stop dawdling. The coaches were now very cross. Where have you been? Where have you been? Thomas fussed into the station, and Gordon said, <laughs> Hurry up, you. <laughs> Hurry up yourself. Don't worry, I will. And almost before the coaches had stopped moving, Gordon came out of his siding and was coupled to the train. <laughs> Come on, get in quickly, please. So the people got in quickly. The signal went down, the clock struck the hour, the guard waved his green flag, and Gordon was ready to start. Thomas usually pushed behind the big trains to help them start, but he was always uncoupled first, so that when the train was running nicely, he could stop and go back. This time he was late, and Gordon started so quickly that they forgot to uncouple Thomas. <laughs> the heavy train slowly began to move out of the station. Gordon grunted at the coaches. Come on, 
Come on. Shh. Thomas teased Gordon. Pull harder. Pull harder. <laughs> the train went faster and faster. Too fast for Thomas. He wanted to stop, but he couldn't. <laughs> stop! Stop! I can't keep up. You're going too fast. Gordon laughed. <laughs> Faster, 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 faster. And the coaches chuckled with glee. You can't get away, you can't get away, you can't get away, you can't get away. Poor Thomas was going faster than he'd ever been before. He was out of breath and his wheels hurt him, but he had to go on and on and on. Oh dear, 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 oh dear. I shall never be the same again. I shall never be the same again. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. My wheels will be quite worn out. At last they stopped. Everyone laughed to see Thomas puffing and panting behind. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. They uncoupled him and he ran onto a siding out of the way. Gordon chuckled as he passed. <laughs> well, little Thomas, now you know what hard work means, don't you, hmm? Poor Thomas couldn't answer. He had no breath. He just puffed slowly away to rest. <laughs> and he had a long, long drink. <sighs> and he was careful afterwards never to be cheeky to Gordon again. Thomas's Train Thomas often grumbled because he was not allowed to pull passenger trains. The other engines laughed. <laughs> you are too impatient, Thomas. You'd be sure to leave something behind. <laughs> This annoyed Thomas. Rubbish! You just wait. I'll show you. One night, he and Henry were alone. Henry was ill. The men worked hard on him, but he didn't get better. Now, Henry usually pulled the first train in the morning, and Thomas had to get his coaches ready. And Thomas thought to himself, Now, if Henry is ill, perhaps... I shall pull his train. And Thomas ran off and found the coaches. <laughs> come along, come along. The coaches were very grumpy. There's plenty of time, there's plenty of time. <laughs> Thomas took them to the platform and wanted to run round in front at once. But his driver wouldn't let him. Now, don't be impatient, Thomas. So Thomas waited and waited. The people got in. The guard and the station master walked up and down. The porters banged the doors. And still Henry didn't come. Thomas got more and more excited every minute. The fat director came out of his office to see what was the matter. And the guard and the station master told him about Henry. Well... Henry's not very well today. We'll um, find another engine. Well, there's only Thomas. Well, you'll have to do it then, Thomas. Uh, be quick now. So Thomas ran round to the front and back down onto the coaches, ready to start. He was so excited his driver had to say to him, Now don't be impatient, Thomas. Wait till everything is ready. Thomas was too excited to listen to a word he said. What happened then, no one knows. Perhaps they forgot to couple Thomas to the train. Perhaps Thomas was too impatient to wait till they were ready. Or perhaps his driver pulled the lever by mistake. Anyhow, Thomas started. People shouted and waved at him, but he didn't stop. Thomas thought to himself, ha! They're waving because I'm such a splendid engine. Huh. Henry says it's hard to pull trains, but I think it's easy. 
and he pretended to be like Gordon. <laughs> faster, 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 faster. <laughs> faster, 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 faster. As he passed the first signal box, he saw the man leaning out, waving and shouting. And he thought to himself, they're pleased with me. They've never seen me pulling a train before. It's nice of them to wave. <laughs> and he hurried on. <laughs> faster, 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 faster. <laughs> faster, 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 faster. But he came to a signal at danger. Oh, bother. I must stop. Oh, and I was going so nicely, too. <laughs> What a nuisance signals are. And he blew an angry <laughs> One of the signalmen ran up. Hello, Thomas. What are you doing here, hmm? Well, I'm pulling a train. Can't you see? Oh. Where are your coaches then? Thomas looked back. Why, bless me if I haven't left him behind. Yes. You'd better go back quickly and fetch them. Poor Thomas. He was so sad he nearly cried. But his driver said, Cheer up. Let's go back quickly and try again. At the station, all the passengers were talking at once. They were telling the fat director, the station master and the guard what a bad railway it was. But when Thomas came back and they saw how sad he was, they couldn't be cross. So they coupled him to the train, and this time he really pulled it. But for a long time afterwards, the other engines laughed at Thomas and said, <laughs> Look, there's Thomas, who wanted to pull a train, but forgot about the coaches. <laughs> Thomas and the Trucks Thomas used to grumble in the shed at night. I'm tired of pushing coaches. I want to see the world. The others didn't take much notice, for Thomas was a little engine with a long tongue. But one night, Edward came into the shed. He was a kind little engine, and he felt sorry for Thomas. Thomas? I've got some trucks to take home tomorrow. If you take them instead, I'll push the coaches to the yard. Thomas was delighted. Thank you, Edward. That will be nice. So they asked their drivers next day if they could change. And the drivers said, Whoa, yes. Whoa, yes. And Thomas ran off happily to find the trucks. Now trucks are silly and noisy. They talk a lot and don't attend to what they're doing. They don't listen to their engine. And when he stops, they bump into each other screaming, oh, 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 whatever is happening. And I'm sorry to say they play tricks on an engine who's not used to them. Edward knew all about trucks and he warned Thomas to be careful. But Thomas was too excited to listen. The shunter fastened the coupling and the signal dropped. Thomas was ready. The guard blew his whistle. <whistles> Thomas answered <whistles> and started off. But the trucks weren't ready. Oh, 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 wait. Thomas, wait! But Thomas wouldn't wait. Come on, shh, shh, come on, shh, shh. And the trucks grumbled slowly out of the siding onto the main line. Thomas was happy. Come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh. And the trucks grumbled, all right. Don't fuss, all right, don't fuss, bong, 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 bong. 
They clattered through stations and rumbled over bridges. Come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh. And they rushed through the tunnel in which Henry had been shut up. Then they came to the top of the hill where Gordon had stuck. And Thomas's driver said, Steady now, Thomas, steady. And he shut off the steam and began to put on the brakes. Thomas called out, We're stopping! We're stopping! And the trucks answered back, No, 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 no. And they bumped into each other. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. And before his driver could stop them, they pushed Thomas down the hill and were rattling and laughing behind him. Ha, ha! Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha, long, 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 ha ha, long, long. Poor Thomas tried hard to stop them from making him go too fast. Stop pushing, shh, 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 stop pushing, shh, 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 stop pushing, shh, 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 shh. But the trucks wouldn't stop. They just giggled in their silly way. Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha, long, 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 ha ha. Thomas was glad when they got to the bottom. Then he saw in front the place where they had to stop. Oh dear, what shall I do? They rattled through the station, and luckily the line was clear, and they swerved into the goods yard. Thomas put his brakes on tight, and he skidded along the rails. Oh, I must stop. And he shut his eyes tight. When he opened them, he saw that he'd stopped just in front of the buffers, and there watching him was the fat director. Thomas, what are you doing here, hmm? Well, I brought Edward's trucks. Oh, why did you come so fast? Well, I didn't mean to. I was pushed. Pushed? Haven't you pulled trucks before? No. Then you've a lot to learn about trucks, little Thomas. They're silly things and must be kept in their place. After pushing them about here for a few weeks, you'll know almost as much about them as Edward. Then you'll be a really useful engine. Thomas and the Breakdown Train Every day, the fat director came to the station to catch his train, and he always nodded to Thomas and said, Um, morning, Thomas. There were lots of trucks in the yard, and Thomas had to push and pull them into their right places. He worked hard. He knew now that he wasn't so clever as he'd thought, and he wanted to learn all about trucks so as to be a really useful engine. But on the siding, by themselves, were some trucks that Thomas was told he mustn't touch. There was a small coach, some flat trucks, and two queer things his driver called cranes. That's the breakdown train, Thomas, and when there's an accident, the workmen get into the coach, and the engine takes them quickly to help the hurt people and to clear and mend the line. The cranes are for lifting heavy things like engines and coaches and trucks. One day, Thomas heard an engine whistling. <coughs> help! Help! And a goods train came rushing through very fast. <coughs> help! Help! The engine, a new one called James, was frightened. His brake blocks were on fire and smoke and sparks streamed out on each side. They're pushing me! They're pushing me! Those silly trucks are pushing me! And the trucks just laughed. Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Poor James disappeared under the bridge, whistling for help. Help! Help! 
Thomas the tank engine didn't know what to do. Oh, I'd like to teach those trucks a lesson. Presently, a man came, running. James is off the line. The breakdown train, quickly. So Thomas was coupled on. The workmen jumped into their coach and off they went. Thomas worked his hardest. <whistles> faster, faster. <whistles> faster, faster. <whistles> Oh, bother those trucks and their tricks. I only hope poor James isn't hurt. <whistles> faster, faster. <whistles> they found James and the trucks at a bend in the line. The brake van and the last few trucks were on the rails, but the front ones were piled in a heap. James was in a field with a cow looking at him and his driver and fireman were feeling him all over to see if he was hurt. Never mind, James. It wasn't your fault. We always said your wooden brakes was no good. Thomas pushed the breakdown train alongside. Then he pulled the unhurt trucks out of the way. Oh, oh, oh dear, oh, don't hurt us, Thomas. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh don't hurt us, Thomas. It serves you right. It serves you right. He puffed backwards and forwards all the afternoon, and he scolded the trucks. This'll teach you a lesson. This'll teach you a lesson. And the trucks answered in groany, creaky sort of voices. Yes, it will. Oh, ah, yes, it will. Ooh, oh, oh. Then, when they put James back onto the rails, he tried to move, but he couldn't. So Thomas helped him back to the shed. The fat director was waiting anxiously for them. Well, Thomas, I've heard all about it, and I'm very pleased with you. You're a really useful engine. James shall have some proper brakes and a new coat of paint, and you, well, you shall have a branch line all to yourself. Oh, sir, thank you. Now Thomas is as happy as can be. He has a branch line all to himself and puffs proudly backwards and forwards with two coaches all day. He's never lonely because there's always some engine to talk to at the junction. Edward and Henry stop there quite often and tell him the news. Gordon is always in a hurry and doesn't stop, but he never forgets to say to Thomas, <coughs> and Thomas in return always whistles, <coughs> James and the Top Hat. James was a new engine who lived at a station at the other end of the line. He had two small wheels in front and six driving wheels behind. They weren't as big as Gordon's, and they weren't as small as Thomas's. The fat controller told him, You're a special mixed traffic engine. You'll be able to pull coaches or trucks quite easily. But trucks are not easy things to manage, and on his first day they'd push James down a hill into a field. He'd been ill after the accident, but now he had new brakes and a shining coat of red paint. The fat controller was quite kind to James. The red paint will cheer you up after your accident. You can pull coaches today, and Edward can help you. So James and Edward went together to find the coaches. Edward knew all about coaches and trucks. Be careful with the coaches, James. They don't like being bumped. Trucks are silly and noisy. They need to be bumped and taught to behave, but coaches get cross and will pay you out. They took the coaches to the platform and were both coupled on in front. The fat controller, the station master, and some little boys all came to admire James's shining rods and red paint. James was so pleased I'm a really splendid engine, 
I'm so excited. I feel like going... James let off steam. The fat controller, the station master and the guard all jumped and a shower of water fell on the fat controller's nice new top hat. Then the whistle blew and James thought they'd better go. So they went. Go on, Edward. Go on, Edward. Don't sh push, sh don't sh push, don't sh push. Edward didn't like starting quickly. Neither did the coaches. Don't go so fast. Don't go so fast. Don't go so fast. Don't go so fast. But James didn't listen. He just wanted to run away before the fat controller could call him back. He didn't even want to stop at the first station. And Edward had to say, James, James, stop at once. Even so, two coaches in front were beyond the platform before they stopped, and they had to go back to let the passengers out. Lots of people came to look at James, but as no one seemed to know about the fat controller's top hat, James felt happier. Presently, they came to the junction where Thomas was waiting with his two coaches. Thomas was pleased to see James. Hello, James. Feeling better? Yes, thank you. That's right. Ha! <whistles> huh. That's my guard's whistle. I must be off. Sorry I can't stop. I don't know what that fat controller would do without me to run his branch line. <laughs> ta -da. Ta -da. Ta -da. Ta-da! <laughs> and off he puffed with his two coaches into a tunnel. Edward and James pulled away from the junction. They passed the field where James had had his accident. The fence was mended and the cows back again. <laughs> James whistled at them but they paid no attention. On went James and Edward, through Edward's station yard, and they started to climb the hill beyond. It's ever so steep. It's ever so steep. I've done it before. I've done it before. It's steep, but we'll do it. It's steep, but we'll do it. and the two engines puffed together as they pulled the train up the long hill. They both rested at the next station, and Edward told James the story of how Gordon had stuck on the hill and he had had to push him up. James laughed so much he got hiccups. <laughs> He made so much noise, he frightened an old lady in a black bonnet, and she dropped all her parcels. <laughs> Three porters, the station master, and the guard had to run after her, picking them up. James got quieter in his shed that night. He had enjoyed his day, but he was a little afraid of what the fat controller would say about the top hat. James and the bootlace. Next morning, the fat controller spoke severely to James. If you can't behave, I shall take away your red coat and have you painted blue. So there. James didn't like that at all, and he was very rough with the coaches as he brought them to the platform. Oh. Come along, shh, shh, come along, shh, shh. And the coaches grumbled, all in good time, all in good time. Oh, stop grumbling and come on. Shh, 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 shh,
and James snorted into the station with the coaches grumbling after him. James was cross that morning. Gordon never fetches his own coaches, and he's only painted blue. Well, a splendid red engine like me should never have to fetch his own coaches. And he puffed and snorted round to the front of the train and backed onto it with a rude bump. <sharp inhale> um. Oh, 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 um, went the coaches. That was too bad. Um. And no one came near James. He felt very lonely. I'll show em. I'll show em. They think Gordon is the only engine who can pull coaches. Hmm. Then the guard blew his whistle. And James started off with a tremendous jerk. Come on. Come on. Come on. And off he went with the coaches squeaking and groaning. They clattered over the points and out onto the open line. Hurry, 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 shh, 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 hurry, 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 shh, 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 hurry, 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 shh, 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 shh. The coaches didn't like it. You're going too fast, you're going too fast, you're going too fast, you're going too fast. <laughs> And indeed, the coaches were going so fast that they swayed from side to side. James laughed and tried to go faster. But the coaches wouldn't let him. We're going to stop. 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 And they stopped. James was very worried. He said to his driver, What's the matter? What's the matter? Huh. You might as well ask. The brakes are hard on. There's a leak in the pipe, most likely. You've banged the coaches enough to make a leak in anything. The guard and the driver got down and looked at the brake pipes all along the train. At last, they found a hole where the rough treatment had made a joint work loose. The guard said, Hmm, well, how shall we mend it? James's driver thought for a moment. Well, we'll do it with newspapers and a leather bootlace. Ah, where's the bootlace coming from? We haven't got one. Well, we'll ask the passengers. So the guard made everyone get out. Um, has anyone got a leather bootlace, please? But they all said, no, 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 oh, no, no, except one man in a bowler hat called Jeremiah Jobling, who tried to hide his feet. The guard said, um, you have a leather bootlace there, I see, sir. Please give it to me. And Jeremiah Jobling said, um, No, I won't. Well, then I'm afraid, sir, I'm very much afraid that this train will have to stop where it is, and it'll be all your fault. Then the passengers all told Jeremiah Jobling what a mean man he was, and at last he gave them his laces. The driver tied a pad of newspapers tightly around the hole, and James was able to pull the train very gently. But he was a sadder and wiser James, and he took care never to bump coaches again. Troublesome Trucks James didn't see the fat controller for several days. They left James alone in the shed. He was very unhappy. Oh dear, 
I'll never be allowed out any more. I shall have to stay in this shed for always, and no one will ever see my red coat again. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> and James began to cry. Just then, the fat controller came along. Oh, I see that you're sorry, James. Well, I hope now that you'll be a better engine. You've given me a lot of trouble. People are laughing at my railway, and I don't like that at all. At all. I'm very sorry, sir. Well, that's a good engine. Well done. Now, I want you to pull some trucks for me, so run along and find them. Oh, very good, sir. <laughs> And James puffed happily away. Very soon, he met a little tank engine. Hello, James. Here are your trucks. Have you got some bootlaces ready, eh? <laughs> James took no notice, but backed down onto the trucks. Oh, no, no, oh, 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 oh. We want a proper engine, not a red monster. No, 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 boom, oh. oh. But James backed onto them and started as soon as the guard was ready. At last, they saw Gordon's Hill ahead. James's driver said, Now, look out for trouble, James. We'll go fast and get them up before they know it. Now, don't let them stop you. So James went faster, and they were soon halfway up the hill. I'm doing it! Shh, shh, I'm doing it! Shh, shh, I'm doing it! Shh, shh. I'm doing it. Oh, but it was hard work. Then suddenly there was a jerk, and James got to the top easily. Oh, I've done it. Shh, I've done it. Shh, I've done it. Shh, I've done it. Shh, hurrah! It's easy now. Shh, shh, shh. But the driver had shut off steam. Those trucks have done it again, James. We've left our tail behind. Look. Sure enough, the last ten trucks were running backwards down the hill. The coupling had snapped. But the guard was very brave. Very carefully and cleverly, he made them stop. Then he got out and walked down the line with his red flag. James backed the other trucks carefully down the hill. Well, no wonder it was easy with ten trucks running away like that. <gasps> what silly things trucks are. Now, there might have been an accident. Meanwhile, the guard had stopped Edward, who was pulling three coaches. Oh, hello, James. Shall I help you? No, thank you, Edward. I'll pull them myself. Good. Don't let them beat you. So James got ready. Right. <whistles> and off he went. I can do it. 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 Edward whistled after him. You're doing well, James. You're doing fine. And James struggled up the hill with clouds of smoke and steam pouring from his funnel. I've done it. Shh, I've done it. Shh, I've done it. Shh, I've done it. Shh, 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 shh. And James disappeared over the top. They reached their station safely and James was resting in the yard when Edward went by. <whistles> well done, James. Well done. Then James saw, walking towards him across the rails, the fat controller. Oh, dear. What will he say? What will he say? But the fat controller was smiling. <laughs> I was in Edward's train and saw everything. You've made the most troublesome trucks on the line behave. After that, you deserve to keep your red coat. 
Well done, James. James and the Express Sometimes Gordon and Henry slept in James's shed, and sometimes they talked of nothing but bootlaces. James tried to talk about engines who got shut up in tunnels and stuck on hills, but they wouldn't listen and went on talking and laughing. Gordon would say, You talk too much, little James. Now, a fine, strong engine like me has something to talk about. I'm the only engine who can pull the express. When I'm not there, they need two engines. Think of that. I've pulled expresses for years and years and never once lost my way. I seem to know the right line by instinct. Now, every wise engine knows, of course, that it's the signalman who works the points to make engines run on the right lines, but Gordon was so proud that he'd forgotten. One morning he said, Wake up, James. It's nearly time for the express. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, odd jobs? Oh, well, <laughs> we all have to begin somewhere, don't we? Now run along and get my coaches, and don't be late now. James brought Gordon's coaches to the station, and Gordon backed onto the train. He was showing off like anything. <whistles> make way there, <whistles> make way. <whistles> the fat controller was on the train with other important people. The guard blew his whistle. <whistles> and Gordon started. Look at me now. Look at me now. <laughs> Goodbye, little James. See you tomorrow. Look at me now. And the coaches glided after him out of the station. James watched the train disappear around the curve. Oh dear, I wish I could pull the express. And then he went back to work. He brought some more coaches to the platform and was just being uncoupled when he heard a mournful, quiet <whistles> And there was Gordon trying to sidle into the station without being noticed. Hello, Gordon. Is it tomorrow already, then? Gordon didn't answer. He just let off steam feebly. Pshhh. Well, did you lose your way, Gordon? No, I didn't. It was lost for me. I was switched off the main line onto the loop, and I had to go all around and back again. Perhaps it was uh, instinct, Gordon, hmm? Oh! <laughs> Meanwhile, all the passengers hurried to the booking office. Look here, we want our money back. Yes, we want our money back. Yes, money back. Money back. Everyone was making such a noise that the fat controller climbed onto a trolley and blew the guard's whistle. Now, uh, uh, w wait a moment, please. Wait a moment. Um, now, I promise you a new train if you'll all just keep quiet. Now, Gordon here can't do it, uh, but perhaps, uh, perhaps, um, James will pull it for us. Hmm? James? Oh, yes, sir. I'll try. So James was coupled on, and everyone got in again. Do your best, James. I will, sir. <whistles> and off went James. Stations and bridges flashed by. The passengers leaned out of the windows and cheered, and soon they reached the terminus. Everyone said, Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. And the fat controller said, Well done, James. Uh, would you like to pull the express sometimes? Oh, yes, please. 
Next day, when James came by, Gordon was pushing trucks in the yard. Oh, um, hello, James. Uh, uh, I like a bit of quiet work for a change, you know. I, I'm teaching these trucks manners. Uh, uh, you did well with those coaches, I hear. Mm, good. Um, we'll show them. And he gave his trucks a bump, and they went, Oh, 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 um, oh, um. James and Gordon are now good friends. James sometimes takes the express to give Gordon a rest. Gordon never talks about bootlaces, and James never talks about getting stuck on hills, but they both often talk about trucks, and what fun it is making them go, oh, 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 oh. Thomas and the Guard Thomas the tank engine is very proud of his branch line. He thinks it's the most important part of the whole railway. He has two coaches. They're old and need new paint, but he loves them very much. He calls them Annie and Clarabelle. Annie can only take passengers, but Clarabelle can take passengers, luggage, and the guard. As they run backwards and forwards along the line, Thomas sings them little songs, and Annie and Clarabelle sing too. When Thomas starts from the station, he sings, shh, 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 shh. Oh, come along, shh, 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 shh. we're rather late, shh, shh, shh. oh, come along, shh, shh, shh. we're rather late, shh, shh, shh. oh, come along, shh, shh, shh. we're rather late, shh, shh, shh. oh, come along, shh, shh. And the coaches sing, We're coming along, we're coming along, we're coming along, we're coming along. They don't mind what Thomas says to them, because they know that he's trying to please the fat controller. And they know, too, that if Thomas is cross, he's not cross with them. He's cross with the engines on the main line who've made him late. One day, they had to wait for Henry's train. It was late. Thomas was getting crosser and crosser. How can I run my line properly if Henry's always late? He doesn't realise that the fat controller depends on me. And he whistled very impatiently. <laughs> At last, Henry came along and Thomas said, Huh, where have you been, lazy bones? Oh, oh, don't be cross, Thomas, please. My system is out of order. Oh, <laughs> no one understands my case. Oh, <laughs> oh, you don't know what I suffer. <laughs> oh, rubbish, you're too fat. You need exercise. Lots of people with piles of luggage got out of Henry's train and they all climbed into Annie and Clarabelle. Thomas had to wait until they were ready. At last, the guard blew his whistle. And Thomas started off at once. The guard turned round to jump into his van, tripped over an old lady's umbrella and fell flat on his face. By the time he picked himself up, Thomas, Annie and Clarabelle were steaming out of the station. Thomas was in a hurry to get away. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, come along. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, come along. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, come along. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, come along. Shh, shh, shh. But Clarabelle didn't want to come along. No, 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 no. I've lost my nice guard. No, 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 no. I've lost my nice guard. Annie tried to tell Thomas... We haven't a guard. We haven't a guard. We haven't a guard. But Thomas was hurrying. He wouldn't listen. And on he puffed. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, come along. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, come along. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, come along. Annie and Clarabelle tried to put on their brakes. But they couldn't without the guard. And they kept crying out, Where is our guard? Where is our guard? Where is our guard? Oh, where is our guard? Thomas, please stop. 
Thomas, please stop. Thomas, please stop. Thomas, please stop. But Thomas didn't stop until they came to a signal. And the signal said, Stop! Thomas was very cross. And he said to his driver, Oh, bother that signal! What's the matter? And Thomas's driver said, Well, I don't know. The guard will tell us in a minute, Thomas. They waited and waited. But the guard didn't come. Thomas got even crosser. <whistles> Where is the guard? <whistles> Annie and Clarabelle knew, and they were crying, We've left him behind. We've left him behind. Yes, we left him behind. We left him behind. The driver, the fireman, and the passengers looked, and there was the guard running as fast as he could along the line with his flags in one hand and his whistle in the other. Everybody cheered him. He was very hot, so he sat down and had a drink and told them all about it. Thomas was very sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry, Mr. Guard. Oh, it wasn't your fault, Thomas. It was an old lady's umbrella. <laughs> Look, the signal's down. Let's make up for last time. Come on. Annie and Clarabelle were so pleased to have their guard again that they sang to Thomas, As fast as you like. As fast as you like. Yes, as fast as you like. As fast as you like. And Thomas went as fast as he could. <laughs> and they reached the end of the line quicker than ever before. Thomas goes fishing. Thomas's branch line has a station by a river. As he rumbles over the bridge, he often sees people fishing. Sometimes they stand quietly by their lines. Sometimes they actually jerk fish out of the water. Thomas often wanted to stay and watch, but his driver said, No, Thomas. What would the fat controller say if we were late, hmm? Thomas thought it would be lovely to stop by the river. I should like to go fishing. Every time he met another engine, he would say, I should like to go fishing. They all answered, Ha! Engines don't go fishing, sure. But that made Thomas impatient and he would say, Ha! Oh, silly stick in the muds! Thomas generally had to take in water at the station by the river. One day, he stopped as usual, and his fireman put the pipe from the water tower into his tank. Then he turned the tap on, but it was out of order, and no water came. Thomas said to his driver, Oh, bother! Oh, bother! Oh, I am thirsty. Oh, never mind, Thomas. We'll get some water from the river. They found a bucket and some rope and went to the bridge. Then the driver let the bucket down to the water. The bucket was old and had five holes in it, so they had to fill it, pull it up, and empty it into Thomas's tank as quickly as they could. Thomas's fireman sang, There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. <laughs> but the driver said, Never mind about Liza. You empty that bucket before you spill the water over me. Go on. At last, they finished, and Thomas started off. Shh, shh, that's good. Shh, shh, that's good. Shh, shh, that's good. Shh, shh. That's good. That's good. And Annie and Clarabelle ran happily behind. That's very much better. That's very much better. That's very much better. That's very much better. They puffed along the valley and were in the tunnel when Thomas began to feel a pain in his boiler. 
while steam hissed from his safety valve in an alarming way. <laughs> Thomas's driver said, Oh, there's too much steam. And the fireman opened the tap in the feed pipe to let more water into the boiler, but none came. Thomas groaned. Oh, oh dear, oh dear, I'm going to burst. Oh, 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 I'm going to burst. Oh, oh. They damped down his fire and struggled on, but Thomas was in a terrible state. I've got such a pain. I've got such a pain. Just outside the last station, they stopped, uncoupled Annie and Clarabel, and ran Thomas, who was still hissing fit to burst, onto a siding right out of the way. Then, while the guard telephoned for an engine inspector, and the fireman was putting out the fire, the driver wrote notices in large letters, which he hung on Thomas in front and behind. Danger. Keep away. Soon, the inspector and the fat controller arrived. Oh, cheer up, Thomas. We'll soon put you right. Yes. The driver told them what had happened. And the inspector said, Hmm, oh, so the feed pipe is blocked, eh? Hmm, well, I'll just look in the tanks. He climbed up and peered in. Then he came down and said to the fat controller, Ah, uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, look in the tank, will you, and tell me what you can see. Oh, yes, uh, certainly, inspector, certainly. He clambered up looked in, and nearly fell off in surprise. <laughs> well, I never, well, I never, Inspector. Can you see fish? Goodness gracious me, how did the fish get in there, driver? Hmm? Thomas's driver scratched his head. Mm, we must have fished them from the river. And he told them about the bucket. The fat controller laughed. <laughs> well, Thomas, oh dear, so you and your driver have been fishing, eh? <laughs> but fish don't suit you, do they? No, we must get them out. Hmm. So the driver and the fireman fetched rods and nets, and they all took turns at fishing in Thomas's tank. When they'd caught all the fish, the station master gave them some potatoes. The driver borrowed a frying pan while the fireman made a fire beside the line and did the cooking. Then they all had a lovely picnic supper of fish and chips. The fat controller finished first. Hmm, yes. Hmm, that was good. Very good indeed. Hmm, but uh, fish don't suit you, Thomas, do they? <laughs> So you mustn't do it again. <laughs> and Thomas said, No, sir, I won't. Engines don't go fishing. It's too uncomfortable. Thomas, Terence, and the snow. Autumn was changing the leaves from green to brown. The fields were changing too from yellow stubble to brown earth. As Thomas puffed along, he heard a tractor at work. One day, stopping for a signal, he saw the tractor close by. The tractor looked over the fence at Thomas and said, Hello, I'm Terence, I'm plowing. I'm Thomas, I'm pulling a train. Oh, what ugly wheels you've got. They're not ugly, they're caterpillar tracks. 
I can go anywhere with my tracks. I don't need rails. I don't want to go anywhere. I like my rails, thank you. And off went Thomas. <laughs> Winter came, and with it dark heavy clouds full of snow. Thomas's driver said, I don't like it. A heavy fall is coming. Mm, I hope it doesn't stop us. But Thomas saw that the snow was melting on the rails, and he said, Oh, this is soft stuff. There's nothing to it. And he puffed on, feeling cold but confident. They finished their journey safely, but the country was covered and the rails were two dark lines standing out in the white snow. The driver said, mm, You'll need your snow plough for the next journey, Thomas. Yes. Snow plough? Huh. Snow plough? Oh. Snow is silly soft stuff. It won't stop me. Now, just you listen to me, young Thomas. We are going to fix your snow plough on, and I want no nonsense, please. The snowplough was heavy and uncomfortable and made Thomas cross. He shook it and he banged it. And when they got back, it was so damaged that the driver had to take it off. You're a very naughty engine, Thomas. And he shut the shed door for the night. Next morning, both driver and fireman came early and worked hard to mend the snowplough. But they couldn't make it fit properly. It was time for the first train. Thomas was pleased. <laughs> I shan't have to wear it. I shan't have to wear it. I didn't need that stupid old thing yesterday, and I shan't need it today. <laughs> Snow can't stop me. <laughs> and he rushed off into the tunnel, thinking how clever he was. At the other end, he saw a heap of snow fallen from the sides of the cutting. Ha ha ha! Silly old snow! Silly old snow! Look out! I'm coming! I'm coming! Oh! 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 Cinders and ashes! I'm stuck! And he was. The driver said, Back, Thomas! Back! Thomas tried, but his wheel spun and he couldn't move. More snow fell and piled up around him. The guard went back for help, while the driver, fireman and passengers tried to dig the snow away. But as fast as they dug, more snow slipped down, until Thomas was nearly buried. Thomas was very upset. Oh, my wheel and coupling rods! I shall have to stop here till I'm frozen. <laughs> what a shitty little engine I am. <laughs> and Thomas began to cry. <laughs> and a bus came and took all his passengers away. And Thomas felt very lonely and very sad when he heard a noise in the tunnel. Yes, it was Terence, and he came chugging out of the tunnel. Hello, Thomas! No, don't worry. I'll soon get you out. He pulled the empty coaches away and came back for Thomas. Thomas's wheels were clear, but still spun helplessly when he tried to move. Terence tugged and slipped and slipped and tugged. At last, 
he dragged Thomas into the tunnel. Thomas was very grateful. Thank you, Terence. Thank you. Your caterpillar tracks are really splendid. Ha <sighs> <laughs> ha. They can take me anywhere, Thomas. And Thomas's driver said, I hope you'll be sensible now, Thomas. I'll try to be. I'll try to be. And Thomas puffed off home. Thomas and Bertie. One day, Thomas was waiting at the junction when a bus came into the yard. Thomas said to the bus, Hello, who are you? What's that? Oh, I'm Bertie. Uh, who are you? I'm Thomas. I run this line. Oh, so you're Thomas, are you? Oh, yes. I remember now. You were stuck in the snow, didn't you? I took your passengers and Terence pulled you out, didn't he? Well, I've come to help you with your passengers today. This made Thomas very cross indeed, and he let off steam. <laughs> help me! <laughs> help me! <laughs> oh, wow! I can go faster than you! <laughs> you can't. I can! You can't. I can! All right, I'll race you. The drivers agreed. The station master said, Right, are you ready? Steady. Go! And they were off. Thomas never could go fast at first, and Bertie drew in front. Thomas was running well, but he didn't hurry. Annie and Clarabel were rather anxious. Why don't you go fast? 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 But Thomas said, shh, 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 wait and see, wait and see, shh, 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 wait and see, shh, 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 wait and see. He's a long way ahead, he's a long way ahead, he's a long way ahead, he's a long way ahead. But Thomas didn't mind, he remembered the level crossing. There was Bertie fuming at the gates while they sailed gaily through. <laughs> Goodbye, Bertie. The road left the railway and went through a village, so they couldn't see Bertie. They stopped at the station, and Thomas called out, <coughs> Quickly, please. Quickly, please. Everybody got out quickly, and the guard whistled, <coughs> and off they went. Thomas sang, Come along, shh, shh. Come along, shh, shh. Come along, shh, shh. Come along, shh, shh. And Annie and Clarabel sang, We're coming along, we're coming along, we're coming along, we're coming along. Hurry, 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 shh, 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 hurry, 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 shh, 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 hurry, hurry, oh. Shh. For there, straight ahead, was Bertie crossing the bridge over the railway, and he was tooting triumphantly on his horn. Ah, 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 ah. Uh, uh. Thomas groaned. Oh, bother! Oh, bother! Annie and Clarabel wailed. He's a long way in front. A long way in front. He's a long way in front. A long way in front. But Thomas's driver said, Now steady, Thomas. We'll beat Bertie yet. 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 We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. Oh, bother, there's a station. And as he stopped, he heard something go, ah, 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 ah. Goodbye, Thomas. You must be very tired. <laughs> Sorry I can't stop her. We buses have to work, you know. <laughs> Ta-da. The next station was by the river. They got there quickly, but the signal was up. Thomas thought, Oh dear, we've lost now. But he felt better after a drink. 
Then James rattled through with the goods train, and the signal dropped, showing that the line was clear. Hurrah! We're off! Hurrah! We're off! And as they rumbled over the bridge, they heard a very impatient, and there was Bertie waiting at the red traffic lights, while cars and lorries crossed the narrow bridge in the opposite direction. But as soon as the lights turned green, Bertie was off with a roar, and soon he and Thomas were racing side by side up a valley. The passengers in the train and in the bus got very excited and started cheering and shouting. And now Thomas reached his full speed, and foot by foot, yard by yard, he gained on Bertie till they were running level. Bertie tried hard, but Thomas was too fast. Slowly but surely, he drew ahead till he plunged into a tunnel, leaving Bertie toiling far behind. Thomas was very pleased. Ah, I've done it! Yes, I've done it! I've done it! Yes, I've done it! <laughs> yes, I've done it! So were Annie and Clara Bell. We've done it, hooray! We've done it, hooray! We've done it, hooray! We've done it, hooray! And on they went to the last station. <laughs> The passengers gave Thomas three cheers and told the station master and the porters all about the race. When Bertie came in, they gave him three cheers too. And Bertie said, Phew, that was well done, Thomas. That was fun. But to beat you over that hill, I should have to grow wings and be an aeroplane. Thomas and Bertie now keep each other very busy. Bertie finds people in the villages who want to go by train and takes them to Thomas, while Thomas brings people to the station for Bertie to take home. They often talk about their race, but Bertie's passengers don't like being bounced about like peas in a frying pan, and the fat controller has warned Thomas about what happens to engines who race at dangerous speeds. So although, between you and me, they'd like to have another race, I don't think they ever will. Henry and the Elephant Henry and Gordon were lonely when Thomas left the yard to run his branch line. They missed him very much. They had more work to do. They couldn't wait in the shed till it was time and find their coaches at the platform. Oh, no. They had to get the coaches themselves, and they didn't like that. And then one day a circus came to town, and the engines soon forgot that they were tired. They all wanted to shunt the special trucks and coaches, and they were dreadfully jealous of James when the fat controller told him to pull the train when the circus went away. However, they soon forgot about the animals, as they had plenty of work to do. One morning, Henry was told to take some workmen to a tunnel, which was blocked. He grumbled away and found two trucks to carry the workmen and their tools. And he pushed the trucks along the line and muttered to himself, Pushing trucks, shh, shh, shh. pushing trucks, shh, shh, shh. pushing trucks, shh, shh, shh. pushing trucks. Shh, shh, shh. They came to the tunnel and stopped outside. They tried to look through it, but it was quite dark. No daylight shone from the other end. The workmen took their tools and went inside. Suddenly, they all shouted, Oh! 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 And they came running out of the tunnel. The foreman was outside the tunnel, having a cup of tea. And they said to him, Look, we went to the blockage and started to dig it away, but it grunted and moved. 
And the foreman said, Go on, get out of it. That's rubbish. No, it isn't rubbish. It's big and alive. And we're not going in there again. So there. And the foreman said, All right then, I'll go in. I'll ride in a truck and Henry shall push this here blockage out of the way. And Henry said, <laughs> He hated tunnels. He'd been shut up in one once. And this was worse. There was something big and alive inside the tunnel. Henry said, <laughs> I, I don't want to go in. And Henry's driver said, Well, neither do I, Henry. But we must. We've got to clear the line. Now, come on, Henry. There's a good lad. And Henry puffed slowly into the dark, dark tunnel. Henry had bumped into something enormous. Henry's driver shut off steam at once. What is it, Henry? Oh, I, I don't know, but I can't move it. It's moving me. It's pushing me backwards. Oh, help! And slowly out of the tunnel came first Henry then the trucks, and last of all, pushing hard and rather cross, came a big elephant. The foreman said, Well, I never. <laughs> it's an elephant from the circus. Henry's driver put on his brakes, and a man ran to telephone for the keeper. The elephant stopped pushing and came towards them. They gave him some sandwiches and cake, so he forgot he was cross and remembered he was hungry. He drank three buckets of water without stopping and was just going to drink another one when Henry let off steam. <coughs> that frightened the elephant. It went whoosh and squirted the water all over Henry by mistake. Poor Henry. He didn't like that at all. The elephant's keeper came and took him away, and the workmen jumped into the trucks, laughing at their adventure. And Henry pushed them home, hissing to himself. An elephant pushed me. Shh, shh, shh. An elephant whooshed me. Shh, shh, shh. An elephant pushed me. Shh. An elephant whooshed me. In the shed, he told Gordon and James about the elephant. And I'm sorry to say that instead of laughing and telling him not to be silly, they looked sad and said, Oh, you poor engine. Oh, you have been badly treated, haven't you? Hmm? Tenders and turntables. The big stations at both ends of the line each have a turntable. The fat controller had them made so that Edward, Henry, Gordon and James can be turned round. It is dangerous for tender engines to go fast backwards. Tank engines like Thomas don't need turntables. They can go just as well backwards as forwards. But if you heard Gordon talking a short while ago, you would have thought that the fat controller had given him a tender just to show how important he was. 
He said to Thomas, Oh, but you don't understand, little Thomas. We tender engines have a position to keep up. It doesn't matter where you go, but we are important. And for the fat controller to make a shunt on dirty sidings, well, it's, it's, it's not the proper thing. And Gordon puffed away in a dignified manner. Thomas chuckled. <laughs> Poor old Gordon, he is upset. <laughs> and off he went with the two coaches, Annie and Clarabelle. Gordon took his coaches and passengers to the terminus and waited until they'd all got out. And then he shunted the coaches to another platform. He was in a bad temper. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. And he ran backwards to the turntable. The turntable was in a windy place close to the sea. It was only just big enough for Gordon, and if he was not on it just right, he put it out of balance and made it difficult to turn. But today, Gordon was in a bad temper, and the wind was blowing fiercely. Gordon's driver tried to make him stop in the right place, but Gordon wasn't trying. He would not stop in the right place. At last, Gordon's driver said, Oh, 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 I give up. All right then, Gordon. We can't turn you like this because your tender upsets the balance. Now, if you were a nice tank engine, you'd be all right. But you're not. You're a tender engine and we can't turn you around. So you'll have to pull the next train backwards. So there. When Gordon came to the platform, some little boys shouted out, Hey, look, come quick, there's a new tank engine. Uh, it isn't silly, it's Uddy Gordon, back to front. Oh, so it is. What a swizz. And Gordon said, Oh, mm, and he puffed off to the junction. Thomas was waiting at the junction. Oh, hello, Gordon. Play your tanks engines then. <laughs> Sensible engine. Take my advice. Scrap that tender of yours and have a nice banker like mine. Hmm? And Gordon said, Oh, <laughs> Then James came along on his way to the turntable. Oh, <laughs> hello, Gordon. Got stuck on the turntable then, are you? Uh, you'll be careful, James. Otherwise, you might get stuck too. No, 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 no. I won't get stuck. I'm not as fat as you are. Now you just watch me. And James went along to the turntable and stopped on just the right place to balance the table. It could swing easily. The fireman turned the handle and James turned, much too easily. The wind caught him and puffed him round and round like a top. He couldn't stop. He was spinning round and round when Gordon came along. <laughs> well, 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 James. What are you doing? Playing roundabouts, hmm? At last, the wind died down and James stopped turning and rolled off the table to the engine shed, feeling very, very giddy. <laughs> that night, the three engines had an indignation meeting. Gordon did most of the talking, though. It's shameful to treat tender engines like this. It really is. Henry gets drenched by elephants, 
James spins round like a top, and I have to go backwards, and everyone laughs at us. Not only that, the fat controller makes a shunt in dirty sidings. It's dreadful. It's dreadful. Now listen, we will act tomorrow. The fat controller will look silly. Now this is what we'll do. In the morning, when the driver and the fireman come, Trouble in the shed. The fat controller sat in his office and listened. The fat controller frowned and said, Oh, what a nuisance passengers are. How can I possibly work with all this noise? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Yes, what is it? It was the station master, looking very worried. Eh, there's trouble in the shed, sir. Henry is sulking. There is no train, and the passengers are saying that this is a bad railway. Uh -huh. Indeed, really, we cannot allow that. Now, will you quieten the passengers, please, and I will go and speak to Henry. The fat controller found Henry, Gordon, and James looking sulky. Now, come along, Henry. It's time your train was ready. But Henry wouldn't answer. It was Gordon who said, uh, Henry's not going, so there, and neither are James or I. We won't shunt like common tank engines. We're important tender engines, if you don't mind. You fetch our coaches for us, and we'll pull them. But we won't shunt. Tender engines don't shunt, so there. And all three engines let off steam in a cheeky way. And the fat controller said, Oh, indeed. Engines on my railway do as they're told. I'll go and find Edward. Edward was shunting. I say, Edward, leave those tracks, will you please? I want you to push coaches for me in the yard. Oh, thank you, sir. That will be a nice change. That's a good engine. Off you go, then. So Edward found coaches for the three engines, and that day the trains ran as usual. But when the fat controller came next morning, Edward looked unhappy. Gordon came past, clanking and hissing very rudely. <laughs> Why, bless me, what a noise! I know. They all hiss at me, sir. They say tender engines don't shunt. And last night, they said I had black wheels. I haven't. Have I, sir? No, Edward, of course you haven't. You've got nice blue ones. And I'm proud of you. Tender engines do shunt. But all the same, you'll be happier in your own yard. Hmm, we need a tank engine here. And the fat controller went to an engine workshop and saw all sorts of tank engines. At last, he saw a smart little green engine. Hmm, yes, yes. I think so. That's the one. Um, I say there. If I choose you, will you work hard? Oh, oh, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a good engine. <laughs> I'll call you, um, Percy. Yes, Percy. Do you like that, Percy? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So the fat controller drove Percy back to the yard and introduced him to Edward. Percy soon learned what he had to do, and they had a happy afternoon. And then Henry came by, hissing as usual. But Percy just went...
That really frightened Henry. He jumped and ran away. Edward laughed and said, Oh, 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 oh how beautifully you wished him, Percy. I can't make a noise like that. Oh, that's nothing. You should hear them in the workshops. You have to make a noise like that to be heard. Next morning, Thomas arrived. Hello, Edward. Oh, hello, Thomas. The fat controller sent for me. I expect he wants help. Oh, he does indeed, Thomas. Here he comes now. Well done, Thomas. You have been quick. Now listen, Henry, Gordon and James are sulking. They say they won't shunt like common tank engines, so I've shut them up. And I want you both to run the line. Common tank engines, indeed. We'll show them. Well done, Thomas. And Percy here will help too, won't you, Percy? Oh, sir. Yes, sir, please, sir. Edward and Thomas pulled the trains. They started at opposite ends and whistled to each other as they passed. There were fewer trains, but the passengers didn't mind. They knew the three other engines were having a lesson. Henry, Gordon and James stayed shut in the shed and were cold, lonely and miserable. They wished now they hadn't been so silly. Percy runs away. Henry, Gordon and James were shut up for several days. At last, the fat controller opened the shed. Ah, now then. I hope you're sorry and understand you're not so important after all. Thomas, Edward and Percy have worked the line very nicely. Now they need a change and I will let you out if you promise to be good. Now, will you? Uh, yes, sir, we will. Ah, uh, yes, sir, we will. Uh, yes, sir, we will. That's right. But please remember, this no-shunting nonsense must stop. And the fat controller told Edward, Thomas and Percy that they could go and play on the branch line for a few days. They ran off happily and found Annie and Clarabel at the junction. The two coaches were so pleased to see Thomas again, and he took them out for a run at once. Edward and Percy played with the trucks and pushed them into their proper sidings. The trucks made a terrible fuss. They went, oh, 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 stop, 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 stop. But the two engines laughed. <laughs> and went on shunting till the trucks were tidily arranged. Next, Edward took some empty trucks to the quarry. And Percy was left alone. Percy didn't mind that a bit. He liked watching trains and being cheeky to the engines. He would make noises at them as they went by. <whistles> Gordon, Henry and James got very cross. After a while, he took some trucks over the main line to another siding. When they were tidy, he ran onto the main line again and waited for the signalman to set the points so that he could cross back to the yard. Edward had warned Percy, Look, be careful, Percy, on the main line. Whistle to tell the signalman that you're there. But Percy didn't remember to whistle, and the signalman was so busy, he forgot Percy. Bells rang in the signal box. The man answered, saying the line was clear, and set the signals for the next train. Percy waited and waited. The points were still against him. 
he looked along the main line and saw something that made him go <whistles> for rushing straight towards him was Gordon with the express Gordon went <whistles> his driver shut off steam and applied the brakes Percy's driver turned on full steam back Percy back but Percy's wheels wouldn't turn quickly Gordon was coming so fast that it seemed he couldn't stop. Percy just shut his eyes and waited for the crash. His driver and fireman jumped out. Gordon yelled, Oh, oh, get out of my way, get out of my way, oh! Percy opened his eyes. Gordon had stopped with Percy's buffers a few inches from his own. Percy was very, very frightened. He began to move backwards. I won't stay here. I'll run away. I won't stay here. I'll run away. I won't stay here. I'll run away. He was soon clear of the station and running as fast as he could. He whistled through Edward's station <whistles> and he ran right up Gordon's Hill without stopping. He was getting tired and wanted to stop, but he couldn't. He had no driver to shut off steam and to apply the brakes. Oh dear, oh dear, I shall have to run till my wheels wear out. <whistles> I want to stop. <whistles> I want to stop. I want to stop. Just then, he passed another signal box, and the signal man called out, I know just what you want, little Percy. He set the points, and Percy puffed wearily onto a nice empty siding, and at the end of the siding was a big bank of earth. Percy was too tired now to care where he went, I want to stop. I want to stop. Oh, I have stopped. Yes, the big bank of earth had stopped Percy. His bunker was buried in it. The workman came to dig him out. Never mind, Percy. You'll feel better after a drink. Presently, Gordon arrived. Oh, well done, Percy. You know, you started so quickly that you stopped a nasty accident. Oh, I'm sorry I was cheeky, Gordon. You were clever to stop. Percy now works in the yard and finds coaches for the trains. He's still cheeky. He's that sort of engine. But he's always most careful when he goes on the main line. Henry's Special Coal Henry was feeling very sorry for himself. He said to James, You know, James, I suffer dreadfully, and no one cares. James said, Oh, rubbish, Henry. You don't work hard enough. Henry was bigger than James, but smaller than Gordon. Sometimes he could pull trains very well, but sometimes he had no strength at all. The fat controller spoke to him. You're too expensive, Henry. You've had lots of new parts and new paint too, but they've done you no good. If we can't make you better, well, we must get another engine instead of you. <laughs> Sorry. This made Henry, his driver, and his fireman very sad. The fat controller was waiting when Henry came to the platform. He had taken off his hat and coat and put on overalls. He climbed to the footplate and Henry started. <sighs> Shh! <laughs> 
Henry's fireman said, You know, sir, Henry is a bad steamer. I build up his fire, but it doesn't give enough heat. Henry tried very hard, but it was no good. He had not enough steam, and they stopped outside Edward Station. Henry was very upset. He said, Oh, oh, show, show, oh, show. I shall have to go away. <laughs> so Edward took charge of the train and Henry stopped behind. The fat controller said to the fireman, Look here, what do you think is wrong with Henry, hmm? Well, sir, if you don't mind my saying so, uh, the call is wrong. We've had a poor lot lately, and today it's worse. The other engines can manage. They've got big fireboxes, but Henry's is small and can't make the heat. Now, with Welsh coal, he'd be different, see? Oh, Welsh coal, eh? Hmm. Well, it's expensive, but Henry must have a fair chance. James shall go and fetch some Welsh coal. When the Welsh coal came, Henry's driver and fireman were excited. Eh, hey, this is fine now. We'll show them, Henry, old fellow, eh? And they carefully oiled all his joints and polished his brass till it shone like gold. Henry's fire had already been lit, so the fireman made it carefully. He put large lumps of coal like a wall round the outside. Then he covered the glowing middle part with smaller lumps. Henry said, Hey, you're spoiling my fire. No, we're not, Henry. You wait and see. We'll have a roaring fire just when we want it. And he was right. When Henry reached the platform, the water was boiling nicely, and he had to let off steam to show how happy he was. Oh, 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 He made such a noise that the fat controller came out to see him. Hello, Henry. How are you, hmm? Oh, I feel fine, thank you, sir. Fine, oh, fine. <coughs> well done, Henry. <laughs> Have you got a good fire, driver? Never better, sir. And plenty of steam. Good. Well, no record-breaking now. And don't push Henry too hard. Bless you, sir. Henry don't need any pushing. I'll have to hold him back. And off they went. <laughs> Henry had a lovely day. He had never felt so well in all his life. He wanted to go fast. But his driver wouldn't let him. Steady, old fella. Steady now, Henry. There's plenty of time. They arrived early at the junction, and not long afterwards, Thomas came puffing in. Henry said, Hello, lazy bones. Where have you been? I can't wait for dawdling tank engines like you. Goodbye. Thomas was astonished. He said to Annie and Clarabel as Henry disappeared, Oh, wow, have you ever seen anything like it? And both Annie and Clarabel agreed that they never had. The Flying Kipper Lots of ships use the harbour at the big station by the sea. The passenger ships have spotless paint and shining brass. Other ships 
though smaller and dirtier, are important too. They take coal, machinery, and other things abroad, and bring back meat, timber, and things we need. Fishing boats also come there. They unload their fish on the quay. Some of it is sent to shops in the town, and some goes in a special train to other places far away. The railway men call this train the Flying Kipper. One winter evening, Henry's driver said, Well, we'll be out early tomorrow, Henry. We've got to take the Flying Kipper. Now, don't tell Gordon, but I think that if we pull the Kipper nicely, the Fat Controller will let us pull the Express. Henry was very excited. Oh, I say, oh, shh, hoorah, shh, hoorah, shh, that will be lovely. He was ready at five o'clock. There was snow and frost. Men hustled and shouted, loading the vans with crates of fish. The last door banged. The guard showed his green lamp, and Henry started off. But his wheels slipped on the icy rails. <laughs> Henry got cross with the vans. Come on! Come on! Don't be silly, don't be silly, don't be silly, don't be silly, don't be silly! Come on! Come on! Don't be silly, 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 don't be silly! The vans shuddered and groaned. Bull, 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 all right, 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 all right. That is better, 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 that is better. And the train began to gather speed. Thick clouds of smoke and steam poured from Henry's funnel into the cold air, and when his fireman put on more coal, the fire's light shone brightly on the snow around. Henry went faster and faster. Hurry, 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 hurry. They whooshed under bridges and clattered through stations, green signal lights showing as they passed. They were going well. The light grew better, and a yellow signal appeared ahead. Henry thought, Ah, uh -huh. distant signal up. That means caution. Henry's driver shut off the steam and prepared to stop. But the home signal was down, and so he said, Oral clear, Henry. Go on, away we go. They couldn't know the points from the main line to the siding were frozen and that the signal had been set at danger. A fall of snow had forced it down. A goods train waited in the siding to let the flying kipper pass. The driver and the fireman were drinking cocoa in the brake van. The guard pulled out his watch and he said, Hmm, you know, the flying kipper is due. The fireman said, Who cares about the flying kipper? This is good cocoa. The driver got up and said, Eh, hey, come on, fireman, back to our engine. But I haven't finished my cocoa yet. Then suddenly there was a terrible crash. The brake van broke the three men shot in the air like jacks in the box and landed in the snow outside. Henry's driver and fireman jumped clear before the crash. The fireman fell head first into a heap of snow and he kicked his legs about so much the driver couldn't pull him out. Henry was sprawled over on his side. He looked very surprised. Oh, hey, oh what happened? Shh. Oh, shh! Oh, shh! The goods train fireman was very cross. He waved his empty mug in the air. You clumsy great engine! 
the best cup of cocoa I've ever had, and you bump into me and spill it all. The driver said, Never mind your cocoa farming. Run and telephone the breakdown gang. The gang soon cleared the line, but they had hard work lifting Henry onto the rails. The fat controller came to see him. Well, Henry, what have you got to say for yourself, hmm? Oh, dear, sir. Shh, you know, it's... Oh, sir, the signal was down, sir. Honestly, it was. Honestly. <laughs> Cheer up, Henry. It wasn't your fault. Ice and snow caused the accident. I'm sending you to crew. A fine place for sick engines. They'll give you a new shape and a larger firebox, and then you'll feel a different engine, and you won't need special coal any more. Now, won't that be nice, hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Shh, yeah. Yes, sir. Shh, yes. Henry liked being at crew, but was glad to come home. A crowd of people waited to see him arrive in his new shape. He looked so splendid and strong, that they gave him three cheers. And Henry said, Thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you. Gordon's Whistle Gordon was cross, very cross. Why should that Henry have a new shape? A shape good enough for me, is good enough for him, surely. He goes gallivanting off to crew, leaving us to do his work, or oh, it's disgraceful, it really is. It's disgraceful. It's not good enough. And there's another thing. Henry whistles too much. No respectable engine ever whistles loudly at stations. It's not that it's wrong to whistle at stations, but we just don't do it. We just don't do it. Poor Henry didn't feel happy any more. He said, Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> But Percy said to him, Never mind, Henry. I'm glad you're home again, and, quite frankly, I like your whistling. Oh, thank you, Percy. Shh. Thank you, Percy. Shh. My friend. Shh. Next morning, Gordon was leaving the shed, and he called out to Henry. Goodbye. Shh. Henry. Shh. Goodbye, shh, Henry. Shh. We are glad to have you with us again, but be sure and remember what I said about whistling. Now, don't forget. Shh, 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 shh. Later on, Henry took a slow train and presently stopped at Edward Station. Edward said, Oh, hello, Henry. You look splendid. I was pleased to hear your happy whistle yesterday. Oh, thank you, Edward. Thank you. Shh. Thank you. Shh. Can you hear something? Edward listened, and far away, but getting louder and louder, was the sound of an engine's whistle. Edward said, Well, it sounds like Gordon, and it ought to be Gordon, but Gordon never whistles like that. It was Gordon. He came rushing down the hill at a tremendous rate. He didn't look at Henry, and he didn't look at Edward. He was purple in the boiler, and whistling fit to burst. <laughs> Ah! 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 
he streamed through the station and disappeared. Well, what do you think of that, Henry? <laughs> it isn't wrong to whistle, you see, but we just don't do it, eh? <laughs> and Henry told Edward what Gordon had said. Meanwhile, Gordon screeched along the line. <whistles> People came out of their houses. Sirens started. Five fire brigades got ready to go out. Horses upset their carts. And old ladies dropped their parcels. At the big station, the noise was awful. Gordon went on whistling and whistling and whistling. <coughs> Porters and passengers held their ears. The fat controller held his ears, too. He gave a lot of orders, but no one could hear them, and Gordon went on whistling. At last, the fat controller clambered into Gordon's cab. Oh, take him away! Take him away! And stop that noise! Oh, dear! Oh, dear! Poor Gordon. He couldn't stop whistling, and he puffed sadly away. He whistled as he crossed the points. He whistled on the siding. He was still whistling as the last deafened passenger left the station. Two fitters came and climbed up onto Gordon, and with a hammer they knocked his whistle valve back into place. And there was silence. Gordon slunk into the shed, he was glad it was empty. The others came in later, and Henry said quietly, and to no one in particular, uh, It isn't wrong, you know, but we just don't do it. <laughs> no one mentioned whistles. Percy and the Trout On cold mornings, Percy often saw workmen wearing scarves. My funnel's cold, my funnel's cold, he would puff. I want a scarf, I want a scarf. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry one day. Engines don't want scarves. Engines with proper funnels do, said Percy in his cheeky way. You've only got a small one. Henry snorted. He was proud of his short, neat funnel. Just then a train came in, and Percy, still puffing, I want a scarf, I want a scarf, went to take the coaches to their siding. His driver always shut off steam just outside the station, and Percy would try to surprise the coaches by coming in as quietly as he could. Two porters were taking some luggage across the line. They had a big load and were walking backwards to see that none fell off the trolley. Percy arrived so quietly that the porters didn't hear him until the trolley was on the line. The porters jumped clear. The trolley disappeared with a crunch. Boxes and bags burst in all directions. Oh, uh groaned Percy and stopped. Sticky streams of red and yellow jam trickled down his face. A top hat hung on his lamp iron. Clothes, hats, boots, shoes, skirts and blouses stuck to his front. A pair of striped trousers coiled lovingly round his funnel. They were grey no longer. Angry passengers looked at their broken trunks. The fat controller seized the top hat. Mine, he said crossly. Percy, he shouted, look at this. Yes, sir, I am, sir, a muffled voice replied. My best trousers, too. Yes, sir, please, sir, said Percy nervously. I am very cross, said the fat controller. We must pay the passengers for their spoiled clothes. 
My house is dented and my trousers are ruined, all because you will come into the station as if you were playing grandmother's steps with the coaches. The driver unwound the trousers. The fat controller waved them away. Percy wanted a scarf. He shall have my trousers for a scarf. They will keep him warm. Percy wore them back to the yard. He doesn't like scarves now. Henry's Sneeze One lovely Saturday morning, Henry was puffing along. <laughs> the sun shone, the fields were green, the birds sang. Henry had plenty of steam in his boiler and he was feeling happy. <laughs> I feel so well, I feel so well, I feel so well, I feel so well. <laughs> Just ahead, Henry saw some boys on a bridge, and he thought he would whistle to them and say, Hello. Hello, boys. Hello. <laughs> Hello, boys. <laughs> Hello, boys. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That hurt. Yes, it did hurt. For the boys didn't wave back at Henry and say hello. No, they dropped stones on him instead. They were silly, stupid boys who thought it would be fun to drop stones down his funnel. Some of the stones hit Henry's boiler and spoiled his paint, and one hit the fireman on the head as he was shoveling coal, and others broke the carriage windows. Henry was very upset. Oh, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. The coaches were upset too. They broke in our glass. 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 The driver opened the first aid box, bandaged the fireman's head, and planned what he was going to do. They stopped the train, and the guard asked if any of the passengers were hurt. No one was hurt, but everyone was cross. They saw the fireman's bumped head and told him what to do for it, and they looked at Henry's paint, and someone said, Look here, this is too much. Call the police. But Henry's driver said, No, you leave it to Henry and me. We'll teach those lads a lesson. Well, what will you do then? Well, can you keep a secret? Uh, yes. 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 Well then, Henry is going to sneeze at them. What? 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 Yes, Henry is going to sneeze at them. Look, Henry draws air in through his fire and puffs it out with smoke and steam. Well, when he puffs hard, the air blows ashes from his fire into the smoke box, and these ashes sometimes prevent him puffing properly. I mean, when your nose is blocked, you sometimes sneeze, don't you? Well, if Henry's smoke box is blocked, I can make air and steam blow the ashes through his funnel. We will do it at the bridge and startle those young fellow my lads. You see. So Henry puffed onto the terminus where he had a rest. Then he took the train back. Lots of people were waiting at the station just before the bridge. They wanted to see what would happen. Henry's driver said, Well, that's all right, Henry. Now, he's got plenty of ashes. Now, keep all the windows shut until we've passed the bridge. Henry is as excited as we are. Aren't you, old fellow? Eh? <laughs> and he patted Henry's boiler. Henry didn't answer. He was feeling just a bit stuffed up. But he went, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He 
was already feeling like sneezing. <laughs> the guard waved his flag and blew his whistle. And they were off. Soon, in the distance, they saw the bridge. Yes, the boys were there, and they all had stones. Henry's driver said, Are you ready then, Henry? Now, sneeze hard when I tell you. Ready. Steady. Now. And he turned the handle, and Henry went, <laughs> <laughs> Smoke and steam and ashes spouted from his funnel. They went all over the bridge and all over the boys, who ran away smothered in soot and cinders. Henry's driver couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> well done, Henry. Uh, they won't drop stones on engines again. <laughs> Oh dear, your coat is all black, but, well, we'll rub you down and paint your scratches out and you'll be as good as new tomorrow. <laughs> Henry has never again sneezed under a bridge. The fat controller doesn't like it. His smoke box is always cleaned in the yard while he's resting. He has now gone under more bridges than he can count. But from that day to this, there have been no more boys with stones. Toby and the Stout Gentleman Toby is a tram engine. He is short and sturdy. He has cow catchers and side plates, and he doesn't look like a steam engine at all. He takes trucks from farms and factories to the main line, and the big engines take them to London and elsewhere. His tram line runs along roads and through fields and villages. Toby rings his bell cheerfully to everyone he meets. He has a coach called Henrietta, who has seen better days. She complains because she has few passengers. Toby is attached to Henrietta and always takes her with him as he says. Well, you never know. She might come in useful one day. But Henrietta is never very happy. It's not fair. It's not fair at all. Just look at all those buses full of passengers. And I've got none. I remember the day when I used to be full of passengers and have nine trucks following behind me, but now there are only three or four. Yes, it was sad, because now the farms and factories sent their goods mostly by lorry. Toby is always careful on the road. The cars, buses and lorries often have accidents. Toby hasn't had an accident for years, but the buses are crowded and Henrietta is empty. It puzzles Toby. I can't understand it. I can't understand it. People come to see Toby and they come by bus and stare at him and laugh and say, Oh, isn't he quaint? Oh, yes, isn't he quaint? They make Toby cross. One day, a car stopped close by and a little boy jumped out and called to his sister, Come on, Bridget! Come on, Bridget! Come on! And together they ran across to Toby. Two ladies and a stout gentleman followed. 
The gentleman looked important, but nice. The children ran back. Oh, come on, Grandfather. Oh, come, Grandfather. Do look at this engine. And seizing his hands, they almost dragged him along. The stout gentleman said, Well, 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 well. That's a tram engine, Stephen, a tram engine. Oh, may we go in it, Grandfather? Oh, please, may we go in, please. Oh, very well, all right. And the stout gentleman and his family went for a ride to the junction. There they waited for Toby to take them back to their car. And the stout gentleman said to Toby, By the way, um... What is your name, hmm? Oh, uh, uh, Toby, sir. Oh, Toby, is it? Well, um, thank you, Toby. Thank you very much for a very nice ride. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, sir. And Toby said to himself, Now, this gentleman is a gentleman who knows how to speak to engines. The children came every day for a fortnight. Sometimes they rode with the guard, sometimes in empty trucks, and on the last day of all, the driver invited them into his cab. All were sorry when they had to go away. Stephen and Bridget said, Thank you, thank you very much indeed, to Toby, his driver, his fireman, and the guard. The stout gentleman gave them all a present, and Toby said, Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, come again soon. Oh, we will. We will. Goodbye. 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 And they waved until Toby was out of sight. The months passed. Toby had very few trucks and fewer passengers, and Toby's driver said to him, Well, this is our last day, Toby. The manager says we must close tomorrow. And Toby puffed very sadly to his shed. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear and he went off unhappily to sleep. Next morning the shed doors were flung open and Toby woke with a start to see his fireman dancing a jig outside. The driver was very excited and waving a piece of paper. Wake up Toby me boy, wake up and listen to this. It's a letter from the stout gentleman. Toby listened, but I mustn't tell you any more or I will spoil the next story. Thomas in Trouble There is a line to a quarry at the end of Thomas's branch. It goes for some distance along the road. Thomas was always very careful here. One morning there was no one on the road but a large policeman was sitting on the grass close to the line. He was shaking a stone from his boot. Thomas liked policemen. He had been a great friend of the constable who used to live in the village, but had just retired. Thomas expected that the new constable would be friendly too, and he called out to him. <whistles> good morning, good morning. Good morning. The policeman jumped and dropped his boot. He scrambled up and hopped round on one leg till he was facing Thomas. Thomas was sorry to see that he didn't look friendly at all. He was red in the face and very cross and he was wobbling about trying to keep his balance. And he said to Thomas, It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. That's what it is. I didn't sleep a wink last night. It was so quiet. And now a blinking engine comes whistling suddenly right behind me. My first day in the country, too. Huh. 
wish I'd never been transferred. And he picked up his boot and hopped over to Thomas. Thomas said, Well, I'm very sorry, sir. I only said good morning. The policeman grunted, and leaning against Thomas's buffer, he put his boot on. And then he drew himself up and pointed to Thomas. Aha! Aha! Where's your cow catcher then, eh? Hey? Where's your cow catcher, huh? Oh, please, sir, I don't catch cows, sir. Don't you try to be funny with me, young fella, me lad. Now, let's see. And he took out his notebook and he looked at Thomas's wheels. No side plates either. No side plates and no cow catcher. Engines going on public roads must have their wheels covered and a cow catcher in front. And you haven't. Ha <laughs> ha! And so you are dangerous to the public. So there. Thomas's driver said, Oh, look, that's rubbish, constable. We've been along your hundreds of times and never had an accident. Oh, have you? Then that makes it worse, don't it? I'll just have to make a note of that. Hmm. A regular lawbreaker. That's what you are. A regular lawbreaker. I shall report this. Thomas puffed slowly away. The fat controller was having breakfast when the telephone rang. Oh, bother that telephone. And he said to his wife, I'll be back in a minute, oh dear, 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 dear. But when he came back, he said, Oh, bother, bother. I'm sorry, my dear, but uh, Thomas is in trouble with the police. I must go down at once. He gulped down his coffee and hurried from the room. The policeman was waiting at the station. The fat controller spoke to him at once, and a crowd collected. Other policemen came to see what was happening, and the fat controller argued with them too, but it was no good. The policeman said that the law is the law, and that's that and all about it. The fat controller felt exhausted. He mopped his face and said to Thomas's driver, I'm sorry, driver. <laughs> oh dear, it's no use arguing with policemen. <sighs> we will have to make one of those cow catcher things for Thomas, I suppose. Thomas was horrified. Everyone will laugh, sir. They'll say that I look like a tram. Eh? What? Like a tram? <laughs> Why? Yes. Well done, Thomas. Why didn't I think of that before? We want a tram engine. Now, when I was on my holiday, I met a nice little engine called Toby. Now, he hasn't enough work to do and needs a change. I'll write to his controller at once. A few days later, Toby arrived, and the fat controller said to him, Well done, Toby, that's a good engine. I see you've brought Henrietta with you. Oh, you, you don't mind, sir, do you? But the station master wanted to use her as a hen house, and that would never do, sir, would it? Oh, no, indeed it wouldn't. <laughs> we couldn't allow that. Toby made the trucks behave even better than Thomas did. At first, Thomas was jealous, but he was so pleased when Toby rang his bell and made the policeman jump that they have been firm friends ever since. Dirty Objects Toby and Henrietta take the workmen to the quarry every morning. At the junction they often meet James. 
Toby and Henrietta were shabby when they first came and needed new paint. James was very rude about them. Ugh, ugh, what dirty objects, ugh, what dirty objects. At last, Toby lost his patience. Um, you're James. Why are you red then, hmm? I'm a splendid engine, you see, ready for anything. You never see my paint dirty, oh no. Oh, that's why you once needed bootlaces to be ready, I suppose, hmm? James went redder than ever and snorted off. Shh, 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 At the end of the line, James left his coaches and got ready for his next train. It was a slow goods, stopping at every station to pick up and set down trucks. James hated slow goods trains. Uh, dirty trucks from dirty sidings. Uh, I hate them. I hate them. I do. There you are. Starting with only a few trucks, he picked up more and more trucks at each station till he had a long train. At first, the trucks behaved well, but James bumped them so crossly that they determined to pay him out. Presently, rumbling over the viaduct, they approached the top of Gordon's Hill. Heavy goods trains halt here to pin down their brakes. James had had an accident with trucks before and should have remembered this. His driver called to him, Wait, James, wait, wait! But James wouldn't wait. He was too busy thinking what he would say to Toby when they next met. All too late, he saw where he was and he tried to stop. The trucks saw their chance and started to laugh and shout, <laughs> and banging their buffers, they pushed him down the hill. The guard tightened his brakes until they screamed, and the trucks shouted, Oh, 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 oh. James was frightened. I've got to stop! I've got to stop! I've got to stop! I've got to stop! And setting his brakes, he managed to check the truck's mad rush, but they were still going much too fast to stop in time. Through the station they thundered and lurched into the yard. James said, Oh! 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 And shut his eyes. There was a bursting crash, and something sticky splashed all over him. He had run into two tar wagons and was black from smoke box to cab. James was more dirty than hurt, but the tar wagons and some of the trucks were all to pieces. The breakdown train was in the yard and they soon tidied up the mess. Toby and Percy were sent to help and came as quickly as they could. And Toby said to Percy, um, look here, Percy, whatever is that dirty object there? Any idea? Oh, uh, that's James, Toby. Didn't you know? No, uh, it's James's shape, all right. But James is a splendid red engine, and you never see his paint dirty, do you? Never James dirty, eh? James shut his eyes and pretended he hadn't heard. They cleared away the unhurt trucks and helped James home. The fat controller was there to meet them. Well done, Percy. Well done, Toby. And now you, James. <laughs> really. Fancy letting your trucks run away like that. I'm surprised. You're not fit to be seen. You must be cleaned at once. And Toby shall have a coat of paint. Uh, chocolate and blue, I think. Oh, thank you, sir. And please, sir, 
Can Henrietta have a coat of paint too? Certainly, Toby, certainly. She should be brown, like Annie and Clarabelle. Oh, thank you, sir. She will be pleased. And Toby ran home happily to tell her the news. Mrs. Kindly's Christmas It was nearly Christmas. Annie and Clarabel were packed full of people and parcels. Thomas was having very hard work pulling them. <laughs> come on, come on, <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> the coaches grumbled and were feeling so full. We're feeling so full, we're feeling so full, we're feeling so full. Thomas looked at the hill ahead. Can I do it? Can I do it? <laughs> Can I do it? Can I do it? Suddenly he saw a handkerchief waving from a cottage window. He felt better at once. Yes, I can. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, yes, I can. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, yes, I can. Shh, 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 shh. He pulled his hardest and was soon through the tunnel and resting in the station. Thomas's driver said to him, "That was Mrs. Kindly who waved to you, Thomas. She has to stay in bed all day." Oh, has she? Oh, poor lady. I am sorry for her. I am sorry. Engines have heavy loads at Christmas time, but Thomas and Toby didn't mind the hard work when they saw Mrs. Kindly waving. But then it began to rain. It rained for days and days. Thomas didn't like it. Mrs. Kindly couldn't wave on wet days. But whether she waved or not, they always whistled when they passed the little lonely cottage. Its white walls stood out against the dark background of the hills. Then, one day, Thomas's fireman said, Hello, look at that. The driver came across the cab. Ah. Something's gone wrong there. And there, hanging, flapping, and bedraggled from a window of Mrs. Kindly's cottage, was something that looked like a large red flag. Mrs. Kindly needs help, I expect. Let's stop, Thomas. And he put on the brakes, and Thomas gently stopped. The guard came squelching through the rain and mud up to Thomas's cab and the driver pointed to the flag. See if there's a doctor on the train, and ask him to go to the cottage, then walk back to the station and tell him that we've stopped. The fireman went to see if the line was clear in front. Two passengers left the train and climbed to the cottage. Then the fireman returned, and the driver said, Well, I think we'll back down to the station, so that Thomas can get a good start. But the fireman said, Huh, we shan't get up that hill. Come and see what's happened. They walked along the line, round the bend, and the driver said, Oh, Jiminy Christmas. Go back to the train. I'm going to the cottage. He found the doctor with Mrs. Kindly. Are you all right, Mrs. Kindly? Oh, yes. Thank you. It was silly of me to faint, wasn't it? But you saw the red dressing gown hanging out of the window, didn't you? Are you all safe? Oh, yes, thank you, ma'am. I've just come to thank you. You know what, doctor? There's a landslide in the cutting. Mrs. Kindly saw it from the window, and she stopped us. She saved our lives. God bless you, ma'am. And the driver went back to the train. They cleared the line by Christmas Day, and the sun shone as a special train puffed up 
from the junction. First came Toby, then Thomas with Annie and Clarabel, and last of all, but very pleased at being allowed to come, was Henrietta. The fat controller was there, and lots of other people who wanted to say thank you to Mrs. Kindly. The engines whistled and called out when they reached the cottage. <laughs> Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! The people got out and climbed to the cottage. Thomas and Toby wished they could go too. Mrs. Kindly's husband met them at the door. The fat controller, Thomas's driver, fireman and guard went upstairs to give her some presents. Mrs. Kindly was very pleased. Oh, you're very good to me. Very good indeed. And the fat controller said, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, The uh, passengers and I hope that you will accept these tickets for the South Coast, Mrs. Kindly, and get really well in the sunshine. <coughs> We cannot thank you enough for preventing an accident, a nasty accident. <laughs> now, I hope we've not tired you. Goodbye and a happy Christmas. Then, going quietly downstairs, they joined the group outside the window and sang some carols. Mrs. Kindly is now at Bournemouth, getting better every day and Thomas and Toby are looking forward to the time when they can welcome her home. Off the rails. Gordon was resting in a siding when Henry came by and said, Hello, fat face! <laughs> Hello, fat face! Gordon was furious. What cheek! What cheek! That Henry is too big for his wheels. Fancy speaking to me like that. To me! To me, who has never had an accident. Never, ever had an accident. Percy was a bit puzzled. Oh, but Gordon, aren't jammed whistles and burnt safety valves accidents? No, indeed, they are not accidents. Not accidents. They're, well, they're just high spirits. I mean, it might happen to any engine. But to come off the rails, well, I ask you, is it right? Is it decent, hmm? A few days later, it was Henry's turn to take the express. Gordon watched him getting ready. Better be careful, Henry. You're not pulling the flying kipper now, you know. <laughs> Mind you keep to the rails today, won't you? Mm? Ah, fat face! Shh! Fat face! Shh! Fat face! Shh! Fat face! Shh! 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 And Henry went on his way. But Gordon didn't care. He yawned. <laughs> and went off to sleep. <gasps> But he didn't sleep long, because his driver came along and said, Come on, wake up, Gordon. A special train's coming and we're to pull it. Uh, 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 a special train? Oh, um, uh, is it coaches or trucks? It's trucks. Oh, trucks. Uh. I don't like trucks. They lit Gordon's fire and oiled him ready for the run. The fire was sulky and wouldn't burn, but they couldn't wait, so Edward pushed him onto the turntable to get him facing the right way. Gordon grumbled like anything. I won't go, I won't go, I won't go. Edward said, don't be silly. Don't be silly. Don't be silly. Gordon tried hard, but he couldn't stop himself being moved. At last, he was on the turntable. Edward was uncoupled and backed away, and Gordon's driver and fireman jumped down to turn him round. 
the movement had shaken Gordon's fire. It was now burning nicely and making steam. But Gordon was cross and didn't care what he did. He waited till the table was halfway round and he said, Ah, I'll show him. I'll show him. And he moved slowly forward. He only meant to go a little way, just far enough to jam the table and stop it turning as he'd done once before. But he couldn't stop himself and he crashed through the side of the turntable and then through some wooden railings and he slipped and slithered down a bank into a ditch. His wheels churned around in the mud. Oh, eh, my wheels are spinning. I can't get out. I can't get out. Oh, oh, please get me out. Please get me out. But his driver and fireman said, No, not a hope. Not a hope. You're stuck, you silly great engine. You silly great engine. Don't you understand that? Don't you understand that? Hmm? They telephoned the fat controller, who said, Yes, yes, yes. Oh, so Gordon didn't want to take the special and ran into a ditch. Hmm, oh yes. What's that you say? The special's waiting? Well, tell Edward to take it, please. Yes. What, Gordon? Oh, leave him where he is. We haven't got time to bother about him now. A family of frogs croaked at Gordon as he lay in the mud. <laughs> On the other side of the ditch, some little boys shouted out, Coo, doesn't he look silly? They'll never get him out. And they began to sing. Silly old Gordon fell in a ditch, fell in a ditch, fell in a ditch. Silly old Gordon fell in a ditch all on the Monday morning. <laughs> Then the school bell rang, and they chased off down the road. Gordon was in a mess, and he said, Oh, 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 And he blew away three tadpoles and an inquisitive newt. And Gordon lay in the ditch all day long, and he was very, very unhappy. Oh, dear. Oh dear, I shall never get out. I shall never get out. <laughs> but that evening they brought floodlights. Then, with powerful jacks, they lifted Gordon and made a road of sleepers under his wheels to keep him from the mud. Strong wire ropes were fastened to his back, and James and Henry, pulling hard, at last managed to bring him to the rails. Late that night, Gordon crawled home, a sadder and a wiser engine. Autumn Leaves Two men were cleaning Gordon. Gordon didn't like it. My, my eye! My, my eye! You've got your holes in my eye. Oh, stop it! Oh, shut up, silly. Shut up. Here, Bert, did you ever see such mud? No, Alf, I never did. You ought to be ashamed, Gordon given us extra work like this. The hosing and the scrubbing stopped. Gordon opened one eye, but shut it quickly. The fat controller came along. Now, uh, wake up, Gordon, and listen to me, will you? <clears throat> now, look, you will pull no more coaches until you are a really useful engine. Understand that? A really useful engine. So there. So Gordon had to spend his time pulling trucks, and he felt his position deeply. Oh, good strains, good strains. Oh, I ate good strains. I ate them. And he went up to the trucks, and he banged them about, and they shouted out, Oh, 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 oh,
James, who was watching all this, said, It's no good going on like that, Gordon. Tracks will be tracks, you know. Ah, well, not with me, they won't. Not with me. <laughs> I'll teach them. Go on. And another truck scurried away. <laughs> they tried to push me down the hill this morning, James. <laughs> it's slippery there. You'll probably need some help with the express, you know. Me? Help? Huh. I don't need any help on hills. Gordon laughed. <laughs> and got ready for his next train. And James went away to take the express. Slippery hills indeed. <laughs> I don't need help. Come on, you coaches. Come on. The coaches grumbled, all in good time, bald in good time, bald in good time, bald in good time. The train was soon running nicely, but a distant signal checked them close to Gordon's Hill. Gordon's Hill used to be bleak and bare. Strong winds from the sea made it hard to climb. Trees were planted to give shelter, and in summer, the trains run through a leafy avenue. Now autumn had come, and dead leaves fell. The wind usually puffed them away, but today rain made them heavy, and they didn't move. The home signal showed clear, and James began to go faster. He started to climb the hill. <laughs> Easy, do it, 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 easy, do it. Halfway up, he was not so sure. I must do it, I must do it, I must do it, I must do it, I must do it. But try as he would, his wheels slipped on the leaves, and he couldn't pull the train at all. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Matter, 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 matter. What's the matter? What's the matter? Matter, 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 matter. James's driver tried to calm him. Steady, old boy. Steady. The train slowly stopped. For although James's wheels were turning forwards, the whole train started slipping down the hill. James shouted, Help! 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 <whistles> James's driver shut off steam, carefully put on the brakes, and skillfully stopped the train. The guard came along and poked his head into the cab. No what? Back to the station and send for a banker. So they brought the train safely down. But Gordon, who had followed with a good strain, saw what had happened. Uh, hello, James. I thought you could climb hills. All James could say was, he hadn't enough steam. Ah, well, James, we live and learn, don't we? We live and learn. <laughs> Never mind, little James. I'm going to push behind. Now look. Whistle when you are ready, hmm? So James waited till he had plenty of steam, and then he went... <whistles> right. Pull hard, James. Pull hard. We'll do it. Pull hard. We'll do it. We'll do it. Pull hard. Pull hard. Clouds of smoke and steam towered from the snorting engines as they struggled up the hill. We can do it. We will do it. We can do it. We will do it. We can do it. We will do it. The greasy rails sometimes made Gordon's wheel slip, but he never gave up, and presently they reached the top. We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. <laughs> All right, James. Well, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Gordon. And thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
Gordon watched the coaches wistfully till they were out of sight. Then slowly he trundled back to his waiting trucks. Down the mine. One day Thomas was at the junction when Gordon shuffled in with some trucks. Thomas said, Phew, what a funny smell. Can you smell a smell, Annie and Clarabel? No, I can't smell a smell, Thomas. Oh, no, I can't smell a smell, Thomas. Yes, it's a funny sort of smell, isn't it, Gordon? Hmm? Well, no one noticed it till you did. It must be yours. <laughs> it isn't. Annie, Clarabel, do you know what I think it is? It's ditch water. Ditch water? Hmm. Yes, ditch water. Goodbye. I'm off. <laughs> Annie and Clarabel could hardly believe their ears. They kept telling Thomas, You mustn't be rude. You make us ashamed. Oh, you mustn't be rude. You make us ashamed. But Thomas didn't care a bit. He just laughed. Oh, that was funny, that was. That really was funny. <laughs> he felt very pleased with himself. Annie and Clarabel were deeply shocked. They had great respect for Gordon, the big engine. Thomas left the coaches at a station and went to a mine for some trucks. Long ago, miners digging for lead had made tunnels under the ground. Though strong enough to hold up trucks, their roofs could not bear the weight of engines. A large notice said, Danger! Engines must not pass this board. Thomas had often been warned, but he didn't care. He'd often tried to pass the board, but he'd never succeeded, and he always used to say, Ha! Silly old board! Silly old board! This morning, he laughed as he puffed along, and he made a plan. He had to push empty trucks into one siding and pull out full ones from another. His driver stopped him, and the fireman went to turn the points. The fireman waved. Come on! Come on! And then Thomas started. The driver leaned out of the cab to see where they were going. And then Thomas saw his chance. Right. Now. And bumping the trucks fiercely, he jerked his driver off the footplate. Hoorah! I've done it! I've done it! <laughs> and laughing like anything, Thomas followed the trucks into the siding past the notice board. But suddenly there was a rumbling and a groaning, and the rails quivered. The fireman jumped clear just as the ground sank and sank, and the rails sagged and broke, and Thomas dropped right down into the big hole that had suddenly appeared. Oh, oh dear! Shh, shh! Oh, fire and smoke! Oh, oh, oh! <coughs> oh, oh! I'm sunk. And he was. He could just see out of the hole, but he couldn't move. Oh, oh dear. Oh, oh dear. Oh, oh, I am a silly little engine, no. Yes, and a very naughty one too, Thomas. I saw you. It was the fat controller. Oh, Please, sir, get me up, sir, and I won't be naughty again. <laughs> mm, well, I'm not so sure about that. We can't lift you out with the crane. The ground's not firm enough now. Let me see. I wonder, I wonder if Gordon could pull you out. Oh, uh, uh, Gordon, uh, yes, sir. Oh. Thomas didn't want to meet Gordon just yet. When Gordon heard what had happened, he started to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Down a mine, is he? Oh, what a joke! What a joke! Down a mine. <laughs> and he went off to rescue Thomas. <laughs> what a joke! What a joke! Hello, little Thomas. Hey, you are in a mess, aren't you, eh? <laughs> Never mind. We'll have you out in a couple of puffs. But they didn't pull Thomas out in two puffs. Gordon was panting hard and nearly purple before he dragged Thomas out of the hole and safely passed the board. Oh, Gordon, I am sorry that I was so cheeky. Oh, that's all right, Thomas. <laughs> You made me laugh, you know, and, well, it did me good, you see, because I'm in disgrace, you know, and, well, I feel a bit low. Oh, but I'm in disgrace too, Gordon. Why, so you are, Thomas. We are both in disgrace. Look, shall we form an alliance? An alley, an alley, an alley, what was it? An alliance, Thomas. United we stand, together we fall. You help me, and I help you. How about that? Hmm? Oh, right you are, Gordon. Good. That settle then. And buffer to buffer, the allies puffed home. Paint Pots and Queens The stations on the line were being painted. The engines were surprised. They asked the painters why the stations were being painted. Well, because the Queen is coming. So there. The engines in the shed were excited and wondered who would pull the royal train. Edward knew it wouldn't be him. But well, I'm too old to pull important trains. Gordon knew it wouldn't be him. Well, I'm in disgrace. The fat controller would never choose me. But James, the red engine, was confident. Well, he'll choose me, of course. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it at all. But Henry couldn't agree. Choose you? Choose you? <laughs> You can't climb hills. He will ask me to pull it, and I'll have a new coat of paint. <laughs> you wait and see. The days passed, and Henry puffed about proudly, quite sure that he would be the royal engine. One day, when it rained, Henry's driver and fireman stretched a tarpaulin from the cab to the tender to keep themselves dry. Henry puffed into the big station. A painter was climbing a ladder above the line. Henry's smoke puffed upwards in a big cloud. It was thick and black. The painter choked and couldn't see. <coughs> he missed his footing on the ladder dropped his paint pot and fell, whoa, plop, onto Henry's tarpaulin. The paint poured all over Henry's boiler and trickled down each side, and the paint pot perched on Henry's dome. The painter clambered down and shook his brush at Henry. Ah, you spoil my clean paint with your dirty smoke, and then you take the whole lot and make me go and fetch some more, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. The fat controller came pushing through the crowd. Mmm, dear me, you look like an iced cake, Henry. <laughs> that won't do for the royal train. Oh, no. I'm afraid that I must make other arrangements, yes. And he walked over to the yard. Gordon and Thomas saw him coming, and both began to speak at once. Uh, 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 please, sir, I want... Uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, I was thinking... No, 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 no. One at a time, please. One at a time. Now, what is it, Gordon? 
Well, sir, I just wanted to ask you if, if Thomas could have his branch line back again. Hmm, I see. Uh-huh. And uh, what do you want, Thomas? Oh, please, sir, can, can Gordon pull coaches again? Hmm, I see. So that's it. Well, you've both been quite good lately, and you deserve a treat, so when the Queen comes, Edward will go in front and clear the line, Thomas will look after the coaches, and Gordon will pull the train. Oh, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. The great day came. Percy, Toby, Henry and James worked very hard bringing people to the town. Thomas sorted all their coaches in the yard. <laughs> they're coming! They're coming! Edward steamed in looking smart with flags and bright paint. Two minutes passed, then five, then seven, and then ten, and then... <laughs> Everyone knew that whistle, and a mighty cheer went up as the Queen's train glided into the station. Gordon was spotless, and his brass shone. Like Edward, he was decorated with flags, but on his buffer beam, he proudly carried the royal arms. The Queen was met by the fat controller, and before doing anything else, she thanked him for their splendid run. The fat controller bowed and said, not at all, Your Majesty. Thank you. And then the Queen said to the fat controller, We have read a great deal about your engines. May we see them, please? So he led the way to where all the engines were waiting. Toby and Percy said, <coughs> They're coming! <coughs> They're coming! Henry and James said, but Toby and Percy were too excited to care. The fat controller told the Queen their names and she talked to each engine. Then, as she turned to go, Percy bubbled over. Oh, I say, three cheers for the Queen. Hip hip! <coughs> hip hip! <coughs> hip hip! The fat controller held his ears, but the Queen, smiling, waved to the engines till she passed the gate. Next day, the Queen spoke specially to Thomas, who fetched the coaches, and to Edward and Gordon, who took her away, and no engines ever felt prouder than Thomas and Edward and Gordon, the big engine. twenty empty cattle trucks to a market town. The sun shone, the birds sang, and some cows grazed in a field by the line. Come on, come on, come on, puffed Edward. Oh, 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 screamed the trucks. Edward puffed and clanked. The trucks rattled and screamed. The cows were not used to trains. The noise and smoke disturbed them. They twitched up their tails and ran. They galloped across the field, broke through the fence, and charged the train between the 13th and 14th trucks. The coupling broke, and the last seven trucks left the rails. They were not damaged, and stayed upright. They ran for a short way along the sleepers before stopping. Edward felt a jerk, but didn't take much notice. He was used to trucks. Bother those trucks, he thought. Why can't they come quietly? 
he ran on to the next station before either he or his driver realized what had happened. When Gordon and Henry heard about the accident, they laughed and laughed. Fancy allowing cows to break his train. They wouldn't dare do that to us. We'd show them, they boasted. Edward pretended not to mind, but Toby was cross. You couldn't help it, Edward, he said. They've never met cows. I have, and I know the trouble they are. Some days later, Gordon rushed through Edward's station. Poop, poop, he whistled. Mind the cows. Ha, 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 he chortled, panting up the hill. Hurry, 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 puffed Gordon. Don't make such a fuss, don't make such a fuss, grumbled his coaches. They rumbled over the viaduct and roared through the next station. A long, straight stretch of line lay ahead. In the distance was a bridge. It had high parapets each side. It seemed to Gordon that there was something on the bridge. His driver thought so too. Whoa, Gordon, he said, and shut off steam. Pooh, said Gordon. It's only a cow. Shoo, shoo, he hissed, moving slowly onto the bridge. But the cow wouldn't shoo. She had lost her calf and felt lonely. Moo, she said sadly, walking towards him. Gordon stopped. His driver, Farman, and some passengers tried to send her away. But she wouldn't go. So they gave it up. Presently Henry arrived with a train from the other direction. What's this? he said grandly. A cow. I'll soon settle her. Be off! Be off! he hissed. But the cow turned and mooed at him. Henry backed away. I don't want to hurt her, he said. Drivers, farmen and passengers again tried to move the cow, but failed. Henry's guard went back and put detonators on the line to protect his train. At the nearest station he told them about the cow. Oh, that must be Bluebell, said a porter thoughtfully. Her calf is here, ready to go to market. We'll take it along. So they unloaded the calf and took it to the bridge. Moo, moo, wailed the calf. Moo, moo, bellowed Bluebell. She nuzzled her calf happily, and the porter led them away. The two trains started. Not a word, keep it dark, whispered Gordon and Henry as they passed. But the story soon spread. Well, 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 chuckled Edward. Two big engines, afraid of one cow. Afraid? Rubbish, said Gordon huffily. We didn't want the poor thing to hurt herself by running against us. We stopped so as not to excite her. You see what I mean, uh, my dear Edward? Yes, Gordon, said Edward gravely. Gordon felt somehow that Edward saw only too well. Bertie's Chase Beep, beep, we're late, fussed Edward. Beep, 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 where is Thomas? He doesn't usually make us wait. Oh dear, what can the matter be, sang the farmer. Johnny so long at... Never you mind about Johnny, laughed the driver. Just you climb on the cab and look for Thomas. Can you see him? No. The guard looked at his watch. Ten minutes late, he said to the driver. We can't wait here all day. Look again, Sid, said the driver. Just in case. The farmer got to his feet. Can you see him? No, he answered. There's Bertie Bus in a tearing hurry. No need to bother with him, no. Likely he's on a coach tour or something. He clambered down. Right away, Charlie, said the guard, and Edward puffed off. Toot, toot, stop, stop, wailed Bertie, roaring into the yard. But it was no good. Edward's last coach had disappeared into the tunnel. Bother, said Bertie. Bother, Thomas's farmer not coming to work today. 
Oh, why did I promise to help the passengers catch the train? That will do, Bertie, said his driver. A promise is a promise, and we must keep it. I'll catch it with all bust, said Bertie grimly, as he raced along the road. Oh, my gears and axles, he groaned, toiling up the hill. I'll never be the same bus again. Toot, toot, I see him. Hooray, hooray, he cheered as he reached the top of the hill. He's reached the station, Bertie groaned the next minute. No, he stopped by a signal. Hooray, hooray, and he tore down the hill, his brakes squealing at the corners. His passengers bounced like balls in a bucket. Well done, Bertie, they shouted. Go it! Go it! Hens and dogs scattered in all directions as he raced through the village. Wait! Wait! He tooted, skidding into the yard. He was just in time to see the signal drop, the guard wave his flag, and Edward puff out of the station. His passengers rushed to the platform, but it was no good, and they came bustling back. I'm sorry, said Bertie unhappily. Never mind, Bertie, they said. After him, quickly. Third time lucky, you know. Do you think they'll catch him at the next station driver? There's a good chance, he answered. Our road keeps close to the line, and we can climb hills better than Edward. He thought for a minute. I'll just make sure. He then spoke to the station master, while the passengers waited impatiently in the bus. This hill is too steep, this hill is too steep grumbled the coaches as Edward snorted in front. They reached the top at last and ran smoothly into the station. Beep, beep, whistled Edward. Get in quickly, please. The porters and people hurried and Edward impatiently waited to start. Beep, whistled the guard and Edward's driver looked back. But the flag didn't wave. There was a distant goot and the station master, running across, snatched the green flag out of the guard's hand. Then everything seemed to happen at once. Toot, 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 bellowed Bertie. His passengers poured onto the platform and scrambled into the train. The station master told the guard and driver what had happened. And Edward listened. Oh, I'm sorry about the chase, Bertie, he said. My fault, panted Bertie. Later, Johnson. You didn't know about Thomas's passengers. Beep, beep. Goodbye, Bertie. We're off, whistled Edward. Three cheers for Bertie, called the passengers. They cheered and waved till they were out of sight. Saved from scrap. There is a scrapyard near Edwood Station. It is full of rusty old cars and machinery. They are brought there to be broken up. The pieces are loaded into trucks, and Edward pulls them to the steelworks, where they are melted down and used again. One day, Edward saw a traction engine in the yard. Hello, he said. You're not broken and rusty. What are you doing there? I'm Trevor, said the traction engine sadly. They're going to break me up next week. What a shame, said Edward. My driver says I only need some paint, brasso and oil to be as good as new, Trevor went on sadly. But it's no good. My master doesn't want me. I suppose it's because I'm old-fashioned. Edward snorted indignantly. People say I'm old-fashioned, but I don't care. The fat controller says I'm a useful engine. My driver says I'm useful too, replied Trevor. I sometimes feel ill. 
but I don't give up like these tractors. I struggle on and finish the job. I've never broken down in my life, he ended proudly. What work did you do? asked Edward kindly. My master would send us from farm to farm. We threshed the corn, hauled logs, sawed timber, and did lots of other work. We made friends at all the farms, and saw them every year. The children loved to see us come. They followed us in crowds, and watched us all day long. My driver would sometimes give them rides. Trevor shut his eyes, remembering. I like children, he said simply. Oh, yes, I like children. Broken up, what a shame, broken up, what a shame, thanked Edward as he went back to work. I must help Trevor, I must. He thought of the people he knew, who liked engines. Edward had lots of friends, but strangely none of them had room for a traction engine at home. It's a shame, it's a shame, he hissed as he brought his coaches to the station. Then, peep, peep, he whistled. Why didn't I think of him before? Waiting there on the platform was the very person. Morning, Charlie. Morning, Sid. Hello, Edward. You look upset. What's the matter, Charlie? He asked the driver. There's a traction engine in the scrapyard, Vicar. He'll be broken up next week, and it's a shame. Jem Cole says he never drove a better engine. Do save him, sir. You've got room, sir. Yes, Edward. I've got room, laughed the Vicar. But I don't need a traction engine. He'll saw wood. And give children rides, do buy him, sir, please. We'll see, said the vicar, and climbed into the train. Jim Cole came on Saturday afternoon. The reverend's coming to see you, Trevor. Maybe he'll buy you. Do you think he will? asked Trevor hopefully. He will when I've lit your fire and cleaned you up, said Jim. When the vicar and his two boys arrived in the evening, Trevor was blowing off steam. He hadn't felt so happy for months. What's this reverence? called Jim. And Trevor chuffered happily about the yard. Oh, Daddy, do buy him, pleaded the boys, jumping up and down in their excitement. Now I'll try. And the vicar climbed up beside Jim. Show your pieces, Trevor, he said, and drove him about the yard. Then he went into the office and came out smiling. I've got him cheap, Jim, cheap. Do you hear that, Trevor? cried Jim. The Reverend saved you, and you'll live at the vicarage now. Boop, boop, whistled Trevor happily. Will you drive him home for me, Jim, and take these scallywags with you? They won't want to come in the car when there's a traction engine to ride on. Trevor's home in the vicarage orchard is close to the railway, and he sees Edward every day. His paint is spotless, and his brass shines like gold. He soars farward in winter, and Jim sometimes borrows him when a tractor fails. Trevor likes doing his old jobs, but his happiest day is the church fete. Then, with a long wooden seat bolted to his bunker, he truffers round the orchard, giving rides to children. Long afterwards, you will see him shut his eyes, remembering... I like children, he whispers happily. made him cross. Late again, he shouted. Edward only laughed, and James fumed away. Edward is impossible, he grumbled to the others. 
He clacks about like a lot of old iron. And he is so slow, he makes us wait. Thomas and Percy were indignant. Old iron? They snorted. Slow? Why, Edward could beat you in a race any day. Really? said James huffily. I should like to see him do it. One day, James's driver did not feel well when he came to work. I'll manage, he said. But when they reached the top of Gordon's Hill, he could hardly stand. The farmer drove the train to the next station. He spoke to the signalman, put the trucks in a siding, and uncoupled James ready for shunting. Then he helped the driver over to the station and asked them to look after him and find a relief. Suddenly the signalman shouted, and the farmer turned round and saw James puffing away. He ran hard, but he couldn't catch James, and soon came back to the signal box. The signalman was busy. All traffic halted, he announced at last. Up and down main lines are clear for 30 miles, and the inspector's coming. The farmer mopped his face. What happened? he asked. Two boys were on the footplate. They tumbled off when James started. I shouted at them and they ran like rabbits. Just let me catch them, said the farmer grimly. I'll teach them to meddle with my engine. Both men jumped as the telephone rang. Yes, answered the signalman. He's here. Right, I'll tell him. The inspector's coming at once in Edward. He wants a shunter's pole and a coil of wire rope. What for? wondered the farmer. Search me, but you'd better get them quickly. The farmer was ready and waiting when Edward arrived. The inspector saw the pole and rope. Good man, he said. Jump in. We'll catch him. <laughs> we'll catch him. <laughs> Puffed Edward, crossing to the upline in pursuit. James was laughing as he left the yard. What a lark! What a lark! He chuckled to himself. Presently, he missed his driver's hand on the regulator. And then he realised there was no one in his cab. What shall I do? he wailed. I can't stop. Help! Help! We're coming. <laughs> We're coming. <laughs> Edward was panting up behind with every ounce of steam he had. With a great effort, he caught up and crept alongside, slowly gaining till his smoke box was level with James' buffer beam. Steady, Edward. The inspector stood on Edward's front holding a noose of rope in the crook of the shunter's pole. He was trying to slip it over James' buffer. The engine swayed and lurched. He tried again and again. More than once he nearly fell, but just saved himself. At last, got him, he shouted. He pulled the noose tight and came back to the cab safely. Gently breaking, so as not to snap the rope, Edward's driver checked the engine's speed and James's farman scrambled across and took control. The engines puffed back side by side. So, the old iron caught you after all, chuckled Edward. I'm sorry, whispered James. Thank you for saving me. That's all right. You were splendid, Edward. The fat controller was waiting and thanking the men warmly. A fine piece of work, he said. James, you can rest and then take your train. I'm proud of you, Edward. You shall go to the works and have your worn parts mended. Oh, thank you, sir, said Edward happily. It'll be lovely not to plank. The two naughty boys were soon caught by the police, and their fathers walloped them soundly. They were also forbidden to watch trains till they could be trusted. James's driver soon got well in hospital and is now back at work. James missed him very much. But he missed Edward more. And you'll be glad to know that when Edward came home the other day, James and all the other engines gave him a tremendous welcome. The fat controller thinks he'll be deaf for weeks. <laughs>
Carlo he remembers. The fat controller had sent Edward to the works to be mended. Near the works station, Edward noticed a narrow gauge engine standing in an open sided shed. That's Scarlowe, he thought. What's he doing there? He remembered Scarlowe and his brother Rhenius, because in the old days he had often brought passengers who wanted to travel up to the lake in their little train. As the men at the works could not mend him at once, Edward asked them to put him on a siding close to Scarlowe. Scarlowe was pleased to see Edward. The owner has just bought two more engines, he said. He told me I was a very old engine and deserved a good rest. He gave me this shed so that I could see everything and not be lonely. But I am lonely all the same, he continued sadly. I miss Renius very much. Yesterday one of the new engines pushed him on a truck and now he's gone to be mended. I wish I could be mended too, and pull coaches again. Have your coaches got names? asked Edward. Oh, yes. There's Agnes, Ruth, Jemima, Lucy and Beatrice. Agnes is proud. She has cushions for first-class passengers. She pities Ruth, Jemima and Lucy, who are third-class with bare boards. But they all four sniff at Beatrice. Beatrice often smells of fish and cheese, but she is most important, said Scarlowe earnestly. She has a little window through which the guard sells tickets. I sometimes leave the others behind, but I always take Beatrice. You must have tickets and a guard, you know. Of course, said Edward gravely. Renius and I, continued Scarlowe, used to take turns at pulling the trains. We know everybody, and everybody knows us. We whistle to the people in the fields, at level crossings, and in lonely cottages and farms, and the people always wave to us. We love passing the school playgrounds at break time, and then the children will always run over to the fence to watch us go by. The passengers always wave, because they think the children are waving to them. But we engines know better, of course, said Scarlowe importantly. Yes, we do indeed, agreed Edward. We take your tourists to the lake and then get ready to pull the train back. We enjoy the morning journey home because then our friends from the villages come down to do their shopping. We whistle before every station, peep, peep, look out, and the people are there ready. Where's Mrs. Last? asks the guard. She's coming. Peep, peep, we whistle, and Mrs. Last comes running onto the platform. We'll leave you behind one of these days, Mrs. Laughs our driver, but we know he never will. We stop elsewhere, too, at farm crossings and stiles, where paths lead to lonely houses. Renius and I know all the places very well indeed, and our driver used to say that we would stop even if he didn't put on the brakes. Sometimes on market day, Ruth, Jemima and Lucy were so full of people that the guard would allow third-class passengers to travel in Agnes. She didn't like that at all. I would grumble. First-class coach, third-class people. That made me cross. Shut up, I'd say, or I'll bump you. That soon stopped her rudeness to my friends. Just then, some workmen came. We're going to mend you now, Edward, they said. Come along. Well, goodbye, Scarlowe. Thank you for telling me about your railway. It's a lovely little line. It is, it is. Thank you for talking to me, Edward. You've cheered me up. Goodbye. Scarlowe watched Edward being taken back to the works. Then, shutting his eyes, he dozed in the warm afternoon sun. He smiled as he dozed, for he was dreaming, as old engines will, of happy days in the past. Sir Handel. The new engines looked very smart. One was called Sir Handel, 
and the other Peter Sam. What a small shed, grumbled Sir Handel. This won't do at all. I think it's nice, said Peter Sam. Huh, grunted Sir Handel. What's that rubbish? Shush, shush, said Peter Sam. That's Scarloe, the famous old engine. I'm sorry, Scarloe, he whispered. Sir Handel's upset now, but he's quite nice, really. Scarloe felt sorry for Peter Sam. No, Sir Handel, said the farmer next morning. We'll get you ready. I'm tired, he yawned. Let Peter Sam go. He'd love it. No, said the farmer. Owner's orders. You're first. Oh, well, said Sir Handel sulkily. I suppose I must. When his driver arrived, Sir Handel puffed away to fetch the coaches. Whatever next, he snorted. Those aren't coaches. They're cattle trucks. Oh, screamed Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima and Beatrice. What a horrid engine. It's not what I'm used to, clanked Sir Handel rebelliously, making for the station. He rolled to the platform just as Gordon arrived. Hello, he said. Who are you? I'm Gordon. Who are you? I'm Sir Handel. Yes, I've heard of you. You're an express engine, I believe. So am I, but I'm used to bogey coaches, not these cattle trucks. Do you have bogey coaches? Oh, yes, I see you do. We must have a chat sometime. Sorry I can't stop. Must keep time, you know. And he puffed off, leaving Gordon at a loss for words. Come along! Come along! he puffed. Cattle trucks! Cattle trucks! grumbled the coaches. We'll pay him out! We'll pay him out! Presently they stopped at the station. The line curved here and began to climb. It was not very steep, but the day was misty and the rails were slippery. Hold back, whispered Agnes to Ruth. Hold back, whispered Ruth to Jemima. Hold back, whispered Jemima to Lucy. Hold back, whispered Lucy to Beatrice. And they giggled as the handles started and their couplings tightened. Come on! Come on! He puffed as his wheels slipped on the greasy rails. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! His wheels were spinning, but the coaches pulled him back and the train stopped on the hill beyond the station. I can't do it! I can't do it! he grumbled. I'm used to sensible bogey coaches, not these bumpy cattle trucks. The guard came up. I think the coaches are up to something, he told the driver. So they decided to bring the train down again to a level piece of line, to give us a handle a good start. The guard helped the farm and put sand on the rails, and Sir Handel made a tremendous effort. The coaches tried hard to drag him back, but he puffed and pulled so hard that they were soon over the top and away on their journey. The thin controller was severe with Sir Handel that night. You are a troublesome engine, he said. You are rude, conceited, and much too big for your wheels. Next time I shall punish you severely. Sir Handel was impressed, and behaved well for several days. Then, one morning, he took the train to the top station. He was cross. It was Peter Sam's turn, but the thin controller had made him go instead. We'll leave the coaches, said his driver, and fetch some trucks from the quarry. Trucks! snorted Sir Handel. Trucks! Yes, his driver repeated. Trucks. Sir Handel jerked forward. I won't, he muttered. So there. He lurched, bumped, and stopped. His driver and farman got out. Told you, said Sir Handel triumphantly. He had pushed the rails apart and settled down between them. They telephoned the thin controller. He came up at once with Peter Sam and brought some workmen in a truck. Then he and the farman took Peter Sam home with the coaches, while the driver and workman put Sir Handel back on the rails. Sir Handel did not feel so pleased with himself when he crawled home and found the thin controller waiting for him. You are a very naughty engine, he said sternly. You will stay in the shed 
till I can trust you to behave. Peter, Sam, and the refreshment lady. As the handle was shut up, Peter, Sam had to run the line. He was excited, and the farmer found it hard to get him ready. Sober up, can't you? He growled. Anybody would think, said Sir Handel rudely, that he wanted to work. All respectable engines do, said Scarlowy firmly. I wish I could work myself. Keep calm, Peter Sam. Don't get excited, and you'll do very well. But Peter Sam was in such a state that he couldn't listen. When his driver came, Peter Sam ran along to fetch the coaches. Come along, girls! He whistled, and although he was so excited, he remembered to be careful. That's the way, my dears. Gently does it. What did he say? Asked Jemima, who was deaf. He said, "Come along, girls," and he he called us his dears. Simpered the other coaches. Really, one does not know what to think. Such a handsome young engine too. So nice and well mannered. And they tittered happily together as they followed Peter Sam. Peter Sam fussed into the station to find Henry already there. This won't do, youngster," said Henry. "I can't be kept waiting. If you are late tonight, I'll go off and leave your passengers behind." "Pooh," said Peter Sam. But secretly he was a little worried. But he couldn't feel worried for long. What fun it all is," he thought as he ran around his train. He let off steam happily, while he waited for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. Peter Sam puffed happily away, singing a little song: "I'm Peter Sam, I'm running this line. I'm Peter Sam, I'm running this line." The people waved as he passed the farms and cottages, and he gave a loud whistle at the school. The children all ran to see him puffing by. Agnes, Ruth, Jemima, Lucy, and Beatrice enjoyed themselves too. He's cocky, trot trot, but he's nice, trot trot. He's cocky, trot trot, but he's nice, trot trot. They sang as they trundled along. They were growing very fond of Peter Sam. Every afternoon, they had to wait an hour at the station by the lake. The driver, farmer, and the guard usually bought something from the refreshment lady, and went and sat in Beatrice. The refreshment lady always came home on this train. Time passed slowly today for Peter Sam. At last, his driver and farmer came. Peep, peep! Hurry up, please! He whistled to the passengers, and they came strolling back to the station. Peter Sam was sizzling with impatience. How awful! He thought, if we miss Henry's train. The last passengers arrived. The guard was ready with his flag and whistle. The refreshment lady walked across the platform. Then it happened. The guard says that Peter Sam was too impatient. Peter Sam says he was sure he heard a whistle. Anyway, he started. Come quickly! Come quickly! He puffed. Stop! 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 Wailed the coaches. You've left her behind. You've left her behind. The guard whistled and waved his red flag. The driver, looking back, saw the refreshment lady shouting and running after the train. Bother! Groaned Peter Sam as he stopped. We'll miss Henry now. The refreshment lady climbed into Beatrice, and they started again. Oh, oh, we're sure to be late. Oh, oh, we're sure to be late. Panted Peter Sam frantically. His driver had to keep checking him. Steady, old boy. Steady. Peep, peep. 
Peter Sam whistled at the stations. Hurry, please, hurry! And they reached the big station just as Henry steamed in. Hoorah! said Peter Sam. We've caught him after all. And he let off steam with relief. Whoosh! Not bad, youngster, said Henry loftily. The refreshment lady shook her fist at Peter Sam. What do you mean by leaving me behind? she demanded. I'm sorry, refreshment lady, but I was worried about our passengers. And he told her what Henry had said. The refreshment lady laughed. Oh, you silly engine, she said. Henry wouldn't dare go. He's got to wait. It's a guaranteed connection. Well, said Peter Sam. Well, where's that Henry? But Peter Sam was too late that time, for Henry had trottled away. The handle stayed shut up for several days, but one market day, Peter Sam could not work. He needed repairs. Sir Handel was glad to come out. He tried to be kind, but the coaches didn't trust him. They were awkward and rude. He even sang them little songs, but it was no use. It was most unfortunate, too, that Sir Handel had to check suddenly to avoid running over a sheep. He's bumped us, screamed the coaches. Let's pay him out. The coaches knew that all engines must go carefully at a place near the big station. But they were so cross with Sir Handel that they didn't care what they did. They surged into Sir Handel, making him lurch off the line. Luckily, no one was hurt. Sir Handel limped to the shed. The thin controller inspected the damage. No more work for you today, he said. Bother those coaches. We must take the village people home and fetch the tourists, all without an engine. What about me, sir? said a voice. Scarlowy, he exclaimed. Can you do it? I'll try, answered the old engine. The coaches stood at the platform. Scarlowy advanced on them, hissing crossly. I'm ashamed of you, he scolded. Such behaviour. You might have hurt your passengers. On market day, too. We're sorry, Scarlowy. We, we didn't think. It's That's a handle. He's no tails, said Scarlowy firmly. I won't have it. And don't you dare try tricks on me. No, Scarlowy. Oh, of course not, Scarlowy, quavered the coaches meekly. Scarlowy might be old and have dirty paint, but he was certainly an engine who would stand no nonsense. His friends crowded round, and the guard had to shoo them away before they could start. Scarlowy felt happy. He remembered all the gates and stiles where he had to stop, and whistled to his friends. The sun shone, the rails were dry. This is lovely, he thought. But presently they began to climb, and he felt short of steam. Oh, bother my tubes, he panted. Take your time, old boy, soothed his driver. I'll manage. I'll manage. He wheezed, and pausing for breath at the stations, he gallantly struggled along. 
After a rest at the top station, Scarlowy was ready to start. It'll be better downhill, he thought. The coaches ran nicely, but he soon began to feel tired again. His springs were weak, and the rail joints jarred his wheels. Then with a crack, a front spring broke, and he stopped. I feel all crooked, he complained. That's torn it, said his driver. We'll need a bus now for our passengers. No, pleaded Scarlowy. I'd be ashamed to have a bus take my passengers. I'll get home or burst, he promised bravely. The thin controller looked at his watch and paced the platform. James and his train waited impatiently too. They heard a horse peep. Then groaning, clanging, and clanking, Scarlowy crept into sight. He was tilted to one side and making fearful noises, but he plodded bravely on. I'll do it! <sighs> I'll do it! <sighs> he gasped between the clanks and groans. I'll! I've done it! <sighs> and he sighed thankfully as the train stopped where James was waiting. James said nothing. He waited for his passengers, and then respectfully puffed away. You were right, sir, said Scarlowy to the owner that evening. Old engines can't pull trains like young ones. The owner smiled. They can if they're mended, old faithful, he said. And that's what will happen to you. You deserve it. Oh, sir, said Scarlowy happily. Sir Handel is longing for Scarlowy to come back. He thinks Scarlowy is the best engine in the world. He does his fair share of the work now, and the coaches never play tricks on him, because he always manages them in Scarlowy's way. Percy and the Signal Percy is a little green tank engine who works in the yard at the big station. He is a funny little engine and loves playing jokes. These jokes sometimes get him into trouble. Peep, peep, he whistled one morning. Hurry up, Gordon! The train's ready. Gordon thought he was late and came puffing out. Ha, 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 laughed Percy and showed him a train of dirty coal trucks. Gordon didn't go back to the shed. He stayed on a siding thinking how to pay Percy out. Stay in the shed today, squeaked Percy to James. The fat controller will come and see you. James was a conceited engine. Ah, he thought. But that controller knows I'm a fine engine, ready for anything. He wants me to pull a special train. So James stayed where he was, and nothing his driver and fireman could do would make him move. But the fat controller never came, and the other engines grumbled dreadfully. They had to do James's work as well as their own. At last an inspector came. Show a wheel, James, he said crossly. You can't stay here all day. The fat controller told me to stay here, answered James sulkily. He sent a message this morning. He did not, retorted the inspector. How could he? He's away for a week. Oh, said James. Oh. He came quickly out of the shed. Where's Percy? Percy had wisely disappeared. When the fat controller came back, he did see James. And Percy too. Both engines wished he hadn't. James and Gordon wanted to pay Percy out. 
but Percy kept out of their way. One morning, however, he was so excited that he forgot to be careful. I say, you engines, he bubbled. I have to take some trucks to Thomas's junction. The fat controller chose me specially. He must know I'm a really useful engine. More likely he wants you out of the way, grunted James. But Gordon gave James a wink. Ah, ah, yes, said James. Just so. You were saying, Gordon? James and I were just speaking about signals at the junction. We can't be too careful about signals. But then I needn't say that to a really useful engine like you, Percy. Percy felt flattered. Oh, of course not, he said. We had spoken of backing signals, put in James. They need extra special care, you know. Would you like me to explain? No, oh, thank you, James, said Percy airily. I know all about signals. And he bustled off importantly. James and Gordon solemnly exchanged winks. Percy was a little worried as he set out. I wonder what backing signals are, he thought. Never mind, I'll manage. I know all about signals. He puffed crossly to his trucks and felt better. He saw a signal just outside the station. Bother, he said. It's a danger. Oh, 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 screamed the trucks as they bumped into each other. Presently the signal moved to show line clear. Its arm moved up instead of down. Percy had never seen that sort of signal before. He was surprised. Down means go, he thought, and up means stop. So upper still must mean go back. I know, it's one of those backing signals. How clever of me to find that out. Come on, Percy, said his driver. Off we go. But Percy wouldn't go forward, and his driver had to let him back in order to start at all. I am clever, thought Percy. Even my driver doesn't know about backing signals. And he started so suddenly that the truck screamed again. Whoa, Percy, called his driver. Stop! You're going the wrong way. But it's a backing signal, Percy protested, and told him about Gordon and James. The driver laughed and explained about signals that point up. Oh dear, said Percy. Let's start quickly before they come and see us. But he was too late. Gordon was swept by with the express and saw everything. The big engines talked about signals that night. They thought the subject was funny. They laughed a lot. Percy thought they were being very silly. Duck takes charge. Do you know what? asked Percy. What? grunted Gordon. Do you know what? Silly, said Gordon crossly. Of course I don't know what. If you don't tell me what what is. The fat controller says that the work in the yard is too heavy for me. He's getting a bigger engine to help me. Rubbish, put in James. Any engine could do it, he went on grandly. If you worked more and chattered less, this yard would be a sweeter, a better and a happier place. Percy went off to fetch some coaches. That stupid old signal, he thought. No one listens to me now. They think I'm a silly little engine and order me about. I'll show them. I'll show them. He puffed as he ran about the yard. But he didn't know how. Things went wrong. The coaches and trucks behaved badly. And by the end of the afternoon, he felt tired and unhappy. 
he brought some coaches to the station and stood panting at the end of the platform. Hello, Percy, said the fat controller. You look tired. Yes, sir. I am, sir. I don't know if I'm standing on my dome or my wheels. Oh, oh you, you look the right way up to me, laughed the fat controller. Cheer up. The new engine is bigger than you. I can probably do the work alone. Would you like to help build my new harbour at Thomas's junction? Thomas and Toby will help, but I need an engine there all the time. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir, said Percy happily. The new engine arrived next morning. What is your name? asked the fat controller kindly. Montague, sir, but I'm usually called Duck. They say I waddle. I don't really, sir, but I like Duck better than Montague. Good, said the fat controller. Duck it shall be. Yeah, Percy, come and show Duck around. The two engines went off together. At first the trucks played tricks, but soon found that playing tricks on Duck was a mistake. The coaches behaved well, though James, Gordon and Henry did not. They watched Duck quietly doing his work. He seems a simple sort of engine, they whispered. We'll have some fun. Quack! Quack! They wheezed as they passed him. Percy was cross, but Duck took no notice. I'll get tired of it soon, he said. Presently the three engines began to order Duck about. Duck stopped. Did they tell you to do things, Percy? he asked. Yes, they do, answered Percy sadly. Right, said Duck. We'll soon stop that nonsense. He whispered something. We'll do it tonight. The fat controller had had a good day. There had been no grumbling passengers. All the trains had run to time, and Duck had worked well in the yard. The fat controller was looking forward to hot buttered toast for tea at home. He had just left the office when he heard an extraordinary noise. Bother, he said and hurried to the yard. Henry, Gordon and James were wishing and snorting furiously, while Duck and Percy calmly sat on the points outside the shed, refusing to let the engines in. Stop that noise, he bellowed. No, Gordon. They won't let us in, hissed the big engine crossly. Duck, explain this behaviour. Oh, beg pardon, sir. But I'm a Great Western engine. We Great Western engines do our work without fuss. But we are not ordered about by other engines. You, sir, are our controller. We will, of course, move if you order us. But begging your pardon, sir, Percy and I will be glad if you would inform these uh, engines that we only take orders from you. The three big engines hissed angrily. Silence, snapped the fat controller. Percy and Duck, I am pleased with your work today, but not with your behaviour tonight. You have caused a disturbance. Gordon, Henry and James sniggered. They stopped suddenly when the fat controller turned on them. As for you, he thundered, you've been worse. You who made the disturbance. Duck is quite right. This is my railway and I give the orders. When Percy went away, Duck was left to manage alone. He did so easily. <laughs>
to where the workmen needed the stone for their building. An airfield was close by, and Percy heard the aeroplane zooming overhead all day. The noisiest of all was a helicopter, which hovered, buzzing like an angry bee. Stupid thing, said Percy. Why can't it go and buzz somewhere else? One day, Percy stopped near the airfield. The helicopter was standing quite close. Hello, said Percy. Who are you? I'm Harold. Who are you? I'm Percy. What whirly great arms you've got. They're nice arms, said Harold, offended. I can hover like a bird. Don't you wish you could hover? Certainly not. I like my rails, thank you. I think railways are slow, said Harold in a bored voice. They're not much use, and quite out of date. He whirled his arms and buzzed away. Percy found Toby at the top station, arranging trucks. I say, Toby, he burst out, that Harold, that stuck-up whirlybird thing, says I'm slow and out of date. Just let him wait. I'll show him. He collected his trucks and started off, still fuming. Soon, above the clatter of the trucks, they heard a familiar buzzing. Percy, whispered his driver, there's Harold. He's not far ahead. Let's race him. Yes, let's, said Percy excitedly, and quickly gathering speed, he shot off down the line. The guard's wife had given him a flask of tea for elevenses. He had just poured out a cup when the van lurched and he spilt it down his uniform. He wiped up the mess with his handkerchief and staggered to the front platform. Percy was pounding along. The truck screamed and swayed while the van rolled and pitched like a ship at sea. Well, I'll be ding-dong-danged, said the guard. Then he saw Harold buzzing alongside and understood. Go it, Percy, he yelled. You're gaining. Percy had never been allowed to run fast before. He was having the time of his life. Hurry, 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 he panted to the trucks. We don't want to, we don't want to, they grumbled, but it was no use. Percy was bucketing along with flying wheels, and Harold was high and alongside. The farmer shoveled for dear life, while the driver was so excited he could hardly keep still. Well done, Percy, he shouted. We're gaining, we're going ahead. Oh, good boy, good boy. Far ahead, a distant signal warned them that the wharf was near. Shut off steam, whistle, beep, 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 brakes guard, please. Using Percy's brakes too, the driver carefully checked the train's headlong speed. They rolled under the main line and halted smoothly on the wharf. Oh dear, groaned Percy. I'm sure we've lost. The farmer scrambled to the cab roof. We've won! We've won! he shouted, and nearly fell off in his excitement. Harold's still hovering! He's looking for a place to land! Listen, boys, the farmer called. Here's a song for Percy. Said our old helicopter to our Percy, you are slow. Your railway is out of date and not much use, you know. But Percy with his stone trucks did the trip in record time. And we beat that helicopter on our old branch line. The driver and guard soon caught the tune, and so did the workman on the quay. Percy loved it. Oh, thank you, he said. He liked the last line best of all. Percy's Promise
a mob of excited children poured out of Annie and Clarabel one morning and raced down to the beach. They're the Vicar's Sunday School, explained Thomas. I'm busy this evening, but the station master says I can ask you to take them home. Of course I will, promised Percy. The children had a lovely day, but at tea time it got very hot. Dark clouds loomed overhead, then came lightning, thunder and rain. The children only just managed to reach shelter before the deluge began. Annie and Clarabelle stood at the platform. The children scrambled in. Can we go home, please, Station Master? asked the vicar. The Station Master called Percy. Take the children home quickly, please, he ordered. The rain streamed down on Percy's boiler. Ugh! he shivered and thought of his nice dry shed. Then he remembered. A promise is a promise, he told himself. So, here goes. His driver was anxious. The river was rising fast. It foamed and swirled fiercely, threatening to flood the country any minute. The rain beat in Percy's face. I wish I could see! I wish I could see! He complained. They left a cutting and found themselves in water. Oh, my wheels! shivered Percy. It's cold! But he struggled on. Whoosh! He hissed. It's sloshing my fire! They stopped and backed the coaches to the cutting and waited while the guard found a telephone. He returned looking gloomy. We couldn't go back if we wanted, he said. The bridge near the junction is down. The farman went to the guard's van carrying a hatchet. Hello, said the guard. You look fierce. I want some dry wood for Percy's fire, please. They broke up some boxes, but that did not satisfy the farman. I'll have some of your floorboards, he said. What, my nice floor? grumbled the guard. I only swept it this morning. But he found a hatchet and helped. Soon they had plenty of wood stored in Percy's bunker. His fire burnt well now. He felt warm and comfortable again. Oh dear, thought Percy sadly. Harold's come to laugh at me. Boom! Something thudded on Percy's boiler. Oh! He exclaimed in a muffled voice. That's really too bad. He needs to throw things. His driver unwound a parachute from Percy's indignant front. Harold isn't throwing things at you, he laughed. He's dropping hot drinks for us. They all had a drink of cocoa and felt better. Percy had steam up now. Beep, beep, thank you, Harold, he whistled. Come on, let's go. The water lapped his wheels. Ugh! He shivered. It crept up and up and up. It reached his ash pan, then it sloshed at his fire. Oosh! Percy was losing steam, but he plunged bravely on. I promised! He panted. I promised! They piled his fire high with wood and managed to keep him steaming. I, I must do it, he gasped. I must, I must, I must. He made a last great effort and stood exhausted but triumphant on rails which were clear of the flood. He rested to get steam back, then brought the train home. Three cheers for Percy, called the vicar and the children nearly raised the roof. The fat controller arrived in Harold. First he thanked the men. Harold told me you are a wizard, Percy. He says he can beat you at some things, Percy snorted. But not at being a submarine, he chuckled. I don't know what you've both been playing at, and I won't ask. But I do know that you're a really useful engine. Oh, sir, whispered Percy happily.
Percy takes the plunge. Sometimes Percy takes stone trucks to the other end of the line. There he meets engines from the other railway. One day Henry wanted to rest in the shed, but Percy was talking to some tank engines. It was raining hard. Water swirled under my boiler. I couldn't see where I was going, but I struggled on. Oh, Percy, you are brave. Well, said Percy modestly, it wasn't anything really. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Tell us more, Percy, said the engines. What are you engines doing here? hissed Henry. This shed is for the fat controller's engines. Go away. Silly things, Henry snorted. They're not silly. Percy had been enjoying himself. He was cross because Henry had sent them away. They are silly, and so are you. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Pa! Anyway, said cheeky Percy, I'm not afraid of water. I like it. He ran away singing, Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. Percy arrived home feeling pleased with himself. Silly old Henry, he chuckled. Thomas was looking at a board on the quay. It said, Danger. We mustn't go past it, he said. That's orders. Why? Danger means falling down something, said Thomas. I went past danger once and fell down a mine. Percy looked beyond the board. I can't see a mine, he said. He didn't know that the foundations of the quay had sunk and that the rails now sloped downward to the sea. Stupid board, said Percy. For days and days he tried to sidle past it, but his driver stopped him every time. No, you don't, he would say. Then Percy made a plan. One day at the top station, he whispered to the trucks, Will you give me a bump when we get to the quay? The trucks were surprised. They had never been asked to bump an engine before. They giggled and chattered about it the whole way down. Whoa, Percy, whoa, said his driver, and Percy checked obediently at the distant signal. Driver doesn't know my plan, he chuckled. On, 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 <laughs> laughed the trucks. Percy thought they were helping. I'll pretend to stop at the station, but the trucks will push me past the board. Then I'll make them stop. I can do that whenever I like. If Percy hadn't been so conceited, he would never have been so silly. Every wise engine knows that you cannot trust trucks. They reached the station, and Percy's brakes groaned. That was the signal for the trucks. Go on, go on, they yelled and surged forward together. They gave Percy a fearful bump and knocked his driver and farmer off the footplate. Ow! said Percy, sliding past the board. The day was misty, the rails were slippery, his wheels wouldn't grip. Percy was frantic. That's enough! he hissed. But it was too late. Once on the slope, he tobogganed helplessly down, crashed through the buffers, and slithered into the sea. You are a very disobedient engine! Percy knew that voice. He groaned. The foreman borrowed a small boat and rowed the fat controller around. P -p Please, sir, get me out, sir. I I'm truly sorry, sir. No, Percy, we cannot do that till high tide. I hope it will teach you to obey orders. Y yes, sir. Percy shivered miserably. He was cold. Fish were playing hide-and-seek through his wheels. The tide rose higher and higher. He was feeling his position more and more deeply every minute. It was nearly dark when they brought floating cranes, cleared away the trucks and lifted Percy out. 
He was too cold and stiff to move by himself, so he was sent to the works next day on Henry's goods train. Well, 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 chuckled Henry. Did you like the water? No. I am surprised. You need more determination, Percy. Water's nothing to an engine with determination, you know. Ha <laughs> ha! Perhaps you'll like it better next time. But Percy is quite determined that there won't be a next time. Gordon goes foreign. Lots of people travel to the big station at the end of the line. Engines from the other railway sometimes pull their trains. These engines stay the night and go home next day. Gordon was talking one day to one of these. When I was young and green, he said, I remember going to London. Do you know the place? The station's called King's Cross. King's Cross? snorted the engine. London's Euston. Everybody knows that. Rubbish, said Duck. London's Paddington. I know. I work there. They argued till they went to sleep. They argued when they woke up. They were still arguing when the other engine went away. Stupid thing, said Gordon crossly. I've no patience. Stupid yourself, said Duck. London's Paddington. Paddington, do you hear? Stop arguing, James broke in. You make me tired. You're both agreed about something anyway. What's that? London's not Euston, laughed James. Now shut up. Gordon rolled away, still grumbling. I'm sure it's King's Cross. I'll go and prove it. But that was easier said than done. London lay beyond the big station, at the other end of the line. Gordon had to stop there. Another engine then took his train. If I didn't stop, he thought, I could go to London. One day he ran right through the station. Another time he tried to start before the farmer could uncouple the coaches. He tried all sorts of tricks, but it was no good. His driver checked him every time. Oh dear, he thought sadly, I'll never get there. One day he pulled the express to the station as usual. His farmer uncoupled the coaches and he ran on to his siding to wait till it was time to go home. The coaches waited and waited at the platform, but their engine didn't come. A porter ran across and spoke to Gordon's driver. The inspector's on the platform. He wants to see you. The driver climbed down from the cab and walked over to the station. He came back in a few minutes looking excited. Hello, said the farmer. What's happened? The engine for the express turned over when it was coming out the yard. Nothing else can come in or out. They want us to take the train to London. I said we would if the fact controller agreed. They telephoned and he said we could do it. How's that? Fine, said the farmer. We'll show them what the fact controller's engines can do. Come on, said Gordon, let's go. He rolled quickly over the crossings and backed onto the train. It was only a few minutes before the guard blew his whistle, but Gordon thought it was ages. Come on! Come on, he puffed to the coaches. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're going to town, we're going to town, sang the coaches. Slowly at first, then faster and faster. We're going to town, we're going to town, we're going to town, we're going to town. Gordon found that London was a long way away. Never mind, he said. I like a good long run to stretch my wheels. But all the same, he was glad when London came in sight. The fat controller came into his office next morning. He looked at the letters on his desk. 
One had a London postmark. I wonder how Gordon is getting on, he said. The station master knocked and came in. He looked excited. Excuse me, sir, have you seen the news? Not yet, why? Oh, just look at this, sir. The fat controller took the newspaper. Good gracious me, he said. There's Gordon. Headlines, too. Famous engine at London station. Police called to control crowds. The fat controller read on, absorbed. Gordon returned next day. The fat controller spoke to his driver and farman. I see you had a good welcome in London. We certainly did, sir. We signed autographs till our arms ached. And Gordon had his photograph taken from so many directions at once that he didn't know which way to look. Good, smiled the fat controller. I expect he enjoyed himself. Didn't you, Gordon? No, sir, I didn't. Why, ever not? London's all wrong, answered Gordon sadly. They've changed it. It isn't King's Cross anymore. It's St Pancras. Double header. The fat controller gave Gordon a rest when he came back from London. He told James to do his work. James got very conceited about it. You know, little Toby, he said one day, I'm an important engine now. Everybody knows it. They come in crowds to see me flash by. The heaviest train makes no difference. I'm as regular as clockwork. They all set their watches by me. Never late, always on time. That's me, says you, replied Toby cheekily. Toby was out on the main line. The fat controller had sent him to the works. His parts were worn. They clanked as he trundled along. He was enjoying his journey. He was a little engine, and his tanks didn't hold much water, so he often had to stop for a drink. He had small wheels, too, and he couldn't go fast. Never mind, he thought. The signalmen all know me. They'll give me plenty of time. But a new signalman had come to one of the stations. Toby had wanted to take Henrietta, but the fat controller had said, No! What would the passengers do without her? He wondered if Henrietta was lonely. Percy had promised to look after her, but Toby couldn't help worrying. Percy doesn't understand her like I do, he said. He felt thirsty and tired. He had come a long way. He saw a distant signal. Good, he thought. Now I can have a nice drink and rest in a siding till James has gone by. Toby's driver thought so too. They stopped by the water crane. His farman jumped out and put the hose in his tank. Toby was enjoying his drink when the signalman came up. Toby had never seen him before. No time for that, said the signalman. We must clear the road for the express. Right, said the driver. We'll wait in the siding. No good, said the signalman. It's full of trucks. You'll have to hurry to the next station. They've got plenty of room for you there. Poor Toby clanked sadly away. I must hurry. I must hurry, he panted. But hurrying used a lot of water, and his tanks were soon empty. They damped down his fire and struggled on, but he soon ran out of steam and stood marooned on the main line, far away from the next station. The farman walked back. He put detonators on the line to warn James and his driver. Then he hurried along the sleepers. I'll tell that signalman something, he said grimly. James was fuming when Toby's farman arrived and explained what had happened. 
My fault, said the single man. I didn't understand about Toby. No, James, said his driver. You all have to push him. What? Me? snorted James. Me? Push Toby? And pull my train? Yes, you. Shan't. The driver, the fireman, the passengers and the guard all said he was a bad engine. All right, all right, grumbled James. He came up behind Toby and gave him a bump. Get on, you, he said crossly. James's driver made him push Toby all the way back to the works. It serves you right for being cross, he said. James had to work very hard, and when he reached the workstation, he felt exhausted. Some little boys ran along the platform. Coo, said one. The express is late. A double header, too. Do you know what I think? I think, he went on, that James couldn't pull the train, so Toby had to help him. Coo, said James and disappeared in a cloud of steam. The Fat Controller's Engines One evening, Thomas brought his last train to the junction. He went for a drink. I'm going to the big station, he said to Percy and Toby. So are we, they answered. Do you know, Percy went on, I think something's up. Toby looked at the sky. Where? Down here, silly, laughed Thomas. How, asked Toby reasonably, can something be up when it's down? Look, said Thomas excitedly, look! Seven engines from the other railway were coming along the line. Hello, Ginty, whistled Percy. Hello, Pug. They're friends of mine, he explained. I don't know the others. Ginty and Pug whistled cheerfully as they puffed through the station. What is all this? asked Thomas. The fat controller's got a plan, answered his driver, and he's going to tell it to us. Come on. So they followed to the big station at the end of the line, where all the engines had gone. The fat controller was waiting for them there. The people of England, he said, read about us in the books, but they do not think that we are real. Shame, squeaked Percy. The fat controller glared. Percy subsided. So, he continued, I am taking my engines to England to show them. Hooray, 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 the engines whistled. The fat controller held his ears. Silence, he bellowed. We start the day after tomorrow at 8 a.m. Meanwhile, as these engines have kindly come from the other railway to take your place, you will show them your work tomorrow. Next day, as Annie and Clarabel were going to England too, Thomas and Ginty practised with some other coaches. Thomas was excited. He began boasting about his race with Bertie. I whooshed through the tunnel and stopped an inch from the buffers, like this. Crash! The buffers broke. No one was hurt, but Thomas's front was badly bent. They telephoned the fat controller. I'll send up some men, he said, but if they can't mend Thomas in time, We'll go to England without him. Next morning, the engines waited at the junction. Toby and Percy were each on a truck, and Duck had pushed them into place behind Edward. Henrietta stood on a siding. The fat controller had called her a curiosity. I wouldn't dream of leaving you behind, he said. I'll fit you up as my private coach. She felt very grand. Gordon, James and Henry were in front. They whistled impatiently. 
the Fat Controller paced the platform. He looked at his watch. One minute more, he said, turning to the guard. Peep, 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 whistled Thomas and panted into the station. Annie and Clarabel twittered anxiously. We hope we're not late. It isn't quite eight. Thomas, said the Fat Controller sternly, I am most displeased with you. You nearly upset my arrangements. Thomas, abashed, arranged himself in the coaches behind Duck without saying a word. The Fat Controller climbed into Henrietta. The guard blew his whistle and waved his flag. The engines whistled, Look out, England! Here we come! And the cavalcade puffed off. The engines stood side by side in a big airy shed. Hundreds of people came to see them and climbed in and out of their cabs every day. They liked it at first, but presently felt very bored and were glad when it was time to go. The people along their line put the flags out and cheered them home. We are glad to see you, they said. Those others did their best, but they don't know our ways. Nothing anywhere can compare with our fat controller's engines. the engines. Duck's driver let some of them ride in his cab. No, the Railway Society, his driver explained. They've come to see us. Their engine, City of Truro. He was the first to go 100 miles an hour. Let's get finished, then we can go and talk to him. Oh, said Duck, awed. He's too famous to notice me. Rubbish, smiled his driver. Come on. Duck found City of Truro at the coaling stage. May I talk to you? he asked shyly. Of course, smiled the famous engine. I see you are one of us. I try to teach them our ways, said Duck modestly. All shipshape and swindon fashion, that's right. Please, could you tell me how you beat the Southwestern? So, City of Truro told Duck all about his famous run from Plymouth to Bristol more than fifty years ago. They were soon firm friends and talked Great Western till late at night. City of Truro left early next morning. Good riddance, grumbled Gordon, chattering all night, keeping important engines awake. Who is he, anyway? He's City of Truro. He's famous. As famous as me? Nonsense. He's famouser than you. He went a hundred miles an hour before you were drawn or thought of. So he says. But I didn't like his looks. He's got no dome, said Gordon darkly. Never trust domeless engines. They're not respectable. I never boast, Gordon continued modestly. But a hundred miles an hour will be easy for me. Goodbye. Presently, Duck took some trucks to Edwards Station. He was cross, and it was lucky for those trucks that they tried no tricks. Hello, called Edward. The famous city of Truro came through this morning. He whistled to me. Wasn't he kind? He's the finest engine in the world, said Duck. And he told Edward about the city of Truro and what Gordon had said. Don't take any notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. 
He thinks no engine should be famous but him. Look, he's coming now. Gordon's boiler seemed to have swollen larger than ever. He was running very fast. He swayed up and down and from side to side as his wheels pounded the rails. He did it, I'll do it. He did it, I'll do it, he panted. His train rocketed past and was gone. Edward chuckled and winked at Duck. Gordon's trying to do a city of Truro, he said. Duck was still cross. I should think he'll knock himself to bits, he snorted. I heard something rattle as he went through. Gordon's driver eased him off. Steady boy, he said. We aren't running a race. We are then, said Gordon. But he said it to himself. I've never known him ride so roughly before, remarked his driver. His fireman grabbed the brake handle to steady himself. He's given himself a hammering, and no mistake. Soon Gordon began to feel a little queer. The top of my boiler seems funny, he thought. It's just as if something was loose. I'd better go slower. But by then, it was too late. They met the wind on the viaduct. It wasn't just a gentle wind, nor was it a hard, steady wind. It was a teasing wind which blew suddenly in hard puffs and caught you unawares. Gordon thought it wanted to push him off the bridge. No, you don't, he said firmly. But the wind had other ideas. It curled round his boiler, crept under his loose dome, and lifted it off and away into the valley below. It fell on the rocks with a clang. Gordon was most uncomfortable. He felt cold where his dome wasn't. Besides, people laughed at him as he passed. At the big station, he tried to them away, but they crowded round no matter what he did. On the way back, he wanted his driver to stop and find his dome. It was very cross when he wouldn't. He hoped the shed would be empty, but all the engines were there waiting. Never trust domeless engines, said a voice. They aren't respectable. Pop goes the diesel. of Truro's visit made Duck very proud of being Great Western. He talked endlessly about it, but he worked hard too and made everything go like clockwork. The trucks behaved well, the coaches were ready on time, and the passengers even stopped grumbling. But the engines didn't like having to bustle about. There are two ways of doing things, Duck told them. The Great Western way or the wrong way. I'm Great Western and don't we know it, they groaned. They were glad when a visitor came. The visitor purred smoothly towards them. The fat controller climbed down. Here yeah, is Diesel, he said. I have agreed to give him a trial. He needs to learn. Please teach him, duck. Good morning, purred Diesel in an oily voice. Pleased to meet you, duck. Is that James and Henry? And Gordon, too, I am delighted to meet such famous engines. And he purred towards them. The silly engines were flattered. He has very good manners, they murmured. Oh, we are, we are pleased to have him in our yard. Duck had his doubts. Come on, he said shortly. Oh, yes, said Diesel. The yard, of course. Excuse me, engines. And he purred after Duck, talking hard. You're worthy, fat Sir Topham Hat, to you ordered Duck. Diesel looked hurt. You're worthy, Sir Topham Hat. Thinks I need to learn. He is mistaken. We Diesels don't need to learn. We know everything. We come to a yard and improve it. We are a revolutionary. Oh, said Duck. If you're a revel thing of me, perhaps you could collect my trucks while I fetch Gordon's coaches. Diesel, delighted to show off, purred away. 
With much banging and clashing, he collected a row of trucks. Duck left Gordon's coaches in the station and came back. Diesel was now trying to take some trucks from a siding nearby. They were old and empty. Clearly they had not been touched for a long time. Their brakes would not come off properly. Diesel found them hard to move. Pull, push, backwards, forwards. Oh, we... Oh, ah! Oh, the trucks groaned. We can't! We won't! Duck watched the operation with interest. Diesel lost patience. He roared and gave a great heave. The trucks jerked forward. Oh, oh, they screamed. We can't. We won't. Some of their brakes broke, and the gear hanging down bumped on the rails and sleepers. We can't. We won't. Their trailing brakes caught in the points and locked themselves solid. Roared Diesel. A rusty coupling broke and he shot forward suddenly by himself. Ho, ho, ho! Truckled Duck. Diesel recovered and tried to push the trucks back. But they wouldn't move and he had to give up. Duck ran quietly round to where the other trucks all stood in line. Thank you for arranging these, Diesel, he said. I must go now. Don't you want this lot? No, thank you. Diesel gulped. And I've, t I've taken all this trouble, he almost shrieked. Why didn't you tell me? You never asked me. Besides, said Duck innocently, you were having such fun being revel, whatever it was you said. Goodbye. Diesel had to help the workmen clear the mess. He hated it. All the trucks and coaches were laughing. Presently he heard them singing. Their song grew louder and louder and soon it echoed through the yard. Trucks are waiting in the yard, tackling them with ease, all show the world what I can do, gaily boasts the diesel, in and out he creeps about, like a big black weasel, when he pulls the wrong trucks out, pop goes the diesel. Ah! He growled and scuttling away, sunked in the shed. <laughs> Dirty work. When Duck returned and heard the truck singing, he was horrified. Shut up, he ordered, and bumped them hard. I'm sorry our trucks were rude to you, Diesel, he said. Diesel was still furious. It's all your fault. You made them laugh at me, he complained. Nonsense, said Henry. Duck would never do that. We engines have our differences, but we never talk about them to trucks. That would be dis, 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 dis. Disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, put in James. Despicable, finished Henry. Diesel hated Duck. He wanted him to be sent away. So he made a plan. Next day he spoke to the trucks. I see you like jokes, he said in his oily voice. You made a good joke about me yesterday. I laughed and laughed. Ha <laughs> ha! Duck told me one about Gordon. I'll whisper it. Don't tell Gordon I told you. And he sniggered away. Ho, 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 guffawed the trucks. Gordon will be cross with Duck when he knows. Let's tell him and pay Duck out for bumping us. Diesel went to all the sidings, and in each he told different stories. He said Duck had told them to him. This was untrue, but the trucks didn't know. They laughed rudely at the engines as they went by, and soon Gordon, Henry and James found out why. Disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, said James. Despicable, said Henry. We cannot allow it. 
They consulted together. Yes, they said. He did it to us. We'll do it to him. And see how he likes it. Duck was tired out. The trucks had been cheeky and troublesome. He had had hard work to make them behave. He wanted a rest in the shed. <sighs> Keep out! The three engines barred his way, and Diesel lurked behind. Stop fooling, said Duck. I'm tired. So are we, hissed the engines. We are tired of you. We like Diesel. We don't like you. You tell tales about us to trucks. I don't. You do. I don't. You do. The fat controller came to stop the noise. Duck called me a galloping sausage, spluttered Gordon. Rusty red scrap iron, hissed James. I'm old square wheels, fumed Henry. Well, Duck? Duck considered. I only wish, sir, he said gravely, that I'd thought of those names myself. If the dome fits. <laughs> the fat controller coughed. He made trucks laugh at us, accused the engines. The fat controller recovered. Did you, Duck? Certainly not, sir. No steam engine would be as mean as that. Now, Diesel, you heard what Duck said. They can't understand it, sir. To think the Duck of all engines, I'm dreadfully grieved, sir, but no, nothing. I see. Diesel squirmed and hoped he didn't. I am sorry, Duck, the fat controller went on, but you must go to Edward's station for a while. I know he will be glad to see you. Beg pardon, sir, do you mean now? Yes, please. As you wish, sir. Duck trundled sadly away, while Diesel smirked with triumph in the darkness. <laughs> Close shave. So Duck came to Edward Station. It's not fair, he complained. Diesel has made the fat controller and all the engines think I'm horrid. Edward smiled. Oh, I know you aren't, he said. And so does the fat controller. You wait and see. Duck felt happier with Edward. He helped him with his trucks and coaches, and sometimes helped foreign engines by pushing their trains up the hill. But Gordon, Henry and James never spoke to him at all. One day, he pushed behind a goods train and helped it to the top. Beep, beep, goodbye, he called, and rolled gently over the crossing to the other line. Duck loved coasting down the hill, running easily with the wind whistling past, he hummed a little tune. That sounds like a guard's whistle, he thought. But we haven't a guard. His driver heard it too and looked back. Hurry, duck, hurry, he called urgently. There's been a breakaway. Some trucks are chasing us. There were twenty heavily loaded trucks. Hoorah, 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 they laughed. We've broken away! We've broken away! We've broken away! And before the signalman could change the points, they followed Duck onto the down line. Trace him! Bump him! Throw him off the rails! They yelled, and hurtled after Duck, bumping and swaying with ever-increasing speed. The guard saved Duck. Though the trucks had knocked him off his van, he got up and ran behind, blowing his whistle to attract the driver's attention. Now what? asked the fireman. As fast as we can, said the driver grimly. Then they'll catch us gradually. They raced through Edward Station, whistling furiously. But the trucks caught them with a shuddering jar. The farmer climbed back, and the van brakes came on with a scream. Braking carefully, the driver was gaining control. Another clear mile, and we'll do it, he said. They swept round a bend. Oh, glory! Look at that! 
A passenger train was just pulling out on their line from the station ahead. The driver leapt to his reverser, hard over, full steam, whistle. It's up to you now, Duck, he said. Duck put every ounce of weight and steam against the trucks. They felt his strength. On, on, they yelled, but Duck was holding them now. I must stop them. I must. The station came nearer and nearer. The last coach cleared the platform. It's too late. Duck groaned and shut his eyes. He felt a sudden swerve and slid, shuddering and groaning, along a siding. A barber had set up shop in a wooden shed in the yard. He was shaving a customer. There was a sliding, groaning crash, and part of the wall caved in. The customer jumped nervously, but the barber held him down. It's only an engine, he said calmly, and went on lathering. Beg pardon, sir, gasped Duck. Eh, excuse my intrusion. No, I won't, said the barber crossly. You've threatened my customers and spoilt my new paint. I'll teach you. And he lathered Duck's face all over. Poor Duck. They were pulling the trucks away when the fat controller arrived. The barber was telling the workman what he thought. I do not like engines popping through my walls, he fumed. They disturb my customers. I appreciate your feelings, said the fat controller. I will gladly repair the damage. But you must know that this engine and his crew have prevented a serious accident. You and many others might have been badly hurt. The fat controller paused impressively. It was a very close shave, he said. Oh, said the barber. Oh, excuse me. He ran into his shop, fetched a basin of water, and washed Duck's face. I'm sorry, Duck, he said. I didn't know you were being a brave engine. That's all right, sir, said Duck. I didn't know that either. You are very brave indeed, said the fat controller kindly. I'm proud of you. I shall tell City of Truro about you next time he comes. Oh, sir. Duck felt happier than he had been for weeks. And now, said the fat controller, when you are mended, you are coming home. Home, sir? Do you mean the yard? Of course. But, sir, they don't like me. They like Diesel. Not now, the fat controller smiled. I never believed Diesel. After you went, he told lies about Henry. So I sent him packing. The engines are sorry and want you back. So, when a few days later, he came home shining with new paint, there was a really rousing welcome for Duck, the great western engine. <laughs> Sir Handel and Peter Sam had hard work while Scar Lowy was away. The owner gave them buffers and even bought a diesel named Rusty. But Sir Handel grumbled continually. One day, Gordon saw him shunting and laughed. Ha ha! My controller makes me shunt, Sir Handel said sheepishly. And take trucks to quarries too. I'm highly sprung and I suffered dreadfully. Our controllers don't understand our feelings, sympathized Gordon. Now, if you were ill, he winked, you couldn't go, could you? Good idea, said Sir Handel. I'll try it. I don't feel well, he groaned next morning. There wasn't time to examine him then, so some of the trucks were coupled behind Peter Sam's coaches, and Rusty promised to follow with the rest. <laughs> sniggered Sir Handel, but no one noticed. They were all too busy. P. 
Peter Sam didn't mind the extra work. He left his coaches at the top station and trundled cheerfully through the woods. The trucks chattered behind him in an agitated way, but he paid no attention. It might have been better if he had. Slates come from quarries high up in the hills. They travel down in trucks on a steep railway called an incline. Empty trucks at the bottom are hitched to a rope. Loaded ones at the top are hitched to one another. By their weight, loaded trucks run down the incline, pulling up empty ones. There are strong brakes in the winding house at the top to prevent loaded trucks from running down too fast. The ropes are very strong too, but in spite of this, trucks sometimes play dangerous tricks. Peter Sam never bumped trucks unless they misbehaved. Sir Handel bumped them even if they were good, so they didn't like him and played tricks whenever they could. Peter Sam pushed the empty trucks to a siding where his farmer hitched them to a rope. Then on another siding, he pulled back some loaded trucks. With these in front of him, he stood waiting. More loaded trucks stood at the top of the incline, ready to come down. They couldn't see Peter Sam. They thought he was Sir Handel and wanted to pay him out. They began to move. Faster, faster, they grumbled. They reached halfway, gathering speed. Scrag him, scrag him, they yelled. No, no, wailed the empty trucks. It's Peter Sam, it's Peter Sam. But it was no use. The loaded trucks were straining at the rope. They broke it with a crack. Hoorah, hoorah, they roared, hurtling down the hill. Peter Sam heard them. He shut his eyes. His driver and farmer crouched in his cab. The crash jerked him violently backwards. Ouch, he shivered. I didn't expect a cold bath. The water poured from a channel smashed by flying slates. He was soaked from funnel to cab. Click. He spluttered and was glad when he heard Rusty's answering toot. Bust my buffers, exclaimed Rusty. What a mess. Never mind, Peter Sam. We'll get you out. He soon pulled him away from the water and the trucks. Peter Sam felt battered. His funnel was cracked and his boiler dented. But he was glad his driver and farmer were unhurt. He thanked Rusty and limped slowly home. Rusty stayed to help clear the wreckage. I'm sorry about your accident, Peter Sam, said Sir Handel. I always stand well back. Trucks don't like me, you see. Why didn't you warn me? I didn't think. You never do, said a stern voice. You can start now, while you're doing Peter Sam's work as well as your own. That'll teach you to pretend you are ill. Sir Handel did start thinking. He thought about thin controllers, and he thought about Gordon. He wanted to give Gordon a piece of his mind. Home at last. Peter Sam wanted to start work, but the thin controller wouldn't let him. Another day's rest will do you good, he said. Besides, I've got a surprise for you. For me, sir? How nice, sir. What is it, sir? Wait and see, smiled the thin controller. The surprise was Scarlowy. Oh, said Peter Sam. I am glad you've come home. They lit Scarlowy's fire, and he sizzled happily. I feel all excited, he said. Just like a young engine. I'm longing to pull my dear old coaches again. Are they running nicely? Yes, they're running well, Peter Sam answered. But we have five other coaches now. Scarlow, was interested. Oh, he said. Tell me about them. Cora is a guard's van. 
She isn't as big as Beatrice, and she hasn't a ticket window, but I like her best. She was my guards van in the old days. Ada, Jane and Mabel are plain. They have no roofs. Sir Handel says they are trucks. But they have seats, said Peter Sam. So I say they're coaches. What do you think, Scarloey? The old engine smiled. If they have seats, they're coaches, he said firmly. Sir Handel likes Gertrude and Millicent best, Peter Sam went on. He always tries to take them alone. They have bogies. And he says they're the only real coaches we have. They remind him of when he used to pull our express. Both have seats for passengers, but Millicent has a guard as well. He sells tickets and travels in a tiny cupboard place. I don't like that, he remarked earnestly. Guards are very important. They need vans. They shouldn't be put into cupboards. Scarlow said nothing, so Peter Sam continued. Did Rusty help you off your truck? Yes. He says he's come to mend the line and do odd jobs. I like him, smiled Scarlowey. So do I. Peter Sam explained how kind Rusty was when he had his accident. It's a pity Duncan doesn't like him. Who is Duncan? He came as a spare engine after my accident. Is he useful? He'll pull anything. Well, I'm sure he means well, but he's bouncy and rude. He used to work in a factory, and his language is often strong. I understand, said Scarloey gravely. Just then the telephone rang, and Scarloey's driver and farman climbed into his cab. Come on, old boy, they said. Duncan is stuck in the tunnel, and we'll have to get him out. Scarloey was pleased. He wanted to run, and looked forward to meeting Duncan. They found Cora and some workmen, and hurried up the line. How nice and smooth the rails are, thought Scarloey. They've mended all the old bumps. Rusty has helped to do that. I must tell him how nice it is. Duncan had stuck at the far end of the tunnel. His coaches were outside, and the passengers were helping the driver and farman to dislodge some rocks wedged between the top of his cab and the tunnel roof. Duncan was cross. I have a plain, blunt engine, he kept saying. A speaker's a find... Tunnels shall be tunnels and not rabbit holes. This railway is no good at all. Don't be silly, snapped his driver. This tunnel is quite big enough for engines who don't want to rock and roll. They cleared away the rocks, and Scarloey pulled Duncan and his coaches safely through. Cora was left on a siding, and the workman stayed to make sure all was safe. Duncan grumbled all the way home, but Scarloey paid no attention. The thin controller was waiting for them. Listen to me, Duncan, he said. There is nothing wrong with that tunnel. You stuck because you tried to do rock and roll. If it happens again, I'll cut down your cab. And your funnel, too. Duncan, abashed, was neither plain nor blunt for a whole evening. <laughs> Rock and roll. When Scarlery's turn came, he was glad to take out the coaches and meet old friends. He met Rusty up the line. You know, he said, if I couldn't see the old places, I'd think I was on a different railway. Rusty laughed. Well, we hoped you would. Mr. Hugh, our foreman, said, Rusty, Scarloey's coming home. Let's mend the track so well that he doesn't know where he is. And we did. And you didn't, if you take my meaning. Scarloey chuckled away. He liked this hard-working, friendly little engine. There's still one bad bit, said Rusty anxiously that evening. It's just before the first station. We hadn't time. Never mind, said Scarloey. It's much better now than it was. Maybe better, but it's not good. 
replied Grusty. An engine might come off there. Peter Sam and Sir Hand will take care, and so do you. But I'm worried about Duncan. He will do rock and roll. I shouldn't like his passengers hurt. What's that about me? I'm a plain engine, and believe in plain speaking. Speak up and stop whispering in corners. Rusty told Duncan about the bad bit of line, and warned him to be careful. Ha! Ha! He grunted. I know my way about. Thank you. I don't need smelly diesels to tell me what to do. Rusty looked hurt. Never mind, said Scarlowy. You've done your best. He said no more, but he thought a great deal. Next morning, Rusty left Duncan to find his own coaches. Duncan snorted and banged about the yard, then clattered crossly to the station. James was there already. You're late, he snapped. I know, said Duncan. It's that smelly diesel's fault. He thinks he can teach me how to stay on the rails, and then goes off and leaves me to find my own coaches. You poor engine, sympathised James. I know all about diesels. One crept into our yard and ordered us about. I soon sent him packing. Duncan gazed at him admiringly. He didn't know that James was boastful, and sometimes didn't tell the truth. Send him packing! Send him packing! Snorted Duncan. He climbed the first hill furiously. Well done, boy. Keep it up, encouraged his driver. They were soon near the first station. Duncan was pleased. Nothing's happened. Nothing's happened, he chortled. Silly old diesel. Clever me. And he swaggered along, doing his rock and roll. Steady, boy. His driver tried to check him. But too late. There was a tearing, cracking, crunching sound, and Duncan stopped bumpily. Sleepers and ballast, he exclaimed. I'm off. And he was. I warned him, said Rusty crossly. Duncan, I said, you be careful on that bit of line. But all he did was to call me names. Mr. Hugh kept turning Rusty's handle. Come on, he urged. Start up. No, Mr. Hugh, sir, I'm sorry to disoblige, but I won't help that, Duncan. I'm ashamed of you, Rusty, said Scarlowy severely. Think of the passengers. What are they going to do? Oh, said Rusty, I've forgotten them. I'm sorry, Mr. Hugh, sir, we must help the passengers. And his engine roared into life. Oh, dear, thought Duncan. Now everyone will know how silly I am. Presently, Mr. Hugh and Rusty brought sleepers and old rails. Mr. Hugh showed the passengers how to use them, and they soon levered Duncan back to the line. Duncan was extra careful all day. Rusty, he whispered that night, thank you for helping. I'm sorry I was rude. That's all right. I wish all diesels were like you. Let's be friends. Suits me smiled Rusty. We'll mend that bad bit first thing tomorrow. Little old twins. One day, the owner brought some people to see the railway. He showed them everything. They travelled in the trains and looked at stations and bridges and coaches. Yes, they would say thoughtfully, we'll take this. Or, no, we won't take that. They made notes in their books. Peter Sam whispered to Sir Handel. Men came and did that on our old line. And then, said Sir Handel, soon afterwards, it was, it was sold 
finished Peter Sam mournfully. Peter Sam didn't sing any more. He wanted to cry. The other engines were sad too. What's the matter with you all? His driver asked him one day. You look like dying ducks. We don't want to be sold, said Peter Sam miserably. Sold? The driver was surprised. Who to? To those people who came and talked about taking things. You silly little engine, laughed his driver. They're not going to buy us. They're going to take our pictures on television. And he tried to explain what that meant. Not going to be sold, not going to be sold, sang Peter Sam. He could hardly wait to tell the others. He told them about the television as well. And they were pleased and excited too. All except Sir Handel. I don't hold with it, he grumbled. Vulgar, I call it. Fancy traipsing about making an exhibition of yourselves. I won't do it, I tell you. Tell you something indeed. Just let the thing controller come here. I'll tell him something. Scarlowey said nothing. He just winked at Peter Sam. But next day, when the thin controller did come to explain about the television, Sir Handel kept strangely quiet. Now, said the thin controller at last, I want every engine to take part. I, <coughs> I, did, I, I, do, I, don't, I don't feel well, quavered Sir Handel. You poor engine, said the thin controller gravely. You can stay in the shed. Sir Handel smiled broadly. And your driver and farmer shall take you to pieces. That will make a very interesting picture. Just what we need. Sir Handel's feelings were beyond words. That's that, said the thing controller. Now, Scarlowey, will you take Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima and Beatrice? Yes, please, sir. Oh, I was hoping you would let me have them. Duncan shall have a good train, while Rusty, with Mr. Hugh and the men, can show how we mend the line. Please, sir, w uh, what about me, sir? asked Peter Sam anxiously. The thin controller smiled. You, Peter Sam, shall pull the special television train. Oh, sir! Oh, sir! bubbled Peter Sam in ecstasy. The television men built towers for cameras beside the line. They put cameras on Ada, too, and filled Gertrude with wires and instruments. Some trucks coupled behind carried aerials and generators. Everyone practised hard till they knew just what they had to do. At last the time came, and the announcer gave the signal. We're on the air! We're on the air! puffed Peter Sam, and he rolled the heavy train to the shops, where Sir Handel was being mended. Sir Handel did not enjoy their visit. We're on the air! We're on the air! chanted Peter Sam. He trundled over the bridge near the middle station. Peep, peep, he whistled to Duncan. We're coming! The announcer talked to Duncan, and then they puffed over the second bridge to Quarry Siding, where Rusty, Mr. Hugh and the men were waiting to explain about their work. Soon they had to go. Peter Sam whistled, Rusty tooted in reply, and they clattered through the tunnel, rumbled over the viaduct near the waterfall, and rolled at last into the top station. The owner climbed down. We arranged for television, he said, to let everyone see our little old engine. We are proud of him. Ninety-five years old and good as new. There's nothing like him anywhere. Three cheers for Scarlowey. Peep, 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 whistled Peter Sam, and everybody joined in. Scarlowey smiled. I'm very glad to be home again. Thank you, sir, and all, for your nice surprise. Now I'll surprise you. Listen, when I was mended in England, I found my twin. The owner stared. Is there really another engine like you? Yes, sir, chuckled Scarlowey. There is. Another engine came to be mended, too, called Tally Slynn. When the workmen saw us together, they laughed and called us their little old twins. Tally Flynn told me about his railway. It is a lovely one, at Towin in Wales. Well, sir, they mended us both and sent us home. But I often think of Tally Flynn. 
He's 95 years old, too, just like me. Please go to see him, all of you, and wish him dry rails and good running from Scarlowy, his little old twin. Hello, twins. More and more people travelled on the Fat Controllers Railway. More and more ships came to the harbours. Everyone had to work very hard indeed. The trucks complained bitterly. But then trucks always do, and no one takes much notice. The coaches complained too. No sooner had they arrived with one train, then he had to go out again with fresh passengers as another. We don't know whether they're coming or going, they protested. We feel quite distracted. No one can say, grumbled Henry, that we're afraid of hard work, but we draw the line at goods trains, finished Gordon. Dirty trucks, dirty sidings, ugh, put in James. What are you boiler aching about? asked Duck. I remember on the Great Western, that tin pot railway... Tin pot indeed. Let me tell you. Silence, ordered a well-known voice. Let me tell you that an engine for goods work will arrive from Scotland tomorrow. The news was received with acclamation. <coughs> the fat controller stared. Did you say two engines, Inspector? Yes, sir. Then send the other back at once. Certainly, sir. But which? The fat controller stared again. Engines have numbers, Inspector? He explained patiently. We bought number 57646. Send the other one back. Quite so, sir. But there is a difficulty. What do you mean? The two engines are exactly alike, sir, and have no numbers. They say they lost them on the way. The fat controller seized his hat. We'll soon settle that nonsense, he said grimly. The two engines greeted him cheerfully. I hear you've lost your numbers, he said. How did that happen? The mourner slowly slip it off, sir. You can know it is. The engines spoke in chorus. I know. Accidentally on purpose. The twins looked pained. Sir! You wouldn't be thinking we lost them on purpose. I'm not so sure, said the fat controller. Now then, which of you is 57646? Oh, that, sir, uh, is just what we can of mind. The fat controller looked at their solemn faces. He turned away. He seemed to have difficulty with his own. He swung round again. What are your names? Donald and Dougie, sir. Good, he said. Then your controller can tell me which of you is which. Well, he, he'll get no muckle help for him, sir. Why? He didn't kin our names, sir. How could he? We only given ourselves names when we lost our numbers. One of you, said the fat controller, is playing truant. I shall find him out and send him home. Inspector, he ordered, give these engines numbers and set them to work. He walked sternly away. Missing coach. Soon workmen came to give the twins their numbers. 
Donald was nine and Douglas ten. When the men went away, they were left alone in the shed. You may have noticed, Dougie, that yon painters forgot something. What did they forget? They painted broad new numbers on our tenders, but they put none on us. Donald winked broadly at his twin. Do you mean, grinned Douglas, that we can... Just that, chuckled Donald. Who'd you wish? Here's the inspector. No, nine and ten, smiled the inspector. Here's Duck. He'll show you round before you start work. The twins enjoyed themselves and were soon friends with Duck. They didn't mind what they did. They tackled goods trains and coaches easily. For once the twins had shunted them, trucks knew better than to try any tricks. We like it fine here, said Donald. That's good, smiled Duck. But take my tip. Watch out for Gordon, Henry and James. They're sure to try some nonsense. Get a fuss yourself, chuckled Douglas. We'll soon settle them. Donald and Douglas had deep-toned whistles. They sound like buses, said Gordon. Or ships, sniggered Henry. Tugboat Annie, laughed Gordon. Ha, ha, ha. Donald and Douglas cruised quietly up, one on each side. You wouldn't have been making fun of us, would you now? asked Donald. Gordon and Henry jumped. They glanced nervously from side to side. Uh, no, said Gordon. No, 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 certainly not, said Henry. That's fine, said Douglas. No, just mind the both of you, and keep it that way. That was the way Gordon and Henry kept it. Every day, punctually at 3.30, Gordon steams in with the express. It is called the Wild Nor'wester, and is full of people from England, Wales and Scotland. There is also a special coach for passengers travelling to places on Thomas's branch line. When the other coaches are taken away empty, engines have to remember to shunt the special coach to the bay platform. It doesn't wait there long. Thomas, with Annie and Clarabel, comes hurrying from the junction to fetch it. Thomas is very proud of his special coach. One afternoon, Douglas helped duck in the yard, while Donald waited to take a good strain to the other end of the line. As Duck was busy arranging Donald's trucks, Douglas offered to take away Gordon's coaches. Douglas was enjoying himself, when an awful thought struck him. I hope the fat controller doesn't have find out I shouldn't have been here. I couldn't abide going back. He worried so much over this that he forgot about Thomas's special coach. He pushed it with the others into the carriage siding then ambled along to join Donald at the water column. As he went, Thomas scampered by, whistling cheerfully. Soon Thomas came fussing. Where's my coach? Coach? asked Donald. What coach? My special coach that Gordon brings for me. It's gone. I must find it. He bustled away. Lost sick, said Douglas. I more stowed the special coach with the others. Do you see that? exclaimed Donald's driver. A mob of angry passengers erupted from the siding. They're complaining to the fat controller. He'll be coming here next. Now listen, said Douglas's driver. We'll change tenders. Then I'll wire with ye, Donald, and take yon goods. Then I'll flash about us. Quick now, do as I say. The fat controller and three passengers walked towards them. But Donald, with Douglas's tender, number ten, was out and away with the goods before they came near. Douglas and his driver waited with innocent expressions. Ah, said the fat controller, number nine. And why have you not taken the goods? May a tender is a wire, sir. The driver showed him the tender, still uncoupled. I see. Some defect, no doubt. Tell me, why did number ten leave so quickly? Maybe, sir, put in Douglas. He saw you coming and thought he was late. Hmm. Ah said the Fat Controller. He turned to the passengers. Here, gentlemen, are the facts. Number ten has been shunting the yard. Your coach disappeared. We investigate. Number ten, um, disappears too. You, you can draw your conclusions. Please accept my apologies. The matter will be investigated. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The Fat Controller watched them till they climbed the station ramp. His shoulders twitched. He wiped his eyes. Douglas wondered if he was crying. He wasn't. 
He swung round suddenly. Douglas, he rapped. Why are you masquerading with Donald's tender? <laughs> Break van. The Fat Controller scolded both engines severely. There must be no more tricks, he said. I shall be watching you both. I have to decide which of you is to stay. He strode away. The twins looked glum. Neither wanted to stay without the other. They said so. Then what's to do? wondered Douglas. Och, said Donald, each mon be as good as the other. Then he'll have to keep us both. Their plan was good, but they'd reckoned without a spiteful brake van. The van had taken a dislike to Douglas. Things always went wrong when he had to take it out. Then his trains were late, and he was blamed. Douglas began to worry. You're a muckle nuisance, said Donald one day. It's to leave ye behind I'd be wanting. You can't, said the van. I'm essential. Och, are ye? Donald burst out. You're nothing but a screeching and a noise when all's said and done. Spite Dougie, would ye? Take that! Oh, oh, oh! cried the van. Who do you wish? said Donald severely. There's more coming if you misbehave. The van behaved better after that. Douglas's trains were punctual, and the twins felt happier. Then Donald had an accident. He backed into a siding. The rails were slippery. He couldn't stop in time, and crashed through the buffers into a signal box. One moment, the signalman was standing on the stairs. The next... He was sitting on the coal in Donald's tender. He was most annoyed. You clumsy great engine, he stormed. Now you must stay there. You've jammed my points. It served you right for spoiling my nice new signal box. The fat controller was cross too. I am disappointed, Donald, he said. I did not expect such, such clumsiness from you. I have decided to send Douglas back and keep you. I'm sorry, sir. But Donald didn't say what he was sorry for. We know, don't we? I should think so, too, went on the fat controller indignantly. You have upset my arrangements. This is most inconvenient. Now James will have to help with the goods work while you have your tender mended. James won't like that. The fat controller was right. James grumbled dreadfully. Anyone would think, said Douglas, that Donald had his accident on purpose. I hear tell, he went on, about an engine and some tar wagons. Gordon and Henry chuckled. Shut up, said James. It's not funny. Well, 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 said Douglas innocently. Surely, James, it wasn't a ye. He didn't say. James didn't say. He was sulky next morning and wouldn't steam properly. When at last he did start, he bumped the trucks hard. He's cross, <laughs> sniggered the spiteful brake van. We'll try to make him crosser still. Hold back, whispered the van to the trucks. Hold back, giggled the trucks to each other. James did his best, but he was exhausted when they reached Edwards Station. Luckily, Douglas was there. Help me up the hill, please, panted James. These trucks are playing tricks. We'll show them, said Douglas grimly. Come on, come on, come on, puffed James crossly. Get moving, you, get moving, you, puffed Douglas from behind. Slowly but surely, the snorting engines forced the unwilling trucks up the hill. But James was losing steam. I can't do it. I can't.
can't do it, he panted. Leave it to me, leave it to me, shouted Douglas. He pushed and he puffed so furiously that sparks leapt from his funnel. Oh, uh, groaned the van. I wish I'd never thought of this. It was squeezed between Douglas and the trucks. Go on, go on, it screamed. But they took no notice. The guard was anxious. Go steady, he yelled to Douglas. The van's breaking. It was too late. The guard jumped as the van collapsed. He landed safely on the side of the line. I might have known it would be Douglas. I'm sorry, sir. Maybe I was clumsy, but I wouldn't have been beaten by yon tricksy van. I see, said the fat controller. Edward brought workmen to clear the mess. Douglas was grand, sir, he said. James had no steam left, but Douglas worked hard enough for three. I heard him from my yard. Two would have been enough, said the fat controller dryly. I want to be fair, Douglas, he went on. I admire your determination, but I don't know. I really don't know. He turned and walked thoughtfully away. The Deputation He'll send us a war for sure, Donald. I'm thinking you're right there, Dougie. The luck side being against us. An engine done a ken what to do for the best. Snow came early that year. It was heavier than usual. It stayed, too, and choked the lines. Most engines hate snow. Donald and Douglas were used to it. They knew what to do. Their drivers spoke to the inspector, and they were soon coupled back to back with a van between their tenders. Then, each with a snow plow on their fronts, they set to work. They puffed busily backwards and forwards, patrolling the line. Generally, the snow slipped away easily. But sometimes they found deeper drifts. Then they would charge them again and again, snorting, slipping, puffing, panting, till they had forced their way through. Presently they came to a drift which was larger than most. They charged it and were backing for another try. There was a feeble whistle. People waved and shouted. Lost six, Donald! It's Henry! Do not fash yourself, Henry! By the wee! We'll have you out! Controller was returning soon. The twins were glum. He'll send us back for sure, they said. It's a shame, sympathised Percy. A lot of nonsense about a signal box, grumbled Gordon. Too many of those, if you ask me. That brake van, too, put in James. Good riddance, that's what I say. They were splendid in the snow, added Henry. It isn't fair. They all agreed that something must be done. But none knew what. One day, Percy talked to Edward about it. What you need, said Edward, is a deputation. He explained what that was. Percy ran back quickly. Edward says we need a depot station, he told the others. Of course, said Gordon. The question is, what is a desperation? asked Henry. It's when engines tell the fat controller something's wrong and ask him to put it right. Did you say, tell the fat controller? Asked Duck thoughtfully. There was a long silence. I propose, said Gordon at last, that Percy be our, um, disputation. Can't they squeak, Percy? I can't. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry. It's easy. That's settled then, said Gordon. Poor Percy wished it wasn't. Hello, Percy. It's nice to be back. Percy jumped, 
hats and trucks went flying. Oh, uh, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir, please, sir. You look nervous, Percy. What's the matter? Uh, please, sir, uh, they've made me a, a, a desperation, sir, uh, to speak to you, sir. I, I don't like it, sir. The pet controller pondered. Do you mean a deputation, Percy? He asked. Yes, sir, please, sir. It's Donald and Douglas, sir. They say, sir, that if you send them away, sir, they'll be turned into scraps, sir. That'll be dreadful, sir. Please, sir, don't send them away, sir. They're nice engines, sir. Thank you, Percy. That will do. He walked away. I had a, a deputation yesterday, said the fat controller. I understand your feelings, but I do not approve of interference. He paused impressively. Donald and Douglas, I hear that your work in the snow was good. What colour paint would you like? The twins were surprised. Oh, blue, sir, please. Very well. But your names will be painted on you. We'll have no more mistakes. Frankly, sir, does this mean that the both of us... The fat controller smiled. It means... But the rest of his speech was drowned in a delighted chorus of cheers and whistles. Thomas comes to breakfast. Thomas, the tank engine, has worked his branch line for many years. You know just where to stop, Thomas, laughed his driver. You could almost manage without me. Thomas had become conceited. He didn't realise his driver was joking. Driver says I don't need him now, he told the others. Don't be so daft, snorted Percy. I'd never go without my driver, said Toby earnestly. I'd be frightened. Pooh, boasted Thomas. I'm not scared. You'd never dare. I would then. You'll see. It was dark next morning when the firelighter came. Thomas drowsed comfortably as the warmth spread through his boiler. He woke again in daylight. Percy and Toby were still asleep. Thomas suddenly remembered. Silly stick in the muds, he chuckled. I'll show him. Driver hasn't come yet. So here goes. He cautiously tried first one piston, then the other. They're moving. They're moving, he whispered. I'll just go out, then I'll stop, and whoosh! That'll make them jump. Very, very quietly, he headed for the door. Thomas thought he was being clever. But really, he was only moving because a careless cleaner had meddled with his controls. He soon found his mistake. He tried to whoosh, but he couldn't. He tried to stop, but he couldn't. He just kept rolling along. The buffers will stop me, he thought hopefully. But that siding had no buffers. It just ended at the road. Thomas's wheels left the rails and crunched the tarmac. Horrors, he exclaimed and shut his eyes. He didn't dare look at what was coming next. The station master's family were having breakfast. They were eating ham and eggs. There was a crash. The house rocked. Broken glass tinkled. Plaster peppered their plates. Thomas had collected a bush on his travels. He peered anxiously into the room through its leaves. He couldn't speak. The station master grimly strode out and shut off steam. His wife picked up her plate. You miserable engine, she scolded. Just look what you've done to our breakfast. Now I shall have to cook some more. She banged the door. More plaster fell. This time it fell on Thomas. Thomas felt depressed. The plaster was tickly. He wanted to sneeze, but he didn't dare in case the house fell on him. Nobody came for a long time. Everyone was much too busy. At last, workmen propped up the house with strong poles. 
They laid rails through the garden, and Donald and Douglas, puffing hard, managed to haul Thomas back to the yard. His funnel was bent. Bits of fencing, the bush, and a broken window frame festooned his front, which was badly twisted. It looked comic. The twins laughed and left him. He was in disgrace. You are a really naughty engine. Oh, no, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Thomas's voice was muffled behind his bush. You must go to the works. Have your front end mended. It'll be a long job. Yes, sir, faltered Thomas. Meanwhile, said the fat controller, a diesel rail car will do your work. A, a di diesel, sir, Thomas spluttered. Yes, Thomas. Diesels always stay in their sheds till they are wanted. Diesels never gallivant off to breakfast in station masters' houses. The fat controller turned on his heel and sternly walked away. Daisy. The fat controller stood on the platform. Percy and Toby watched him anxiously. Here, he said, is Daisy, the diesel rail car, who has come to help while Thomas is, uh, indisposed. Please, sir, asked Percy, will she go, sir, when Thomas comes back, sir? That depends, said the fat controller. Meanwhile, however long she stays, I hope you will both make her welcome and comfortable. Yes, sir. We'll try, sir, said the engines. Good. Run along now and show her the shed. She'll want to rest after her journey. Daisy was hard to please. She shuddered at the engine shed. This is dreadfully smelly, she announced. I'm highly sprung, and anything smelly is bad for my swerves. They tried the carriage shed. This is better, said Daisy. But whatever is that rubbish... The rubbish turned out to be Annie, Clarabelle, and Henrietta, who were most offended. Who oh, meant they'd been salted, they fumed. Percy and Toby had to take them away and spend half the night soothing their hurt feelings. The engines woke next morning, feeling exhausted. Daisy, on the other hand, felt bright and cheerful. <coughs> she tooted as she came out of the yard and back to the station. Look at me, she purred to the waiting passengers. I'm the latest diesel, highly sprung and right up to date. You won't want Thomas's bumpy old Annie and Clarabelle now. The passengers were interested. They climbed in and sat back comfortably, waiting for Daisy to start. Every morning a van is coupled to Thomas's first train. The farmers send their milk to the station, and Thomas takes it down to the dairy. Thomas never minds the extra load, but Daisy did. As soon as she saw that the van was to be coupled to her, she stopped purring. They expect me to pull that? She asked indignantly. Surely, said her driver, you can pull one van. I won't, said Daisy. Percy can do it. He loves messing about with trucks. She began to shudder violently. Nonsense, said her driver. Come on now, back down. Daisy lurched backwards. She was so cross that she blew a fuse. Told you, she said, and stopped. The shunter, the guard, the station master, and her driver all argued with her. But it was no use. It's fitter's orders, she said. What is? My fitter's a very nice man. He's interested in my case. He comes every week and examines me carefully. Daisy, he says, never, never pull. You're highly sprung, and pulling is bad for your swerves. So that's how it is finished Daisy. Stop her nonsense, said the station master. I can't understand, said the shunter. Whatever made the fat controller send us such a feeble, <laughs> feeble, spluttered Daisy. Let me stop arguing, grumbled the passengers. We're late already. So they uncoupled the van, and Daisy purred away, feeling very pleased with herself. That's a good story, she chuckled. I'll do just what work I choose, 
and no more. But she said it to herself. Bullseyes. Toby the tram engine has cow catchers and side plates. They help to prevent animals getting hurt if they stray onto the line. Daisy thought they were silly. She said Toby was afraid of getting hurt himself. I'm not, said Toby indignantly. You are? I've not got stupid cow catchers, but I am not frightened. I just toot and they'd all get out of the way. But they don't, said Toby simply. They would with me. Animals always run if you toot and look them in the eye. Even bulls? Even bulls, said Daisy confidently. Daisy had never met a bull, but she purred away quite unconcerned. At the level crossing, cars waited behind gates to let her pass. She tooted at a farm crossing, and a horse and cart halted while she went by. Pooh, she said. It's easy. I just toot and they all stand aside. Poor little Toby. I am sorry he's frightened. At the next station, a policeman was waiting. There's a bull on the line, he warned them. Please drive along towards the farmer. Daisy was excited. Now, she thought, I'll show Toby how to manage bulls. Champion wasn't really a fierce bull. But this morning, he was cross. They had driven him away before he'd finished breakfast and tried to put him in a cattle float. They pulled him and pushed him, prodded and slapped him, but he wouldn't go. He broke away and trotted down the road. He saw a fence, jumped it, and slithered down a slope. Champion was surprised. This was a new kind of field. It had a brown track at the bottom. But there was plenty of grass on each side, and he was still hungry. <coughs> Tooted Daisy. Go on! Champion had his back to her. He was too busy to pay any attention. <coughs> said Daisy again. Champion went on eating. This is all wrong, thought Daisy. How can I look him in the eye if he won't turn round? At last, Champion turned and noticed Daisy. Mmm, he said, and came towards her, still chewing. He wondered what she was. Mmm, mmm, said Daisy feebly. Why doesn't he run away? The guard and the policeman tried to shoo Champion, but he wouldn't stay shooed. As soon as they turned away, he came back. He was a most inquisitive animal. Go on, Daisy, said her driver. He's harmless. Yes, said Daisy unhappily. You know he's harmless, and A know he's harmless. But does he know? Besides, look at his horns. If I bumped into him, he might hurt uh, them. The farmer wouldn't like that. Champion came close and sniffed at Daisy. Ooh, she said, backing hastily. Toby was surprised to find Daisy back once more at the station. The passengers told him about the bull. He chuckled. Bulls always run if you toot and look them in the eye, eh, Daisy? Daisy said nothing. Ah, oh, well, Toby went on. We live and learn. I'd better chase him for you, I suppose. He clanked away. But Champion took no notice of Toby's bell or whistle. He didn't move till Toby whooshed him with steam. Then Toby gently shooed him along the track to where the farmer and his men were waiting. Daisy had an exhausting day. Toby and Percy often met her on their journeys, and though they never mentioned bulls, they gave her pitying looks. It made her so cross. Her last journey ended at the top station. Some boys were on the platform. Suddenly, one of them came running, holding a paper bag. Look, he shouted. I've got a quarter of bull's eyes. I think they're super. Don't you? They shared the sweets and sucked happily. Ah, 
said Daisy. Keep your old bullseyes. She scuttled to her shade. Percy's predicament. Toby brought Henrietta to the top station. Percy was grumpily shunting. Hello, Percy, he said. I see Daisy's left the milk again. I'll have to make a special journey with it, I suppose, grumbled Percy. Anyone would think I'd nothing to do. Toby pondered the problem. Tell you what, he said at last. I'll take the milk. You fetch my trucks. Their drivers and the station master agreed, and both engines set off. They thought it would be a nice change. Percy trundled away to the quarry. He'd never been there before. It's steep, he thought, but I can manage. Trucks don't dare to play tricks on me now. He marshaled them in a lordly way. Hurry along there, he said, and bumped them as they dallied. The trucks were annoyed. This is Toby's place, they grumbled. Percy's got no right to poke his funnel up here and push us around. They whispered and passed the word. Pay Percy out. At last they were all arranged. Come along, puffed Percy sharply. No nonsense. We'll give him nonsense, giggled the trucks. But they followed so quietly that Percy thought they were completely under control. They rumbled along the twisty line till they saw ahead the notice saying, All trains stop to pin down brakes. Peep, 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 whistled Percy. Brakes guard, please. But before he could check them, the truck surged forward. On, on, they cried. Percy, taken by surprise, couldn't stop them. And in a moment they were careering down the hill. Help, help, whistled Percy. The man on duty at the street crossing rushed to warn traffic with his red flag, but was too late to switch Percy to the runaway siding. A slow-moving cockerel lost his tail feathers as Percy thundered across, but Percy couldn't bother with him. He had other things to worry about. Frantically trying to grip the rails, he slid past the engine shed into the yard. Peep, peep, look out, he whistled. His driver and farman jumped clear. Percy shut his eyes and waited for the end. At the end of the yard, there are sheds where workmen shape rough stone brought from the quarry. Then they load it into trucks, which are pulled to another siding out of the way. A train of these stood here when Percy came slithering down. The guard had left his van. He was talking to the station master. They heard frantic whistling and a splintering crash. They rushed from the office. The brake van was in smithereens. Percy, still whistling fit to burst, was perched on a couple of trucks, while his own trucks were piled up behind him. The fat controller arrived next day. Toby and Daisy had helped to remove most of the wreckage, but Percy still stood on his perch. We must now try, said the fat controller crossly, to run the branch line with Toby and a diesel. You have put us in an awkward predicament. I'm sorry, sir. You can stay there, the fat controller went on, till we are ready. Perhaps it will teach you to be careful with trucks. Percy sighed. The trucks wobbled beneath his wheels. He quite understood about awkward predicaments. The fat controller spoke severely to Daisy, too. My engines do not tell lies, he said. They work hard with no shirking. I send lazy engines away. Daisy was ashamed. However, he went on, Toby says you worked hard yesterday after Percy's accident, so you shall have another chance. Thank you, sir, said Daisy. I will work hard, sir. Toby says he'll help me. 
Excellent. What Toby doesn't know about branch line problems, the Fat Controller chuckled, such as our uh, balls, isn't worth knowing. Our Toby is an experienced engine. Thomas came back next day, and Percy was sent to be mended. Annie and Clarabelle were delighted to see Thomas again, and he took them for a run at once, because they hadn't been out while he was away. Thomas, Toby and Daisy are now all friends. Daisy often takes the milk for Thomas, and when Toby is busy, she takes Henrietta. Toby has taught Daisy a great deal. She shooed a cow off the line all by herself the other day. That shows you, doesn't it? Special funny. Peter Sam's funnel had never been quite the same since his accident with the slate trucks. Now, as he puffed up and down the line, the winter wind tugged at it, trying to blow it away. My funnel feels wobbly, he complained. I wish the thin controller would hurry up with my new one. He says it will be something special. You and your special funnel, said the other engines, and laughed. They were all fond of Peter Sam, but he talked so much about his special funnel that it had become quite a joke. The winter weather worried Mr. Hugh. Wind broke branches from trees while rain turned hillside streams into torrents which threatened to wash the line away. Mr. Hugh and the men patrolled the line every day with Rusty. They removed branches and cleared culverts, so that the water could flow away. But one morning, they found bad trouble. A fresh torrent had broken out, and Mr. Hugh had to stop all trains. There's been a washout near the tunnel, he said. The track bed is swept away. The men worked hard and repaired the damage in a week. While they worked, the weather changed. It became frosty and very cold. They finished just in time for market day and Peter Sam took the morning train very carefully over the mended piece of line. The tunnel was short, but curved, so they couldn't see right through it. Suddenly the driver shouted, There's something hanging from the roof! He braked. There was a clanging crash. When Peter Sam and his coaches stopped in the open air, he no longer had his funnel. The guard found the funnel, and a thick icicle. That's what hit you, Peter Sam, he said. They started again, but the passengers grumbled at the smoke. So when the farmen saw an old drain pipe, they stopped and wired it on. The engines laughed and laughed when Peter Sam came home. Sir Handel made up a rhyme. Peter Sam said again and again, his new funnel will put ours to shame. He went into the tunnel and lost his old funnel. Now his famous new funnel's a drain. Ha! They teased Peter Sam dreadfully. But his new funnel arrived quite soon. Oh dear, he said. Someone squashed it. The thin controller laughed. It's a, it's a geezel. The most up-to-date funnel there is. Listen, when you puff, you draw air through your fire to make it burn brightly. With your old funnel, puffing is hard work. It uses strength you need for pulling trains. Your new funnel has special pipes which help the air come easily. Puffing will be easier, so you will have more strength for your work. Yes, sir, said Peter Sam, doubtfully. At first, Peter Sam's special funnel was a great joke. Sir Handel and Duncan asked him why he'd sat on it and then hooted with laughter. But when Peter Sam started work, it was a very different story. Even Sir Handel was impressed. I can't understand it, he said. Peter Sam never seems to work hard. He just says, 
he simply strolls away with any train he's given. He makes it look so easy. They don't laugh at Peter Sampras' funnel now. They wish they had one like it. Steamroller. The handle kept slipping between the rails, so they gave him new wheels with broad tyres. The other engines teased him. Look at his steamroller wheels, they laughed. You oh, shut up, Sir Handel snorted. You're jealous. My wheels are special, like Peter Sam's funnel. Now I'll go faster than any of you. You'll never. The engines were surprised. Sir Handel's trains were usually late. Scarlo, he winked. With your grand new wheels a handle, he said gravely, you're just the engine to tackle George. Who's George? Sir Handel asked. While Sir Handel was in the shed waiting for his new wheels, workmen had come to widen the road which ran for a mile or two beside the railway. They pulled down the wall, and nothing now protected the line. George was their steamroller. He chuffered to and fro, making rude remarks when the engines passed. Railways are no good, he would say. Pull them up. Turn them into roads. Scarlowy had often heard that talk before, and he warned the others to take no notice. But he hoped that when the two boastful engines met, he and the others would have some fun. Don't worry any more, said Sir Handel importantly, when they told him about George. Leave him to me. I'll soon send him packing. Next morning, George was standing near the halt by the level crossing. Ah, he said. You're Sir Handel, I suppose. And you, I suppose, are George. Yes, I've heard of you. And I've heard of you. You swank around with steamroller wheels, pretending you're as good as me. Actually, said Sir Handel sweetly, I'm better. Goodbye. He puffed away. George Chuffin. Excuse me. One afternoon, Sir Handel had to bring a special load down after the last train had gone. When he reached the road, he saw George trundling home. Beep, 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 beep. George took no notice. He trundled along close to the track. There was barely room to pass. Beep, 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 beep. Sir Handel slowed and crept cautiously alongside. Get out of my way, you great clumsy road hog, he hissed. I don't move for imitation of steamrollers, retorted George with spirit. They lumbered along side by side, exchanging insults. No one could ever explain what happened next. George's driver says he signalled for Sir Handel to stop. Sir Handel's driver says he signalled to George. There was a crash. The brake van tilted sideways, and the guard scrambled out to find George's front roller nuzzling his footboard. The two drivers were hotly arguing whose fault it was. A policeman strolled up in time to stop the argument turning to fisticuffs, and when Sir Handel's farman came back with Rusty and Mr. Hugh, they all set to work clearing up the mess. Neither engine had been going fast enough to cause much damage, so Sir Handel was able to bring his train on when George had backed himself away. Next day, the workmen put up a fence between road and railway and then went away, taking George with them. This was because they'd finished their work. But Sir Handel thought he had made George go away. He was more conceited than ever, and talked everlastingly about steamrollers. Oh dear, whispered Scarlowy one evening. He's worse than ever. I'm sorry my plan was no good. Never mind, said Rusty. We'll think of someone else. But they had no need to do that, for some boys came and asked Mr. Hugh if they could look at the engines. Almost at once, one called out, Look, here's the handle. He raced a steamroller last week. The roller nearly beat him, too. It was most exciting. 
Mr. Handel never mentions steamrollers now. Passengers and Polish. Nancy is a guard's daughter. She was working on Scarl Lowy with some polish and a rag. We've got lazy bones, she said severely. Your brass is filthy. Aren't you ashamed? No, said Scarl Lowy sleepily. You're just an old fusspot. Go away, she tickled his nose. Renias comes home tomorrow. Don't you want to look nice? Scarl Lowy woke suddenly. What? Tomorrow. Yes, Daddy told me. I'm going now. Nancy, stop. Do I look really nice? Please polish me again. There's a good kind girl. So oh, who's an old fuss pot? Laughed Nancy. She gave him another rub, then climbed down. Aren't you going to polish me? Asked Duncan. Sorry, not today. I'm helping a refreshment lady this afternoon. We must get the ices and things ready for the passengers on Scarlow's two o'clock train. Never mind, Duncan. I'll give you a good polish tomorrow. But Duncan did mind. It isn't fair, he complained. Peter Sam gets a special funnel. Sir Handel special wheels. Passengers get ices. And I've never even polished. This, of course, wasn't true. But Duncan liked having a grievance. He began to sulk. That afternoon, a message came from the station by the waterfall. One of Scarlowy's coaches has come off the rails. Please send some workmen to put it right. Duncan was in steam, so he had to go. All this extra work, he grumbled. It wears an engine out. Rubbish, said his driver. Come on. The derailed coach was in the middle of his train, so Scarlowy had gone on to the top station with the front coaches. Duncan left the workmen and brought the passengers in the rear coaches home. He sulked. All the way. He arrived back just in time for his own four o'clock train. I get no rest. I get no rest, he complained. He was sulky and short of steam. So his driver waited a few minutes in the hope of raising more. But Duncan wouldn't try. Oh, he can't keep the passengers waiting any longer, his driver said at last. You always think about passengers, muttered Duncan crossly. Never about me. I'm never even polished. I'm overworked, and I won't stand it. He grumbled away, brooding over his wrongs. Duncan made heavy weather of the journey, but at last they reached the viaduct. This is long, high, and narrow. No one can walk on it when a train is there. Come on, Duncan, said his driver. One more effort, and you'll have a rest and a drink in the station. Keep your old station, said Duncan rudely. I'm staying here. He did, too. He stopped his train right on the viaduct, and nothing his driver or farman could do would make him move another yard. Star Louis came from the top station to haul Duncan and his train to the platform. The passengers were very cross. They burst out of the train and told the drivers, the farman and the guard, what a bad railway it was. Star Louis had to pull the train to the top station too. Duncan wouldn't even try. The thin controller was waiting at the shed for Duncan that evening. He spoke to him severely. But Duncan still stayed sulky. He muttered to himself, no polish, no passengers, in an obstinate sort of voice. Gallant old engine. I'm ashamed of you, Duncan, said Scarlowy. You should think of your passengers. Passengers are just nuisances, 
They're always complaining. Scarlowy was shocked. That's no way to talk, he said. Passengers are our coal and water. No passengers means no trains. No trains means no railway. Then we'd be on the scrap heap, my engine, and don't you forget it. Thank goodness Renius is coming home. Perhaps he'll teach you sense before it's too late. What has Arrhenius got to do with it? Renius saved our railway, said Scarlowy. Please tell us about it, begged Peter Sam. The year before you came, said the old engine, things were very bad. We were on our last wheels. Mr. Hugh was driver and farman, while the thin controller was guard. He did everything else, too, and helped Mr. Hugh mend us in the shed. We expect two fresh engines next year, they told us, but we must keep the trains going now. If we don't, our railway will close. How awful, said Peter Sam, in sympathy. I tried hard, though I couldn't do much. But Rhenius understood. It's my turn now, he said. You've done more than your share of hard work. He was often short of steam, but he always tried to struggle to a station and rest there. That, said Scarlow earnestly, is most important with passengers. Pshaw, exclaimed Duncan. Passengers, Scarlow continued, don't mind stopping at stations. They can get out and walk about. That's what stations are for. But they get very cross if we stop at wrong places, like viaducts. Then they say we're a bad railway and never come back. I remember Renius stopping in a wrong place once, said Scarlowy. He couldn't help it, but he made up for it afterwards. That afternoon he had damp rails and a full train. There were passengers even in Beatrice, the guards' van. His wheels slipped dreadfully on the steep bit after the first station, but they gripped at last. The worst's over, he thought. Now we're away. Come along, come along, he sang to the coaches. Come along. Oh, I got cramp, he groaned. He stopped, unable to move, on the loneliest part of the line. The thin controller and Mr. Hugh examined him carefully. The passengers watched and waited. Renius eyed them anxiously. They looked cross. At last the thin controller stood up. Your valve gear on one side had jammed, he said. We've unfastened the rods and tied them up. Now, Renius, he went on, we need to reach the next station. Can you pull us there on one cylinder? I'll try, sir, but the next station isn't the right station. Will the passengers be cross? Don't worry, smiled the thin controller. They know we can't reach the top station today. The thin controller sanded the rails. Passengers from Beatrice pushed behind. Mr. Hugh gently eased out the regulator. The train jerked and began to move. I'll do it. I'll do it. Everyone cheered. But Renius heard nothing. The thin controller's relying on me. If I fail, the railway will close. It mustn't, it mustn't. I'll get there or burst. Everything blurred. He was too tired to move another yard. But he did. And another, and another, and another. Till I got there at last, he sighed with relief. It's proud of you I am indeed, said Mr. Hugh. All Renius remembered about the journey down was having to go on going on. At the big station, the passengers thanked him. We expected a long walk, they said, but you brought us home. We'll come again and bring our friends. You're a gallant little engine, said the thin controller. When you're rested, we'll mend you ready for tomorrow. Was Renius always ready for tomorrow? Always, smiled Scarlowy. Whatever happened, Renius always pulled his trains. It was Duncan who broke the silence. Thank you for uh, telling us about um, Renius, he said. I was wrong. Passengers are important after all.
All the little engines were at the wharf on the day that Rennie Ast came home. Some of the fat controller's engines were there too. Edward pushed Rennie Ast's truck to the siding, and Scarlowey pulled him neatly to his own rails. This was the signal for a chorus of whistles from engines large and small. You never heard such a noise in all your life. The owner, Renias, and other important people made speeches. The band played, and everyone was very happy. But Renias was happiest of all in his own place that night, next to his friend Scarlowey. Oh, this helps a little engine to feel, he said, that at last he has really come home. Bells of England. The bluebells are coming, oh ho, oh ho, the bluebells are coming, oh ho. If you must sing, Percy, grumbled Douglas. Can't you sing in tune? Anyway, our song's about Campbell's. And mine's about bluebells. Then it's daft. Bluebells are flowers. Flowers can't come, they grow. My song isn't daft. Percy was indignant. It is, then. I can find about bluebells. We have a song called The Bluebells of Scotland. But, said Percy triumphantly, the bluebells of England are different. They're engines. And one of them's coming with his controller. Didn't you listen? He went on severely. To the fat controller telling us all about it. I was away. Oh, dear. I couldn't understand it all. But engines on the other railway aren't safe now. Their controllers are cruel. They don't like engines anymore. They put them on cold, damp sidings. And then... Percy nearly sobbed. They... they... they cut them up. You're right there, agreed Douglas. If I hadn't escaped, I'd have been cut up too. It's all because of young diesels. They're all devils, he added fiercely. Fair play, Douglas, reminded Percy. Some are nice. Look at Rusty and Daisy. Maybe so, answered Douglas. But I'd never trust them myself. But what I cannot understand is all your blether about bluebells. Well, the bluebells are kind people who want to save engines. They've made a place in England called the Bluebell Railway. Engines can escape there and be safe, like me winning away here. Yes. Percy went on, just like that. If they're old or ill, a fitter makes them well. They can have their own special colours, all the coal and water they need, and pull trains too. That's braw hearing, said Douglas with feeling. The fat controller says Stepney was the first engine to escape there, so he's asked him to visit us and bring his controller. But, objected Douglas, how about yon diesels? Mightn't they catch him on the way? We thought so too, said Percy. But the fat controller says there's no danger of that. Stepney's a match for any diesel. Besides, his controller will take care of him. He's a brave engine for all that, said Douglas admiringly. Fancy fighting his way through all those diesels just to see us. Look, squeaked Percy. The station's crowded. Silly, how can I look? Unless I'd be a corkscrew. Why have they all come? There's no train. But Percy was wrong. The signal dropped, and from far away an engine whistled. A gleam of yellow shone through the bridge girders. Here he comes, yelled Douglas. Boop, boop, peep, peep, boop, boop. The two engines whistled excitedly in welcome. Peep, peep, replied Stepney, as with passengers and people waving and cheering, he puffed proudly through the junction on the last stage of his long journey.
Stepney's special. So I tried very hard, but I couldn't work properly, and they put me on a siding. I stayed there for days and days. Other engines were there too. I was afraid. I'd have been frightened too, said Edward. But when some workmen came, they mended me, and even gave me a coat of paint. I couldn't understand it till my driver came. He was very pleased. Stepney, you lucky old engine, he said, you've been saved. The Bluebell Railway has bought you. What a lovely surprise, smiled Edward. Have they saved other engines besides you, he asked. Oh, yes, answered Stepney. You'd like our Blue Bell and Primrose. They're twins, he chuckled, and it's like as two peas. They only had numbers at first. Blue Bell is 323 and Primrose is 27. They were very pleased when our controller gave them names. Some say he was wrong to do it. It certainly made them cocky. But they do work hard, and I think our controller was right. All engines ought to have names. Yes, agreed Edward. It's most important. That's why, Stepney continued, we've given names to our 488 and 2650. But our controller doesn't know. It's a secret. Don't tell him, will you? Of course not, smiled Edward. They're both very pleased about it, because now they feel part of the family. We call 488 Adams after his designer, you know. He's a lovely engine. A southwestern from Devon. He can stroll away with any load he's given. Cromford, who's 2650 has been pulling trucks up high peaks in Derbyshire. He's tough as Cromford. He had to be for that job. Captain Baxter's tough too, Stepney went on. And uh, rather rude. But he's worked in a quarry and you know what that does to an engine's language and manners. I do indeed, said Edward gravely. He's a good sort, really, said Stepney. I like him. We both miss our work with trucks. He paused. I oughtn't to say this, he went on, after everyone's been so kind, but our line is very short. I never get any good runs now. I miss them dreadfully. Never mind, smiled Edward. Perhaps you'll get some while you're here. Stepney said goodbye to Edward and then returned to the big station. There he helped Duck shunt the yard. They were soon great friends and enjoyed their afternoon together. Thomas arrived before they'd finished and stayed till it was time for his last branch line train. But that train's tail lamps were hardly out of sight when the two engines heard a commotion at the station. Hello, oh, said Duck. I wonder what's up. Presently the night duty shunter came hurrying to the shed. The bell in the cabin on the branch line rang once, then five, pause five. That means shunt to allow following train to pass. The signalman was puzzled. He telephoned control. Oh, special, is it? Ah, I see. Thomas and his passengers grumbled at being delayed, but there was no help for it. Soon they heard an unfamiliar puffing. Express headlamps swayed and twinkled. Then Stepney, pulling one coach, loomed in the station lights. He slowed to exchange tablets, whistled a greeting, then gathered speed into the night. Bust my boiler, said Thomas, the tank engine. Shunted, fumed Thomas next morning. On my own branch, too. It's a disgrace. I'm sorry, said Stepney. I was a special, he explained. Why? An important passenger came after you'd gone. He said he must get home and ordered a special. Don't kindly let me take it. We had a splendid run. No record-breaking, of course, but... Uh, ah, well, said Thomas modestly. Perhaps when you know the road as I do... Exactly, put in Stepney. You're such an expert. Thomas, flattered, forgot he was cross, and told Stepney all about his branch line.
bowled out. The big diesel surveyed the shed. Not bad, he said. I've seen worse. At least you're all clean. The engines gaped. It's not your fault, he went on, but you're all out of date. Your control is it to scrap you. Get engines like me. A fill of oil, a touch on the starter, and I'm off with no bother, no waiting. I have to fuss around you for hours before you're ready. At last the engines found their voices. An inspector had to come and stop the noise. They held an indignation meeting early next morning round the turntable. Disgraceful, rumbled Gordon. Disgusting, said James. Despicable, stuttered Henry. To say such things to us, burst out Donald and Douglas. It's to teach him a lesson we'd be wanting. But no one had any good ideas. And at last they all went off to work except for Duck and Stepney. Never mind, said Duck. We'll be sure to think of something. We'll have to be quick then, warned Stepney. But their chance came sooner than expected. Diesel purred comfortably. He was being warmed up well before time. An inspector watched a fitter making adjustments. The wind tugged at the inspector's hat. The fitter replaced the air intake cover. OK, mate, he said. Diesel saw his coaches waiting at the platform. He rolled proudly towards them. Look at me, Duck and Stepney, he purred. Now I'll show you something. He advanced a few yards, then suddenly he coughed, faltered, choked, and stopped. The inspector, meanwhile, had seen nothing of this. He was looking for his hat. Can we uh, help you at all? asked Duck and Stepney sweetly. Diesel seethed with baffled fury as they pushed him back to the shed. My hat! exclaimed the inspector as the cavalcade went by. Bother your hat! said the fat controller crossly. The train's due out in ten minutes, and you'll have to take it, Duck. Duck looked doubtful. But when Stepney asked, Can I help him, sir? He felt better. The fat controller was pleased, too, and hurried away almost cheerfully to make the arrangements. The engines and their crews made careful plans. A good start, they profane on a job like this, warned Stepney. So as they backed down, they dropped sand on the rails, rolling it firm with their wheels. Both controllers were there to see them off. Gordon will take over from halfway, said the fat controller. So get the train there. Never mind about being late. Good luck. Don't worry, sirs, smiled Stepney. We'll get there and be early, too. They stood waiting, sizzling with excitement, ready and eager to be off. At last the guard's flag waved. The engines dug their wheels into the sand and gave a mighty heave. Come on! Come on! puffed Duck, while Stepney barked excitedly in front. Moving carefully over the points, they reached the open line. Now for a sprint! wuffed Stepney. I'm ready when you are! puffed Duck. Faster and faster they went, till their wheels were turning at such speed that the side rods were merely blurs. Under clear signals, they whizzed through Edward Station and charged at Gordon's Hill beyond. They felt the drag of their fifteen coaches here. It was hard work, but once over the top, the last ten miles were plain running, and they swept into the big station in fine style. Hello, said Gordon. You're early. That's one in the headlamp for old Diesel. Have you heard the latest, he chuckled. Diesel had sucked the inspector's hat into his air pipe. That's why he broke down. James says he's sick as boiler sludge and sulking in the shed. Out of date, are we? Ho, ho, ho! And still laughing, Gordon puffed away. Everyone was sad next day when Stepney had to go. All the engines who could came to see him off. The fat controller made a speech, and so did Stepney's controller. Donald and Douglas made everyone sing Old Lang Syne, and then Stepney and his controller puffed off to a chorus of cheers and whistles. Goodbye, Stepney! Come again! Goodbye! Goodbye! But what about Diesel? He'd slipped away the night before. He said goodbye to no one, but left two things behind. The nasty smell of bad manners and a battered...
Mr. Bowler Hat. Train stops play. You are very lucky engines, said Stepney. Your branch has got everything. It's long enough to give you a good run, and you have plenty of passengers. Then you have a quarry, a mine, and some factories, so you need plenty of trucks. Trucks are fun, he went on wistfully. I miss them on our line. Percy looked surprised. You can take mine and welcome this morning, he said. So they asked permission, and then went off to collect them. Toby and Thomas gaped in wonderment. Stepney took his trucks to the harbour, picked up a load of empties and started back. On the way they were stopped by a signal near a cricket field, where a match had just started. They settled down to watch. Presently some fielders came towards them and waved. Could you move, please, they asked. Uh, your last few trucks are behind the bowler's arm. Sorry, smiled the driver. Will this do? And he eased Stepney forward till he stood under the signal. The cricketers shouted their thanks and play started again. The batsman hit out and soon a skyer towered towards the train. Clunk! Down went the signal. There was another clunk too as the ball fell on the train. But neither driver nor farmer heard it. They were too busy. Stop! yelled the fieldsman. But Stepney's noisy starting drowned their shouts. Come along! Come along! he puffed to the trucks and left the frantic fieldsman behind. Oh, one and only ball! they said sadly. Four of them piled into an ancient car. Wake up, Caroline! they said. Caroline coughed costly, reluctantly came to life, and they rolled out onto the road. Stepney wasn't hurrying. He had just crossed the river when Caroline came up behind. Kirk, kirk, she wailed. Road and rail ran side by side. The cricketers waved and shouted, but they were too far away for the farmer to recognise them, or hear clearly what they said. If these jokers want a race, remarked the driver, they can have one. He advanced his regulator, and Stepney drew ahead. Poor Caroline wasn't happy. She rattled along at twice her usual speed, Master shouldn't treat me like this, she grumbled. This place is too hot for my system. It'll fuse all my circuits. Hurrah, she exclaimed. That silly train has run into a hole so we can't catch it. Now Master will have to be sensible and go home. But Master didn't go home. Caroline nearly boiled with fury when he made her climb a steep hill and run down to the station on the other side. Caroline arrived just as Stepney had shunted the trucks. His crew were going off duty. The cricketers explained what had happened. The driver and farmer were surprised. Did you say these third truck from the van, they asked. They all went and looked. The ball was there, nestling under some straw. Oh, we're very sorry, the driver said. Never mind, you couldn't help it. Now we must get back quickly. That's just it, said the driver. You'll never be quick in Caroline. She looks worn out. Wait a minute, he went on. I've got a plan. The driver spoke to the station master and signalman. Then they rolled Caroline onto a flat truck and coupled a brake van behind. The cricketers got in and Stepney pulled the train. They reached the field in no time. Stepney watched from a siding while driver, farmer and guard sat in a pavilion. There were no more lost balls and the game was played to an exciting finish. Even Caroline was pleased. She doesn't think trains silly now. They have their uses, she says. They can save the wear on a poor car's wheels.
mountain engine. Sir Handel had had a bad day. The old coaches, Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima and Beatrice, had been awkward. They'd made him slip to a standstill twice. He was furious. Those cattle trucks will be scrapped, he fumed. Scarlowy was shocked. I won't have it, he protested. Those old dears need kindness, not bad names. Exactly so, agreed Renius. He winked at Scarlowy. You be thankful, Sir Randall, that we're not a mountain railway. A mountain railway? What's that? A railway which climbs mountains, of course. But it can't, said Sir Handel. Its engine's wheels would slip. But it can, said Renéas firmly. We've heard of one quite near here. It can't. It can. A noisy argument started just as Donald chanted a flat truck to the siding nearby. On the truck was a queer-looking engine. He had six small wheels and a stovepipe chimney. His boiler was tilted downwards, and his cylinders were back to front. Whisht, whispered Donald hoarsely. Didn't awake the wee engine. It's tired he is. He's away back from England after being mended. You can how it is. We understand, but who is he? He's called Caldee, after the mountain his railway climbs. Well, did you ever, exclaimed the two old engines. They looked at Sir Handel and chuckled. I don't believe it, said Sir Handel. Well, you'd best ask him yourself. Then maybe you'll learn it's the truth I've been telling you. Donald puffed away, offended. Caldy woke to find the engines gazing at him. Where am I? he asked. They told him. That's good, he said. I'm nearly home now. Do you really climb mountains? asked Garlowey. I've done it for years. You must be clever. We couldn't. Our wheels would slip. I'm not really clever, laughed Caldee. I was just drawn like that. Like what? With pinion wheels on my driving axles. They have teeth, you see, which fit into a rack rail. I can't slip, however steep the line is. That, said Arrhenius, must help you going up. But if your line is so steep... Aren't you frightened coming down? Why? We have good brakes. Coaches, went on Renius, are sometimes silly and try to push us downhill. Some <coughs> engines uh, find it hard to stop them. Sir Handel blushed and looked at his buffers. Our coaches, answered Caldy, are never silly like that. They know such tricks are dangerous. I've never had that sort of accident. But, he went on thoughtfully, I was frightened once. Very frightened indeed. Please tell us, said all the engines. One day, long ago, before our line was opened, our drivers made all five of us engines stand ready outside our shed. The inspector's coming, they said. We don't know which of you he'll choose. He chose me, climbed into my cab, and made me push two coaches to the summit. So far, so good, he said. Now we'll test your brakes. So he went and stood on the steepest part of the line. Down, down it fell, the nasty curve below, edging a precipice. Brakes off, driver. Let him roll. Oh, gasped the little engine in horror. The coaches nudged me. We gathered speed downhill. I was terrified. My driver's hand stole to the brake. Hands off, ordered the inspector. Then I remembered. I had automatic brakes. I could put these on myself. Perhaps the inspector wanted to see if I could. They worked beautifully. Well done, Caldee, said the inspector. You'll do. I smiled, of course, but felt very shaky. My driver and farmer mopped their faces. They'd been nervous too. I'm never nervous now, finished Caldee. Why should I be? There's no need.
bad lookout. <laughs> Renias and Star Lowy were talking quietly to Carl D next morning when Duncan stormed up, followed by Sir Handel. Hello, chuckled Renias. Here we go. I nearly came off, fumed Duncan. Those coaches pushed me. The thing controller says they didn't. He says I'd kept a bad lookout. We've no money to mend you, he said. But if it happens again, I'll leave you at the back of the shed. Why does he always pick on me? It's no fair. Star Lewis said nothing. He just winked at Renias. As you were saying, Caldi, remarked Renias, you had two coaches on your trial trip. Do you ever take more? Now our line is so steep, they were only allowed one. We each have our own. Mine's called Catherine, I know her well. That's most important. Why? asked Sir Handel. They're only coaches. Ours, said Caldi, are something more. You pull your coaches, and you can see ahead. We push ours up, so we can't see. They watch the line for us. The guard watches too, of course. But Catherine's so clever that I know at once if anything is wrong. That must take a load off your mind, said Scarlowy. Caldy smiled, but not off my buffers. Climbing's hard work and needs a lot of steam. My farm and I have a tiring time. Coming down, he went on, it's different. Catherine and I just roll. We need no steam for that. Sir Handel sighed enviously. Ah, oh, I should like that, he said. With your automatic brakes, it sounds like a rest cure. That, replied Caldy, was just the mistake poor Godred made. Who? asked the little engines. Is Godred? Godred was our number one, and named after a king, Caldy replied. Perhaps that went to his smoke box and made him conceited. He'd never keep a good lookout. He'd roll down the line looking anywhere but at the track. You'll have an accident, I told him. Pooh, he said, I've got automatic brakes, haven't I, and driver's got his air brake. What more do you want? More sense from you, I said. No engine can stop at once if he isn't ready to obey his driver's controls. The first thing a young engine learns, agreed Scarlowy. Godred never learnt sense. His driver and farman and the manager all spoke to him. They even took him to pieces to see if anything was wrong. But he still went on in the same old way. One day, I was going up and waited at a station for Godred coming down to pass me. As I waited, so it happened. One moment he was on the track, the next his driver and farman jumped clear as he rolled over. No one was hurt. His coach stayed on the rails and the guard braked her to a stop. They brought Godred home next day. We've no money to mend you, said our manager, so you'll go to the back of the shed. As time went on, poor Godred got smaller and smaller till nothing was left. What, what, what happened? asked Duncan anxiously. It's not nice to talk about, said Caldee. But what happened? Why isn't it nice? Our drivers used Godred's parts to mend us, answered Caldee mournfully. Sir Handel and Duncan were unusually silent long after Caldi had gone home. Neither Scarlowy nor Renias ever mentioned that Caldi had made the story up. Danger point. Donald brought Cal D up the valley to the exchange siding, where he was soon offloaded by Crane. 
His driver and farman and the manager were there. They all said goodbye and thank you to Donald. Then they lit Caldy's fire, and while waiting for steam, they looked him over carefully. A very good job, they said at last. Caldy sizzled happily. It's lovely to be at home and in the steam again, he said. I'm longing to have a run with Catherine. Come on, then, said his driver, and they trundled to the shed. Catherine was pleased to see him, and they went for a short run. I've had to go with Lord Harry lately, she said. He takes risks and frightens me. When I warn him, he laughs. Never mind, comforted Caldy. It'll be all right now. Later, he met two old friends, Ernest, number two, and Wilfred, number three. After some happy gossip, Caldy asked, Who is Lord Harry? He's one of the new engines, they said, who came while you were away. He's number six. Alaric and Eric are seven and eight. They're nice, quiet engines. But old Harry's a terror. Next afternoon, Lord Harry rolled by with a reluctant coach on his way to the platform. Stupid things, he grumbled. They're all scared of coming with me. You're too reckless, said Caldy. That's why. Rubbish. I'm up to date, that's all. I can go twice your speed in perfect safety. All the same, we don't take such risks on mountain railways. There's no risk. Why, with my super heat. Oh, interrupted Caldy. It's super heat, is it? I'd have said it was conceit myself. Lord Harry snorted furiously away. Oh, screamed the coach as our wheels ground on the curves. Be careful. Pooh, snorted Lord Harry. I like things to be exciting. Every wise mountain engine knows that you do not take risks and that points must be taken slowly, for there the rack rail can have no guards. Steady, boy, steady, warned his driver. But Lord Harry paid no attention. He was thinking what he'd say to Caldy next time they met. There's no danger, he boasted, storming up the final slope. That patched-up old ruin was talking nonsense. The telephone rang in the shed, and Caldy's crew were joined by the manager. Lord Harry's off at Summit, he said. We shall have to go and put things right. So they collected some workmen and the tool van and set out at once. It was getting dark when they arrived. Lord Harry's shape loomed against the sky. He had come off at the points and blocked both roads of the station. Wilfred was there with his coach, unable to start his journey down. The passengers buzzed around Lord Harry like angry bees. He was feeling harassed. The manager pacified the passengers, while Cull D buffered up behind to take the strain when the men levered the engine's front wheels onto the rails. Wilfred, he called. Who is this wreck? It's Lord Harry, didn't you know? It looks like old Harry. It's fat as old Harry. But of course it can't be old Harry. Why ever not? You see, old Harry is an up-to-date engine. He can go twice our speed in perfect safety. Tee-hee-hee-hee, <laughs> tittered the coaches. Lord Harry seethed in silence. They pushed Lord Harry out of the way and took the passengers home. Then Caldy helped him back to the shed. It was that coach, sir, blustered Lord Harry. She never... No tails, said the manager sharply. It was your fault, and you know it. You upset our passengers and damaged yourself by taking risks. We cannot have that on our mountain railway. But, sir, that is enough. You will stay in the shed till we have decided what to do with you. He turned and walked sternly away. Devil's Back. As a punishment, they took Lord Harry's name away, 
and put him at the back of the shed. He soon heard Caldy's story about Godred. Pooh, he said. That couldn't happen to me. But he was anxious all the same. Please, sir, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll try to be different. The passengers don't trust you, said the manager. You will take the truck instead. So number six took supplies to Summit Hotel. And he took gangers to work in the morning and brought them home in the evening. He found it dull and grumbled. It's important work, protested Wilfred. And tough, too. Tough? That little lot. Yes, tough, said Caldy. Have you ever been across Devil's Back in a gale? No, said number six thoughtfully. But I see what you mean. A mile below Summit, the line runs along a rocky ridge. Always there is wind. Sometimes it is gentle. At others it is fierce and very dangerous. Then all passenger trains stop at Devil's Back Station. But whatever the weather, stores trains and rescue trains must get through. A few days later, number six reached Devil's Back at 5.15. He was on his way with the truck to fetch railway staff from Summit. All clear now, said the station master, as the last down train left the loop. Don't waste time, the wind's rising. We'll have a gale in half an hour. He went inside to set the points. But the telephone rang, and he came out looking worried. There's trouble, he told the crew. Come in and discuss it out of the wind. They filled the truck's big tank with water, and sandbags ballasted the van. The wind whistled round them as they worked. What is all this? asked number six. There's been a climbing accident, explained his driver. Caldy and Catherine are bringing up a doctor and a rescue team. But Catherine's too light to stand this gale, so we'll go up ourselves. The water and the sandbags will steady us. And if you can keep going, we have a good chance of getting through. Can you do it? I'll have a jolly good try, said number six. When Caldy arrived, the doctor and the rescue team changed trains. The manager was there too. Splendid, he said, when he saw the preparations. Now, number six, it's up to you. The guard signaled the driver, and they were off. A real job at last, crowed number six exultantly. Now I'll show them. Now I'll show them. Leaving the shelter of the station, the full force of the gale struck him like a blow. Caldy and Catherine saw him waver. Go it, go it, they yelled. Number six heard them for a moment. The next he was battling on alone. He didn't feel so brave now. All he wanted was to get out of the vicious, stinging, icy wind which seemed to come at him from all directions. The truck lurched and swayed as the wind tore at it. It whimpered and groaned as though in pain. She wants to go back, thought number six. And so do I, but we can't. The manager's relying on me to save those climbers. We must go through. We must. We must. Slowly, doggedly, he struggled on, till in shelter again on the other side, they climbed the final steep ascent and rolled triumphant into Summit Station. They brought the climbers safely down, and an ambulance whisked them to hospital. Next morning, their leader came to say thank you. My friend Patrick, he said, hurt himself helping me, but he's mending now thanks to you and your brave engine. We'd all be proud if you'd call him Patrick too. The manager smiled. Well, oh, number six, would you like that? He asked. Oh, sir, yes, please. Patrick and the others are all good friends. He is still brave, still ready to take risks when needed, but he knows now that it is stupid to take them just for the sake of showing off.
Crosspatch. Scarlery made a face. Not again, Nancy, please. Just a teeny polish, she coaxed. You must look nice for your hundredth birthday. I am nice. You're just a fuss pot. And you're a horrid old crosspatch. Nancy polished him vigorously. Scarlery smiled. Nancy, he said, I really was a crosspatch once. Shall I tell you? Yes, please. Well, come down. I can't tell it properly while you're fussing up there. Just five minutes, then. No longer. Nancy sat down on a box, and the old engine began. Tally Flynn, Dol Goch, Rennie Ass and I were built together in England. Who asked Nancy? A Tally Flynn and Dol Goch. Tally Flynn is my twin. Dol Goch is Rennie Ass's. Their railway is at Towin in Wales. And they're a hundred, too. They were green, and we were red. Tally Flynn and I had four wheels then, and no cab. We thought we were wonderful, and talked about how splendid we'd look pulling coaches. What about trucks? asked Nancy. Scullery chuckled. We had no use for them, he said. I was finished first, and sent away on a ship. I didn't like that. It wobbled dreadfully. At the port, the big railway kept me waiting. They had no cranes to lift me out. It wasn't the fat controller's railway then. He would have managed much better. What did they do? asked Nancy. They used the ship's derricks. They nearly turned me upside down, said Scarlowy indignantly, and left me hanging while they arranged a truck. You must have looked funny, gurgled Nancy. Yes, and I felt it too. I got crosser and crosser. They fastened me to the truck at last, and an engine took me away. His name was Neil. He was ugly, but kind, and we were soon friends. So you're bound for the wee railway, he said. Ye must put some order into those trucks. The havens they make you hard to believe. I didn't like the sound of that, but I was too tired to say anything. Plenty of people were waiting when we got there. But they weren't used to engines, and it was dark before I was on the rails. Then they left me, lonely and unhappy, and wishing Renius would come. Trucks were everywhere next morning. Suddenly, with a rattle and a roar, a train of loaded ones came in. I was surprised. There's no engine, I said. A workman laughed. They've come down by gravity, he said. The empty ones need pulling up, though. That's why you've come. But can't they go up by gra whatever it was you said? Gravity only brings things down. We need horses or engines like you to pull them up. What? Have I to pull trucks? Of course. I won't. I want coaches. He just laughed and walked away. Soon Mr. Mac, the manager, arrived with some men. He showed them my parts from a book. We're going to steam you, Scarlowy, he said. Can I pull coaches, sir? No, certainly not. I gave him such a look. They didn't understand engines, so it was easy. My fire wouldn't burn, and I made no steam. I just blew smoke at them. They called me bad names, but I didn't care. Next day they tried again, and the next, and the next. I just gave them my look and wouldn't do a thing. At last the manager said, Very well, be a crosspatch. But we're not going to look at your sulky face all day. We'll cover you up and leave you till you're a better engine. They did too, chuckled Scarlowy. They fetched a big tarpaulin and covered me right up. I didn't like that at all. I think it served you right, said Nancy severely. Never mind her, Scarlowy. Please tell us what happened next. Nancy turned in surprise. A group of people had quietly come up to listen while Scarlowy was telling her his story.
bucking bronco. I was lonely and miserable, Starlowy continued, till at last the manager came. I hope now that you're a better engine. Oh, yes, sir, please, sir. Because I've asked Mr. Bobby to come and look after you. Mr. Bobby had helped to build me in England. I liked him, so we soon had steam up. Come on, Scarlow, he said. We must help the workmen finish the line before the inspector comes. I didn't mind pulling trucks with Mr. Bobby. And we worked so hard that by the time Renias arrived, the line was ready. Renius never got so excited and bouncy as I did. He worked without hurry or fuss. Trucks often played tricks on me to make me cross. But they soon found that teasing Renias was a mistake. He was shunting one day when I came alongside. I was excited. I'm pulling the director's train, I said, and taking the inspector tomorrow. Think of that. Renias pondered. You mind your bucks and bounces then, Scarlowy, he said at last. The directors won't like them. Pooh, I snorted, and bounced away to fetch the coaches. Peep, peep, I whistled. Hello, girls. Who is it? Agnes's deep voice echoed from the back of the shed. It's an engine, whispered Beatrice, the guard's van. He's come to take us out. Beware of strange engines, warned Agnes. We must be on our guard. Our guard has just come, giggled Beatrice. Jemima and Ruth, the other coaches, sighed with relief. I pulled them all happily to the station. Agnes, still suspicious, kept muttering, Be on your guard, be on your guard. But I was too excited to listen. It might have been better if I had. I was sizzling with excitement as I ran round and back down on Agnes. It's fun, it's fun, I chortled. You may look harmless, she whispered, but we'll watch you. We'll watch you. She took me quite aback. But even Agnes couldn't complain about our upward journey. We stopped at every station, and the directors got out to admire the arrangements. Everything went well. I forgot about Agnes, and the manager, smiling, joined us on the footplate for the journey home. It looks so easy, Mr. Bobby, he said as we rolled gently down. Can I drive him, please? We were running nicely. First rate, first rate, I hissed happily, gaining speed and all unknowing. I began to bounce. The manager, alarmed, closed my regulator. Too quickly and too much. Agnes's buffers clashed. He's playing tricks. Bump him, girls, bump him. They surged against me, urging me on. I bounced and lurched. I couldn't help it. The manager lost his footing, grabbed wildly for a handhold, and disappeared. Beep, beep, beep! Break guards, please! Mr. Bobby seized my controls, stopped the train and looked back. Two legs waved wildly from a bush. The manager was unhurt, but very cross. I'll not ride that bucking bronco again, he said. He sat in Beatrice for the rest of the journey. The directors complained they'd been badly shaken. They said it was my fault. Renias will take the inspector tomorrow, they ordered. You will stay out of sight in the shed. But late that evening, the manager came. I'm sorry, sir, I did try to be good. It wasn't your fault, Scarlowy. I'm sorry I was cross. We must do what the directors say now, but I'll make it up to you later. The inspector was pleased with Renias. You've done very well, he said kindly, for a new engine. He told the directors about some improvements which were needed. But he went on, on the whole, your arrangements are good. He came to see me, and the directors told him what they thought had happened. I think, gentlemen, he said, that you are mistaken. Scarlowy should prove to be a useful engine. But he needs another pair of wheels. Take my advice and have them fitted. Then you'll see the difference. Good day.
ਕਿੱਥੇ ਕਿ ਨਮਾਜ਼ The manager was as good as his word, Scarlo he continued. I came home from the works with six wheels and a cab. A cab is the latest thing for engines, he told me. I hope it will cheer you up after your disappointment. Renias chuckled. It cheered him up too much. And all silly coaches made him worse. Such a handsome engine, they tittered. Six wheels and a cab, so distinguished, my dears, it's a pleasure to see him. He soon got too big for his wheels. Scarlowy smiled ruefully. Oh, he did too, he said. Go on, Renias. He boasted about his cab till I was tired, said Renias. You should get one like me and be up to date, he would say. No, thank you. You look like a snail with that house on your back. You don't go much faster either. Slow am I, let me tell you. Who was late three times last week? Oh, it's no use talking. You're just an old stick in the mud. He called me more names and we quarreled. We ended up back to back, not speaking. It went on for days and days. One dark Monday morning, Scar Lowy had to take the workman's train to the quarry. It had rained for three days. You always pick on me for wet days, he complained. You, said Mr. Bobby... I've got a cab to keep us dry. Come on. Scarlowy slipped and snorted on the damp rails. He began to wonder if cabs were worth it. An hour later, I was warming up when Scarlowy's guard came coasting down in an empty truck. He stopped by our shed. There's a landslide beyond the tunnel, he said. Scarlowy's will run into it. He's stuck. Show a wheel, Renius. Look lively. I'm sorry, Mr. Peter, sir. But that Scarlow is too swanky. He says I must stick in the mud. He can jolly well stick in the mud himself. It serves him right. That went on my driver. There's poor Mr. Bobby and the quarry men. Does it serve them right too? The guard says the mud's like treacle. Oh dear, I said. That will never do. We must save them before they get sucked in. And off we puffed with two trucks and some workmen. Things weren't too bad after all. The men had partly cleared the line and had levered Scarlowy back. He was hissing and grumbling dreadfully, but we didn't listen to him. We cleared the rest of the line and I pushed Scarlowy out of the way before taking the quarrymen to work. Mr. Bobby cleaned and oiled his wheels in motion, so when I returned with the coaches, I could help him back to the shed. I'm sorry I was swanky, he said at last. Thank you for helping me. Not at all, I said, but I was still cross. Then Scarlowy began to laugh. I'm not stick in the mud after all, he gurgled helplessly. Not you. I laughed too. I couldn't help it. He looked so funny. We were laughing when the cleaners came. We were still laughing when they left. Poor engines, they said, tapping their foreheads. But we weren't mad. We'd learnt sense. And we've been firm friends ever since. It was nearly dark. The listeners stirred and stretched. Thank you, Scarlowy and Renius, they said. Now you've told us about the old days, we can give you both a splendid birthday next week. Duck and Dukes. But I keep telling you, said Duck, there are no Dukes. They were fine and stately, but they've all been scrapped. Peter Sam goggled in horror. This is dreadful, he wailed. The thin controller said the owner said the Duke said... He was coming to our centenary to open our extension round the lake. And now he's scrapped. And Scarlowy's and Renias's birthday will be spoilt. Oh dear, oh dear. He bustled away with his empty coaches to tell his bad news. I think, 
said Scarlowy, that Duck was pulling your wheels. No, Scarlowy, he was quite serious. He always jokes like that, chuckled Scarlowy. But no one agreed. And they argued so loudly that the thin controller came to stop their noise. They told him about Duck, but he paid no attention. I've no time for his nonsense now, he snapped. There's a change in tomorrow's work. Scarlowy, you will meet the Duke at eleven instead of ten-thirty. And he hurried away. If there is a Duke, said Duncan, but they were all too tired to argue any more. They spent a gloomy night, but cheered up next morning when the cleaners greeted the birthday engines with an all-metal band. Drivers and firemen joined in, and even the thin controller banged a metal plate as loudly as anyone. The engines punctuated the music with their whistles. The owner laughed and held his ears. Presently he looked at his watch. That's enough, he ordered. So Rusty, Sir Handel and Duncan went at once to find their coaches. Visitors crowded the big station. They wanted to go to places along the line to watch the celebrations. Peter, Sam and Renias had carefully practised their parts. Passengers in Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima and Beatrice all wore clothes of 1865. Renias had to pull them behind Peter Sam's television train, not too close and not too far away, so that the cameramen could take their pictures. Visitors waved as they went by, and at last they reached the special sidings near the extension, where they settled down to wait. Listen, said Peter Sam at last. Here's Scarlowy. They're cheering him. Good, answered Renias. Perhaps that will make up for his disappointment over the Duke. Scarlowy wasn't disappointed at all. I've brought the Duke. I've brought the Duke. I've brought the Duke, he puffed, and triumphantly came to a stand between the two trains. A distinguished-looking man stepped out, climbed to Scarlowy's footplate, and drove him on the new line round the lake and back again. Then, standing on Scarlowy's front buffer beam, he said, Ladies, gentlemen, and engines, I have pleasure in declaring your lovely lakeside loop line now open. Peter Sam could bear it no longer. Excuse me, Sir Duke, he burst out. Are you real? There was shocked silence. The Duke smiled. Scarlet said you'd been listening to Duck, he answered. Duck thinks Dukes were great western engines. But Dukes are really people. I am happy to assure you, Peter Sam, that I am a real live Duke. I'll give Duck Dukes, muttered Peter Sam, but he was sternly hushed. The Duke turned to the owner. I congratulate you, sir, on your remarkable railway. It must be a record indeed to have two locomotives in regular service and both a hundred years old. Long life, then, and good running to Scarlowy and Renias, your famous old engines. The cheering and clapping died away. Speech, shouted someone, and the cry was taken up. Go on, Renias, whispered the owner. So rather nervously, the old engine began. Thank you, Your Grace, and everyone, for your kind wishes. You've given us both a lovely hundredth birthday. But, Your Grace, Scarlowy and I aren't the only record engines. We've got twin brothers. Tully Flynn and Dolgoch were built at the same time as us. So they're a hundred too. And they're still at work. Their railway is at Tawin in Wales. Please go and see them, Your Grace, and everybody. And wish them many happy returns from Scarlowy and Arrhenius, their little old twins.
the diseasel. Bill and Ben are tank engines who live at a port on Edwards Line. Each has four wheels, a tiny chimney and dome, and a small squat cab. They're kept busy pulling trucks for ships in the harbour and engines on the main line. The trucks are filled with china clay dug from the nearby hills. China clay is important. It's needed for pottery, paper, paint, plastics and many other things. One morning they arranged some trucks and went away for more. They returned to find them all gone. They were most surprised. Their drivers examined a patch of oil. That's a diesel, they said, wiping the rails clean. It's a wattle, asked Bill. A diesel, I think, replied Ben. There's a notice about them in our shed. I remember. Coughs and sneezels spread diseases. Who had a cough in his smoke box yesterday? Farman cleaned it, didn't he? Yes. But the dust made him sneezel, so there you are. It's your fault the diesel came. It isn't. It is. Stop arguing, you two laughed their drivers. Come on, let's go and rescue our trucks. Bill and Ben were aghast. But he'll magic us away like the trucks. Their drivers laughed. He won't magic us. We'll more likely magic him. Listen, he doesn't know you're twins. So we'll take your names and numbers off and then this is what we'll do. Bill and Ben chuckled with delight. Come on, let's go, they said eagerly. Creeping into Edward's yard, they found the diesel on a siding with the missing trucks. Ben hid behind, but Bill went boldly alongside and stood facing the diesel on the points leading out to the main line. The diesel looked up. Do you mind? he asked. Yes, said Bill, I do. I want my trucks, please. These are mine, said the diesel. Go away. Bill pretended to be frightened. You're a big bully, he whimpered. You'll be sorry. He moved over the points, ran back, and hid behind the trucks on the other side. Ben now came forward. The diesel had to stop suddenly. Truck stealer, hissed Ben. He ran away too, and Bill took his place. This went on and on till the diesel's eyes nearly popped out. Stop, he begged. You're making me giddy. The two engines gazed at him side by side. He shut his eyes. Are there two of you? He whispered. Yes, we're twins. I might have known it, he groaned. Just then, Edward bustled up. Bill and Ben, why are you playing here? We're not playing, protested Bill. We're rescuing trucks, squeaked Ben. What do you mean? Even you don't come in our yard without asking, and you only take the trucks we give you. But, they both squeaked indignantly, this diseasel didn't even ask. He just took the lot. There is no cause to be rude, said Edward severely. This engine is a Metropolitan Vickers Diesel Electric Type 2. The twins were abashed. We're sorry, Mr. Uh, uh... Never mind, he smiled. Call me Boko. I'm sorry I didn't understand about the trucks. That's all right, then, said Edward. Off you go, Bill and Ben. Fetch Boko's trucks, then you can take these. The twins scampered away. Edward smiled. There's no real harm in them, he said, but they're maddening at times. Boko chuckled. Maddening, he said, is the word. Buzz, buzz. Boko reached the big station and arranged his trucks. Then he went to the shed and asked politely if he could come in. Duck was not pleased to see a diesel, but presently when he found that Boko knew Edward, he became more friendly. And by the time Boko had told him about Bill and Ben, they were laughing together like old friends. 
Have they ever played tricks on you? asked Boko. Goodness me, yes, chuckled Duck. Edward is the only one who can keep them in order. You know, went on Duck, I sometimes call them the bees. A good name, chuckled Boko. They're killers when it's not buzzing around. Just then, James bustled in. What's that, Duck? Are you terrified of bees? They're only insects after all, so don't let that buzz box diesel tell you different. His name is Boko, and he didn't we... I wouldn't care, interrupted James. If hundreds were swarming round, I'd just blow smoke and make them buzz off. Buzz, 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 retorted Duck. James retired into a huff. James was to pull the express next morning, and when Duck brought his coaches, the platform was crowded. Mind your backs, mind your backs! Two porters were taking a loaded trolley to the front van. Fred drove while Bert walked behind. Careful, Fred, careful, warned Bert, but Fred was in a hurry and didn't listen. Suddenly an old lady appeared in front. Fred stopped dead, but the luggage slid forward and burst the lid of a large white wooden box. Some bees flew out, and just as James came backing down, they began to explore the station. Someone shouted a warning. The platform cleared like magic. The bees were too sleepy to be cross. They found the empty station cold. James's farman was trying to couple the train. They buzzed round him, hopefully. They wanted him to mend their hive. Then they could go back and be warm again. But the farman didn't understand. He thought they would sting him. He gave a yell, ran back to the cab, and crouched with his jacket over his head. The driver didn't understand either. He swatted at the bees with the shovel. The bees, disappointed, turned their attention to James. James's boiler was nice and warm. The bees swarmed round it happily. Buzz off! Buzz off! he hissed. He made smoke, but the wind blew it away, and the bees stayed. At last, one settled on his hot smoke box. It burnt its feet. The bee thought James had stung it on purpose. It stung James back, right on the nose. Eee! whistled James. He'd had enough. So did his driver and farman. They started without waiting for the guard's whistle. They didn't notice till too late that they'd left their train behind. In the end, it was Boko who pulled the express. He was worried at first about leaving his trucks, but Duck promised to look after them, and so it was arranged. He managed to gain back some of the lost time, and the fat controller was pleased with him. No one seemed to notice when James came back to the shed. They were talking about a new kind of beehive on wheels. It was red, they said. Then they all said, buzz, 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 and laughed a lot. James thought that for big mainline engines they were being very silly. <laughs> Thomas's branch line is important, and so is Edward's. They both bring in valuable traffic, but their track and bridges are not so strong as those on the main. That is why the fat controller does not allow the heavier mainline engines, such as Gordon and Henry, to run on them. If, however, you had heard Gordon talking to Edward a short while ago, you would have thought that the fat controller had forbidden him to run on branch lines for quite another reason. It's not fair, grumbled Gordon. What isn't fair, asked Edward, letting branch line diesels pull mainline trains? Never mind, Gordon. I'm sure Boko will let you pull his trucks sometimes. That would make it quite fair. Gordon spluttered furiously. I won't pull Boko's dirty trucks. I won't run on branch lines. Why not? It would be a nice change. The fat controller would never approve, said Gordon loftily. Branch lines are 
vulgar. He puffed away in a dignified manner. Edward chuckled and followed him to the station. Gordon, his driver, and his fireman all say it was the lady's fault. She wore a green floppy hat and was saying goodbye to a friend sitting in the coach nearest the guard's van. It was almost time to start. The fireman looked back. He was new to the job. He couldn't see the guard, but he did see something green waving. He thought it was the flag. Right away, mate, he called. But the guard had not waved his flag. When Gordon started, he left some luggage, several indignant passengers, and the guard all standing on the platform. Every evening, two fast trains leave the big station within five minutes. The 6.25 is Gordon's for the main line. Edwards at 6.30 runs along the branch. By the time Gordon had been brought back, Edwards' train was overdue. You missed your pass, Gordon, said the fat controller crossly. Now we must clear Edwards' train before you can start. This should have put everything right with the least possible trouble. But control at the big station made things worse. They forgot to warn the signalman at Edwards' junction about the change of plan. It was dark by the time the trains reached the junction, and you can guess what happened. Edward went through on the main, while Gordon was switched to the branch. It took the fat controller several hours to sort out the tangle and pacify the passengers. In the end, Gordon was left with his fire drawn, cold and cross, on one of Edward's sidings. Bill and Ben peeped into the yard next morning. They wondered if Boko had brought them some trucks. There were no trucks, but they didn't mind that. Teasing Gordon, they thought, would be much better fun. What's that? asked Bill loudly. Shush, whispered Ben. It's Gordon. It looks like Gordon, but it can't be. Gordon never comes on branch lines. He thinks them vulgar. Gordon pretended he hadn't heard. If it isn't Gordon, said Ben, it's just a pile of old iron, which we'd better take to the scrapyard. No, Bill, this lot's useless for scrap. We'll take it to the harbour and dump it in the sea. Gordon was alarmed. I am Gordon. Stop, stop. The twins paid no attention. Gordon shut his eyes and prepared for the worst. The twins argued loudly and long. Bill favoured the scrapyard, while Ben said that the cutting up in such places was something cruel. It would be kinder, he urged, to give these remains a quick end in the sea. Besides, he went on, they would make a lovely splash. Gordon could not view either prospect with any enthusiasm. Up to that time, he had disapproved of diesels. They were, he considered, ugly, smelly, and noisy. But when he opened his eyes and saw Boko coming into the yard, he thought him the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. Boko, my dear engine, he gasped, save me. Boko quickly sized up the situation and sent Bill and Ben about their business. They were cheeky at first, but Boko threatened to take away the trucks of coal he'd brought for them. That made them behave at once. Gordon thought he was wonderful. Those little demons, he said. How do you do it? Ah, oh, Will, said Boko. It's just a neck. Gordon thinks to this day that Boko saved his life. But we know that the twins were only teasing, don't we? Edward's Exploit Edward scolded the twins severely, but told Gordon it served him right. Gordon was furious. A few days later, some enthusiasts came. On their last afternoon, they went to the China Clay Works. Edward found it hard to start the heavy train. 
Did you see him straining? Asked Henry. Positively painful, remarked James. Just pathetic, grunted Gordon. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. Shut up, burst out Duck. You're all jealous. Edward's better than any of you. You're right, Duck, said Boko. Edward's old, but he'll surprise us all. Bill and Ben were delighted with their visitors. They loved being photographed and took the party to the workings in a brake van special. On the way home, however, the weather changed. Wind and rain buffeted Edward, his sanding gear failed, his wheels slipped, and his farmer rode in front, dropping sand on the rails by hand. Come on! Come on! Come on! panted Edward breathlessly. This is grateful! But there was worse to come. Before his driver could check them, his wheels slipped fiercely again and again. With a shrieking crack, something broke and battered his frame and splashes up and out of shape. The passengers gathered round while the crew inspected the damage. Repairs took some time. One of your crank pins broke, Edward, said his driver at last. We've taken your side rods off. Now you're a single, like an old-fashioned engine. Can you get these people home? They must start back tonight. I'll try, sir, promised Edward. They backed down to where the line was more nearly level. Edward puffed and pulled his hardest, but his wheels kept slipping and he just could not start the heavy train. The passengers were getting anxious. Driver, farmer and guard went along the train, making adjustments between the coaches. We've loosened the couplings, Edward, they said. Now you can pick your coaches up one by one, just as you do with trucks. That will be much easier, said Edward gratefully. So with the farmer sanding carefully in front, the driver gently opened the regulator. Come on, puffed Edward. He moved cautiously forward, ready to take the strain as his tender coupling tightened against the weight of the first coach. The first coach moving helped to start the second, the second helped the third, and so on down the train. I've done it, I've done it, puffed Edward, his wheels spinning with excitement. Steady, boy, warned his driver, skillfully checking the wheels slip. Well done, boy. You've got him, you've got him and he listened happily to Edward's steady beat as he forged slowly but surely up the hill. The passengers were thrilled. Most had their heads out of the windows. They waved and shouted, cheering Edward on. The fat controller paced the platform. Henry, with the special train, waited anxiously too. They heard a beep, beep. Then, battered, weary but unbeaten, Edward steamed in. The fat controller stepped angrily forward. He pointed to the clock. The excited passengers swept him aside. They cheered Edward, his driver and farmer to the echo, before rushing off to get in Henry's train. Henry steamed away to another storm of cheers, but not before everyone knew Edward's story. Edward went thankfully to the shed, while Duck and Boko saw to it that he was left in peace. Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. The fat controller asked Boko to look after Edward's line while he was being mended. Boko was pleased. He worked well, and now they run it together. Bill and Ben still tease him, but Boko doesn't mind. He lives at Edward's station, but is welcome anywhere, for he is now one of the family. Donald and Douglas were the last to accept him, but he often helps with their good strains. And the other day they were heard to remark, for a diesel... Yon Buku's knee is such a bad sort of engine. That, from the Caledonian twins, is high praise indeed. Ballast.
The Fat Controller's Railway has a new look. From end to end, they're clearing old ballast from the track and packing the sleepers with fresh stones. The gangers are pleased. Weeds don't grow in it, they say. And even James has stopped grumbling about dirty sidings. Douglas and Donald disappeared regularly behind the big station, along a line on which none of the others had ever gone. They returned with loaded ballast trains and were most mysterious about it. There are wee engines bring the ballast dune for the hills, was all they would say. Soon the engines could talk of nothing else. James and Henry thought the Vera we engines must be some kind of magic. I don't believe it, said Gordon. Donald and Douglas have pulled our wheels before. But Duck wanted to see for himself, so he asked permission to take some trucks. When he arrived, he was told to push them under the chute. This was like a tunnel made of steel girders. On top of it stood some queer-looking trucks. What do you think of our chute? said a voice. Good, isn't it? Duck blinked. Standing beside him was a small green engine. Where did you spring from? asked Duck. I've been here all the time, smiled the small engine. I'm Rex, and you, I'm sure, are Duck. How did you know? That's easy. There's only one great western engine in these parts. There was a sudden rattling and roaring. Duck's whole train shuddered. What, what, what was that? he asked, startled. That was our chute. The bottoms of these wagons slide out, and the stones fall through the chute into your trucks. We may be small, but we're quite efficient. Duck puffed away, much impressed. Next time there were three small engines. Rex introduced Duck to Bert and Mike. As you can see, he went on, the small controllers give us different coats. Silly nonsense, grumbled Mike. I like being blue, protested Bert. It's all right for you, fumed Mike, but not for me. Passengers all say I look like a pillar box. Shocking, said Rex, and winked at Duck. Consider my feelings. When we were both green, passengers kept calling me Mike. You, you, spluttered Mike. Stow it, you two, said Bert. Duck, he went on. Have you seen our coaches? Where are they? asked Duck. Over there, said Bert. But they're truck, I mean, they're not like ours, he finished lamely. Rex smiled. I agree. They are like trucks. But they behave surprisingly well, says you, put in Mike rudely. They're all right, said Bert, if you treat them right. Besides, passengers like them. They won't use cupboards on a fine day. It's this scenery, you know, trees, mountains and such. Can't understand it myself. But then passengers are queer. You're right there, said Mike. Give me goods trains every time. Do you uh, like trucks? Duck was surprised. Not all of them, smiled Mike. But our big ballast hoppers are different. They run on bogies as sweetly as any coach. We take them to the old mines, fill them up, and run them down here to the chute. The men pull some levers and the whole lot's unloaded before you can say small controller. No trouble at all. How about hot axle boxes? Put in Rex. We soon cured that nonsense. You mean the small controller did? Same thing, grinned Mike. Duck chuckled delightedly. Rex and Mike loved teasing each other. I can't understand, said Duck, why I've never heard about you before. The small engines all answered at once. We've only just come from our railway in England, which closed. Your fat controller asked us to come and fetch ballast for him, and he said he'd bring us plenty of passengers too. Haven't you had passengers before? asked Duck. Only in England. It's our first season here. Oh, promised Duck, then I'll bring you lots. Goodbye. Goodbye! And he puffed excitedly away to see about it.
tit for tat. The engines were being cleaned and polished for the day. Bert, who was going out first, had a tall chimney in his funnel to draw up his fire. We've got visitors today, said his driver. Rex yawned. We have them every day, grunted Mike. But these are special, said the driver. One takes moving pictures, and the other writes books. So mind you all behave. I don't want to be a moving picture in a book, protested Bert. I want to stay as I am. They all tried to explain, but Bert was still muddled when he went to take his train. The visitors were clergymen, one fat, the other thin. They arrived in a little car. Both had cameras. They shook hands with Bert's driver. A small controller, he told them, says you can ride with me in Bert's tender if you like. Thank you, they said. May we come later, please? Just now the sun is shining so nicely that we want to take photographs. Then they asked Bert his name and told him how smart he looked. These visitors, he thought, do at least know how to speak to engines. He puffed away, feeling happier. Wherever the line came near the road, level crossings, bridges, stations, there the two clergymen were, squinting into their cameras. Bert found this rather upsetting. I might wave at an engine, he complained. I can't wave and get good pictures, said his driver. But Bert didn't understand. He thought they were being unfriendly. Poop, poop! The little car shot past them once more. But Bert made no reply. They'll be at the lane next. The lane is a side road. It runs for a short distance alongside the railway. There is no fence. It had rained hard in the night. There were puddles in the lane. The thin clergyman sat in the car. The fat one waited with his camera. He took his pictures, jumped in, and off they went, racing the train to the lane's end. Unluckily, just as they passed Bert, they went through a puddle. Shloosh! Muddy water splashed over Bert's boiler. Ouch! said Bert. But the clergyman didn't know. They were ahead and out of the car. Smiling, they waited for Bert to catch up. Bert wasn't smiling. I did it on purpose, he snorted crossly. They splashed me. They splashed me. Bert hissed, rolling into the last station. Pictures indeed, he grumbled, running round his train. I'm a nice picture, covered in mud. He sizzled crossly when the fat clergyman sat in his tender for the journey back. Driver oughtn't to allow him, after what he's done. Suddenly he stopped sizzling and let off steam. Whoosh! I know, he thought. How to pay the fat one out? It's a lovely plan. I only wish the thin one was there too, he said. But he said it to himself. Bert ran nicely till they reached the woods. The line climbs steeply here. Bert usually rushes the hill. This time he deliberately dawdled. Come on, said his driver, giving him full steam. This was just what Bert wanted. Tit for tat, tit for tat, he shouted, storming up the slope. Rain-soaked branches met close overhead. Bert's blast, shooting straight up, shook them wildly. Showers of water fell on clergyman and driver. Their soaking did not stop till they had topped the rise, and steam could be reduced for the downward run. The small controller soon found out what had happened. He sent Bert back to the shed. You are a very naughty engine, he said sternly. I can't have rudeness to visitors. They splashed me, faltered Bert. I only. That's no excuse. I'm ashamed of you. Bert went sadly away. But he was happy again when Rex and Mike came in. Those visitors are nice, he told them. They came and said sorry. And I said sorry too. Then they cleaned me like driver does. They know lots about engines, he went on. 
The thin one's writing about me in a book. He promised he'd write about you, too. Think of that. Mike's whistle. One morning when he arrived, Duck's whistle was out of order. They had worked late the night before. His driver and farman had used it to boil eggs for their supper. But something had gone wrong. The next morning, when he wanted to whistle, Duck found he could only make burpling noises. He was upset about it. Never mind said his driver. It must be a bit of that egg which broke. We'll clean it out presently when we got time. Meanwhile, no one will mind. But Mike made rude remarks about it. Spree, spree, mimicked Mike. It's shocking. If engines can't whistle properly, they shouldn't try. Then why do you? asked Bert. Why do I what? Try to whistle, of course. Shut up. You're jealous. Mike was proud of his shrill whistle. Mine's better than yours, anyway. Listen, Mike, said Rex. If I had a whistle like yours, do you know what I'd do? He paused impressively. I'd lose it. The idea, spluttered Mike. Whistles are important, let me tell you. Engines without whistles aren't proper engines at all. Mike went redder than ever with fury. His steam pressure went up suddenly, and his safety valves blew off. Whoosh! Hello, said his driver. As you're ready first, you'd better take the passenger. What? And leave my goods? Yes, Bert can do that. We can't have you blowing off in here. Come on. Mike backed down on the coaches, whooshing angrily. When all was ready, he started with a rude jerk. Come on, come on, come on, he puffed. What's bitten him? wondered his driver. He doesn't like coaches, but he's never been as bad as this. Mike whistled loudly at the least excuse. They're jealous, they're jealous, he muttered as he bucketed along. I'll show em, I'll show em. He's in a flaming temper about something, remarked his driver. He was relieved when they reached the end station safely. He looked Mike all over, but saw nothing wrong. He tried to soothe him, but Mike still sizzled crossly. It beats me, he said at last. Then, soon after they had started back, he heard a thin, persistent tinkle. That's something loose on his boiler, he thought. I'll tighten it at the next station. But he never got the chance. It was the cow's fault. She stood on the track, busily cropping grass. She took no notice of the train. Mike stopped. He wasn't frightened. He'd met her before. She only made him cross. He came slowly forward, whooshing steam from his cylinders. Shoo, shoo, shoo. The cow just flicked her tail and went on eating. Mike felt exasperated. He tried whistling. He wanted to say, Get out of my way, you stupid animal! But he didn't get far. His second peep turned into a tremendous whoosh as his whistle cap shot up like a rocket and landed in a field. Driver and guard started to look for it, but some passengers objected. We can't waste time with whistles, they said. We must catch our train. Mike was dismayed. They're aboard saying whistle, he protested. I mustn't pass those without whistling. That's orders. Please find it. Sorry, said the passengers, we can't wait. We have to whistle for you, that's all. And so it was arranged. Whenever they saw a board, guard, driver and passengers all whistled. They made more noise than Mike ever did, and thought it splendid fun. Mike mourned for his lost whistle. Mike hoped his driver would give him a new whistle when they got home. He was disappointed. 
I've no spare whistle, said the small controller sternly. So you'll have to wait. It serves you right for being such a cross patch. Mike worked in the quarries for the rest of the day. It was nearly dark when he reached the shed. What's that? asked Bert as Mike came in. Shh, whispered Rex. Take no notice. It's an improper engine. Why improper? He looks all right to me. It's got no whistle. Oh dear, said Bert. How shocking. We don't approve of his sort, do we? Useful Railway Mike had had trouble with some sheep. He grumbled about them dreadfully. They're silly, said Rex, but they're useful. What? Farmers, went on Rex, sell their wool. What's that? People make clothes from wool. You know, things they wear instead of paint. Quite right, Rex. The engines were startled. The small controller stood in the doorway. The farmers, he went on, want us to take their wool to market. If we do it well, they'll know we're really useful. So you must all do your best. But I don't understand, sir, Bert protested. We can't drive sheep down the line. They wouldn't go straight. Silly, said Rex. We don't drive sheep. We take their wool in bales on trucks. It'll be easy. The small controller laughed. Very well, Rex, he said. You seem to know all about it, so you shall take the first train. They started loading at the lane. Then Rex came gently down the line, stopping at all the farms and level crossings on the way. Nearly finished, said his driver at last. Only one more load, and we're away. But he'd reckoned without Willie and his tractor. Willie was late. He'd been dawdling. Rex's whistle roused him, and he set off at top speed. Your load slipping, someone shouted. Oh dear, thought Willie. I can't stop now. I hope it'll hold. It did, but not quite long enough. Willie dashed into the yard and swept round to bring his trailer alongside the line. The trailer tilted, a strain loosened the ropes, and the topmost wool bales slid sideways to the track. Crumbs, burst out Willie. That's torn it. I well, must warn Rex. He jumped down and ran along the line. Rex's trucks were running nicely. I said it was easy. I said it was easy. He chanted happily to himself. Then everything happened at once. Willie waved and shouted, and behind Willie, through the bridge, Rex glimpsed the bales lying on the track. Stop, 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 he whistled. On, 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 urged the stupid trucks. But Rex's brakes checked them. He groaned and shut his eyes. His front hit something soft. He tilted sideways and found himself off the line, leaning against the cutting side, while his driver felt him all over to find if he was hurt. When the small controller came, Willie said he was very sorry, and with his master's permission he stayed and worked very hard clearing the mess. They put the trucks to rights, and Bert lost no time in taking them away. But Rex had to stay where he was. He didn't like that a bit. Trains kept passing and passengers would point at him and say, Oh, look, there's been an accident. Mike and Bert would laugh and remark how easy it was to pull wool trains. Poor Rex. They lifted Rex to the rails at last and Bert and Mike helped him home. That accident served me right for being swanky. No, said Bert. It wasn't your fault at all. Sorry we laughed. This came from Mike. A small controller was waiting. I'm proud of you all, he said. Thanks to Rex, the accident did little harm. Bert and Mike worked like heroes, and our customers all admire the way we managed. They thought we were a toy railway, but now they say we're really useful. They've promised us plenty more work.
when the wall traffic is done. Tenders for Henry. I'm not happy, complained Gordon. Your firebox is out of order, said James. No wonder, after all that coal you had yesterday. Hard work brings good appetite, snapped Gordon. You wouldn't understand. I know, put in Duck brightly. It's boiler ache. I warned you about that standpipe on the other railway, but you drank gallons. It's not boiler ache, protested Gordon. It's, of course it is, said Henry. That water's bad. It furs up your tubes. Your boiler must be full of sludge. Have a good washout. Then you'll feel a different engine. Don't be vulgar, said Gordon huffily. Gordon backed down on his train, hissing mournfully. Cheer up, Gordon, said the fat controller. I can't, sir. The others say I've got boiler ache, but I haven't, sir. I keep thinking about the dreadful state of the world, sir. Is it true, sir, what the diesels say? What do they say? They boast that they've abolished steam, sir. Yes, Gordon, it is true. What, sir? All my Doncaster brothers drawn the same time as me, all gone. Except one. The guard's whistle blew, and Gordon puffed sadly away. Poor old Gordon, said the fat controller. Hmm, if only we could. Yes, I'll ask his owner at once. He hurried away. Arrangements took time, but one evening Gordon's driver ran back excited. Wake up, Gordon! The fat controller's given you a surprise. Look! Gordon could hardly believe it. Backing towards him were two massive green tenders, and their engine shape was very like his own. It's flying Scotsman, he gasped. The fat controllers brought him to see me. Oh, thank you, sir. Gordon's toot of joy was drowned by flying Scotsman's as he drew happily alongside. Next day, the two engines were photographed side by side. You've changed a lot, smiled flying Scotsman. I had a rebuild at Crewe. They didn't do a proper Doncaster job, of course, but it serves. I had a rebuild, too, and looked hideous. But my owner said I was an extra special engine and made them give me back my proper shape. Is that why you have two tenders being special? No, you'd hardly believe it, Gordon, but over there, there's hardly any coal and water. But surely every proper railway... Exactly. You are lucky, Gordon, to have a controller who knows how to run railways. Everyone got on well with Flying Scotsman, except Henry. Henry was jealous. Tenders are marks of distinction, he complained. Everybody knows that. Why has he got two? He's famous, explained Duck and Donald. He was the second to go 100 miles an hour. Besides, the other railway has no coal and water. Phew, sniffed Henry. I can't believe that. I never boast, he continued, but I always work hard enough for two. I deserve another tender for that. Duck whispered something to Donald. Henry, asked Duck innocently, would you like my tenders? Yours? exclaimed Henry. What have you got to do with tenders? All right, said Duck. The deal's off. Would you like them, Donald? I wouldn't deprive you of the honour. It is a great honour, said Duck thoughtfully, but I'm only a tank engine, so I don't really understand tenders. Perhaps James might... I'm uh, sorry I was rude, said Henry hastily. How many tenders have you, and uh, when could I have them? Six. You can have them this evening. 
Six lovely tinders, chortled Henry. What a splendid sight I'll be. That'll show the others the sort of engine I am. Henry was excited. Do you think it'll be all right? He asked for the umpteenth time. Of course, said Duck. Just go where I told you, and they'll be ready. Meanwhile, word had gone round, and the others waited where they could get a good view. Henry was cheered to the echo when he came, but he wasn't a splendid sight. He had six tenders, true, but they were very old and very dirty. All were filled with boiler sludge. Had a good wash out, Henry, called a voice. That's right, you feel a different engine now. Henry wasn't sure, but he thought the voice was Gordon's. Super Rescue. The two diesels surveyed the shed. It's time, 7101, said one, that we took this railway over, 199. It's their railway, after all. Not for long, persisted 199. Our controller says steam engines spoil our image. Of course we do, snapped Duck. We show what frauds you are. Call yourselves engines? If anything happens, you care nothing for your train. You just moan for a fitter. We bring it home, if only on one cylinder. Nothing, boasted 199, ever happens to us. We are reliable. Vulgar noises greeted this. How rude, said 199. You asked for it, growled 7101. Now shut up. Next day, Henry was rolling home tender first. I'm a failed engine, he mourned. Lost my regulator. Driver says it jammed wide open, and it can't mend it till I'm cool. However, he went on, I've got steam, and driver can use my reverser, but it would happen after Duck fooled me with those tenders. Now they'll laugh at me again. He reached a signal box and stopped, whistling for a road. Opposite the box, on the up line, stood Diesel 199 with a train of oil tankers. Worse and worse, thought Henry. Now old reliable will laugh at me too. The signal man came out. For pity's sake, take this spam can away. It's failed. The Limited is behind. And all he does is wail for his fitter. Spam can, fumed 199. I'm stoic, snapped the signalman, or I'll take my tin opener to you. Now then. 199 subsided at this dreadful threat, and Henry pulled the train out of the way. The diesel didn't help. It just sulked. The Limited rushed by with a growl and a roar. Henry gave a chuckle. Look, spam can, he said. There's your little pal. The diesel said nothing. He hoped 7101 hadn't noticed. 7101 hadn't noticed. He had troubles of his own. He was cross with his coaches. They seemed to be getting heavier. He roared at them, but it did no good. Engines have a pump called an ejector, which draws air out of the train's brake pipes to keep the brakes off. If it fails, air leaks in and the brakes come on, gently at first, then harder and harder. 7101's ejector had failed. The brakes were already leaking on while he passed Henry. He struggled on for half a mile before being brought to a stand, growling furiously, unable to move a wheel. Well, well, well. Did you hear what Signalman said? I thought they'd be laughing at me, chuckled Henry. Now the joke's on them. Moving two dead diesels in their trains, said his driver thoughtfully. That's no joke for a failed engine. Do you think you can do it? I'll have a good try, said Henry with spirit. Anyway, 7101's better than old Spam Can. He did try and shut him up last night. Come on, then, said his driver. 
We mustn't keep the passengers waiting. Get moving, you! Henry puffed the sulky diesel into motion and started to the rescue. Henry gently buffered up to the express. While the two drivers talked, his fireman joined his front brake pipe to the coaches. It's better than we thought, Henry, said his driver. The diesel can pull if we keep the brakes off. So the only weight we'll have is Spancan's goods. Oh, said Henry. That's a mercy. He was by now feeling rather puffed. Poop, 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 poop. Are you ready? Tooted 7101. Peep, 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 peep. Yes, I am, whistled Henry. So with 7101 growling in front and Henry gamely puffing in the middle, the long cavalcade set out for the next big station. Donald and Flying Scotsman were waiting. They cheered as Henry puffed past. He braked the coaches, thankfully. Spam can and the tankers trailed far behind. The passengers buzzed out like angry bees. But the fat controller told them about Henry, so they forgot to be cross and thanked Henry instead. They called him an enterprising engine and took his photograph. They were thrilled, too, when Flying Scotsman backed down on their train. If the guard hadn't tactfully shooed them to their coaches, the train would have started later than ever. Donald took the goods. Return 199 to the other railway, ordered the fat controller. I will write my views later. Henry and 7101 went away together. I'm sorry about last night, ventured the diesel. That's all right. You did shut old reliable up. And, said the diesel ruefully, made a fool of myself today, too. Rubbish. A failed ejector might happen to anyone. I'd lost my regulator. You? Failed? exclaimed the diesel. And yet... His voice trailed away in admiration. Well, said Henry, emergency, you know. Trains must get through. 7101 said no more. He had a lot to think about. Escape. <coughs> Douglas had taken the midnight goods to a station on the other railway. He was shunting, ready for his return journey, when he heard a faint... That sounds like an engine, he thought. The came again. This time it sounded almost despairing. Who's there? he asked. A whisper came. Are you a fat controller's engine? Aye, I'm proud of it. Thank goodness. I'm Oliver. We're escaping to your railway, but we've run out of coal and have no more steam. Is it from scrap you're escaping? Yes. Then it's glad I'll be to help you. But we mourn work fast. Both crews joined in. They took off Oliver's side rods, wrote out transit labels, and chalked scrap everywhere they could. Douglas marshalled Oliver in front of his train. No time to turn round, he panted. A morn run tender first. Yee-hoo! Yee-hoo! yelled a passing diesel. A steam is escaping! Yee-hoo! Douglas puffed firmly on. Take no notice, he counselled. But they were stopped before they could clear the station's throat. The foreman's lamp shone on Oliver. Ah! he exclaimed. A western engine. His light flickered further back. A western auto coach and goods brake too. You can't take these. Can we? No, said Douglas's driver. They're all for us. See for yourself. Douglas's guard showed him the labels and papers. Oliver's crew, hiding in the coach, hardly dared to breathe. Seems in order, said the foreman grudgingly. But it's queer. Sure, and it is, began the guard. But I could tell you queerer. So could I, interrupted the foreman. Right away, guard. 
A near thing, puffed Douglas with relief. We've had worse, smiled Oliver. We ran at night. Friendly signalmen would pass us from box to box when no trains were about. We got on well till Control heard about a mystery train. Then they tried to hunt us down. What did you do? A signalman let us hide on an old quarry branch. Driver, fireman and guard blocked the cutting with rubbish and levered one of the approach rails away. We stayed there for days, with diesels baying and growling like hounds outside. I was very frightened then. Small blame to ye, said Douglas feelingly. Presently they rumbled over the bridge and onto the fat controller's railway. We're home. They can't catch you new. Tell Isabel and Toad, please. Douglas called out the news and heard a joyful tingling, tingling, tingling. He was surprised. Oliver chuckled. That's Isabel, he said. There's a bell on her, you see. She's clever. When we go out together, I pull one way and push the other. When I pull, I can see ahead. When I push, I can't. So Isabel keeps a good lookout and rings her bell to talk to me. Did you know, say? Douglas was impressed. About this dude, he continued. Is he? Who do you wish? said his driver. Yon's the works. We won't slip in unbeknownst and find a place for Oliver. Douglas tried hard to be quiet, but the night foreman heard them and had to be told their secret. I know just the place, he said, and showed them an empty siding nicely hidden away. Oliver said goodbye and thank you, and Douglas puffed away. Yon's an enterprising engine, he thought. I won away here with Donald, but I'd have been feared to do it on my own. Little Weston. Douglas arrived back in time to see Flying Scotsman take his enthusiasts home. The Fat Controller said he had all been honoured and thanked Flying Scotsman and his owner for their help. Please tell everyone, he went on, that whatever happens elsewhere, steam will still be at work here. We shall be glad to welcome all who want to see and travel behind real engines. This announcement was greeted with cheers, and Flying Scotsman departed to the strains of Will You Know Come Back Again, led, as one might expect, by Donald and Douglas. At last Douglas could tell his news. They were all excited about it, and agreed that something must be done for Oliver. I'm feared, said Donald, some murdering diesel may creep in and him there alone, lacking steam even to whistle for help. You're right, said James. He won't be safe till the fat controller knows. Douglas should tell him at once, said Gordon firmly. Is it me speak to the fat controller? It's forward he'd think me, and me be interfering. Well, here he is, said a cheerful voice. Now, oh, what's all this about? Duck broke the awkward silence. Beg pardon, sir. But we do need another engine. I agree, Duck. That is why I am giving 7101 another chance. Their faces showed such dismay that the fat controller had difficulty with his own. Sir, ventured Gordon at last, we had hoped for a real engine. They, said the fat controller gravely, are rare. And unless one escapes, there's little hope. But, sir, burst out Donald, one has... And thanks to Douglas, is now at our works, announced the fat controller. Sir, gasped Douglas, is there anything you don't know? More than you think, he laughed. Oliver's crew told me all you did, Douglas. Oh, sir, you couldn't have seen a bra wee engine and him in trouble and no do a wheel's turn. More than a wheel's turn, I fancy. Douglas, I'm pleased with you. Oliver, Isabel and Toad will soon be ours. Oliver and Isabel are just what we need for Duck's branch line. Loud cheers greeted this announcement. And Toad wants to be your brake van, Douglas. Thank you, sir. I'd hoped for that. 
He and I'll do brawly together. That, of course, made everything right. Henry spoke a good word for 7101, and the others gave him a welcome. He had good manners for a start, so Henry didn't find it hard to teach him our ways. 7101 finds them different from those of the other railway, but much more interesting. He is now quite a useful engine. They teased him at first because of his growls. They said he was like a bear. He still growls, not because he's cross, but because he can't help it. His name, Bear, has stuck. He likes it. It's nicer than just a number, he says. Having a name means that you really belong. The fat controller soon had Oliver, Isabel and Toad mended and painted in full Great Western colours. Then he rescued three more Western auto coaches. Two, Alice and Mirabelle, he gave to Duck. The third, Dulcie, joined Oliver and Isabel. Duck and Oliver are happy on their branch line. It runs along the coast to the small railway. We reopen branches, they boast. They're very proud of this indeed. The others laughed at first and called their branch the Little Western. Duck and Oliver were delighted. And now, no one ever thinks of calling it anything else. Donald's Duck. The Fat Controller has reopened a branch line. It runs along the coast by sandy beaches and seaside towns till it meets the small railway at a port to which big ships come. As Duck had made friends with the small railway engines, the Pat Controller asked him to take charge. Your work in the yard has been good, he said kindly. Would you like to have this branch line for your own? Yes, please, sir, said Duck. Very well, said the Pat Controller. I hope you will work hard and be a credit to me. Duck is very proud of his branch line, and he works very hard. His two coaches, Alice and Mirabelle, are painted in great western colours. They take passengers to the small railway. Duck also has some trucks in which he hauls away the ballast that the small engines bring down from their valley. The fat controller uses this ballast for his railway. Duck can't do all the work himself, so Donald and Douglas take turns to help him. The fat controller has built them a shed at the station by the small railway. Duck felt his responsibility deeply. He talked endlessly about it. You don't understand, Donald, how much the fat controller relies on me. Oh, hey, muttered Donald sleepily. I'm Great Western and... Quack, quack, quack. What? You heard. Quack, quack, you go. Saying you'd an egg laid. Now whisht and let an engine sleep. Quack yourself, said Duck indignantly. He stayed awake wondering how to pay Donald out. At last he said to himself sleepily, I'll ask Driver in the morning. He says, I quack as if I'd laid an egg. Let's pay him out. Quack, do you? His farmer pondered. I know, he said, and whispered. Duck giggled, and his driver slapped his leg in delight. Just right, he said. He dearly loved a joke. That night, when Donald was asleep, they popped something into his water tank. We've done it, they whispered to Duck. I won't hurt her, will I? asked Duck anxiously. Bless you, no. They're both kind men. She'll come to no harm. At 
duckling popped out of Donald's tank at the first water stop. Both driver and farmer goggled with surprise, but Donald laughed. Need do to tell who's behind this, he said, and told them what had happened in the shed. The duckling was tame. She shared the driver's and farmer's sandwiches and rode in the tender, quacking at intervals. The other engines enjoyed teasing Donald about her. Presently, however, she hopped off at a station, and as they couldn't wait to catch her, there she stayed. But before they reached home, Donald and his driver and farmer consulted together and made a plan. That night, Donald's driver and farmer got busy. When Duck's crew arrived to look him over in the morning, they found something which made them laugh till they cried. Look, Duck, they said. Look what was under your bunker. A nest box with an egg in it. Duck peered at it unbelievingly. Donald opened a sleepy eye. You dinner say, he exclaimed. Do you mind what I said, Duck? You must have laid it this night, all unbeknownst. Then Duck laughed too. You win, Donald, he said. It'll take a clever engine to get the better of you. The duckling settled at the station and became a pet with passengers and staff. She carefully inspects all parcels and luggage and sees that the porters stow them properly in the vans. When she wants to swim, she flies to a nearby pond, but always returns to welcome the trains. She stands by the cab, quacking imperiously, till driver or farmer gives her something to eat. Donald is her favourite, and she sometimes allows him to give her rides, but always gets off at her own station. The station master calls her Dilly, but to everyone else, she is always Donald's duck. Resource and Sagacity Oliver is a Great Western tank engine. The other railway wanted to scrap him, so he ran away. Isabel, his faithful coach, came too, and so did Toad, a brake van. At the last moment they were nearly caught, but Douglas saved them. The fat controller was pleased and said that when Oliver was mended, he could help Duck with his branch line. We'll give you all great western colours, like Duck, he said kindly. That will help you to forget your troubles. Oh, thank you, sir, said Oliver happily. Duck's branch starts from the big station. When Oliver started work, he often met other engines there. They all wanted to know about his adventures. Amazing, Henry would remark. Oliver, said James, has resource. And sagacity, put in Gordon. He is an example to us all. You're too kind, giggled Oliver modestly. But he was only a tank engine after all. No big engine had ever said admiring things to him before. I'm sorry to say that it made him puffed up in the smoke box. The fat controller rescued another coach called Dulcie. She trundled along with Isabel. Oliver sang, oh, Isabel's a funny coach, and so is Dulcie, too. If I didn't look after them, they'd not know what to do. Just listen to him. Just listen to him, twittered Dulcie. He's proud. He's conceited. He's heading for trouble, Isabel sadly replied. I feel it in my frames, she shrieked as they rounded a curve. Oliver just laughed. Henry says I'm amazing. He's right. What do I care for trouble? I just push it aside. All trucks are badly behaved, but ballast trucks are worst of all. Donald, Douglas and Duck warned Oliver about this. You think I can't manage, he said huffily. Gordon knows better. He says I'm sagacious. You may be good gracious, but say no more, Duck. It's maybe a pity, but the wee engine will just have to learn. Today, 
Oliver took the trucks by himself for the first time. He pulled the loaded ones to a siding and pushed empties to the chute. Then he came back full of confidence to take the loaded wagons away. The loaded trucks were comfortable and didn't want to move. They had just realized, too, that they had a different engine. Duck, we know, they grumbled. And Donald and Douglas. What right has Oliver to poke his funnel in here? Look sharp, puffed Oliver. Smart as her. That's not the way to speak. Pay him out. The trucks moved off easily, and Oliver thought he had them in control. Trucks, he told himself proudly. Don't play tricks on me. I'll arrange them on the middle road and start away as soon as Duck arrives. I can't understand why he says they're so troublesome. They reached the station's throat. Oliver's brakes came on with a groan. But brakes were useless against loaded, surging trucks. They pushed forward, yelling, On, 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 on! Oliver fought hard, but still they forced him on and on and on. Their efforts slackened at last. I'm winning, he gasped. If only... But it was too late. One moment his rear wheels were on the rails, the next they had none, and he was bunkered down in the turntable well, with a deluge of ballast all round him. When Duck arrived, he was stopped outside the station and flagged to the platform. He surveyed the wreckage. Hello, Oliver, he remarked. Are you being a good, gracious engine? Big pardon, of course, but we don't really like that sort of surprise. Donald and Douglas will miss their turntable. Later that day, Donald and Douglas spoke pungently in Scots, and the fat controller spoke pointedly in English. All three left Oliver in no doubt at all, but so far from being sagacious, he was a very silly engine. Toad stands by. When Oliver came home again, the trucks sang rude songs. They were led by Scruffy, a private owner wagon. Oliver's no use at all, thinks he's very clever, says that he can manage us, that's the best joke ever. When he orders us about with the greatest folly, we just push him down the well. Pop! Goes old Ollie. The engines bumped them. Shut up, they ordered. But they couldn't be everywhere. And everywhere they weren't, the trucks began again. At last they gave it up. We're sorry, Oliver, they said. It's really my fault, he answered sadly. I'm worried, Mr. Douglas, said Toad next morning. This nasty spirit of disrespect for engines. Where's it going to end? Dear knows, said Douglas gloomily. It must be stopped before it gets worse. I believe Mr. Oliver can do it. Maybe so, but how? I have a plan, Mr. Douglas. May I stay here today and help him? We are both great western and must stand together. Would you ask him before you go to favour me with a word? I'll take you to him, but he's all small for the work you have in mind. No, Duck, Toad's right. This trouble's my fault, and I must put it right. I meant no disrespect, you understand. Of course not, Toad. Anyway, driver says the same, and he's arranged it with Station Master. Very well, Oliver, but I must hurry. My passengers will be waiting. Don't forget Stepney's tip about sand. Lay it on the rails as you back down, and roll it firm with your wheels. You get a splendid grip that way. Good luck. We three will be there to cheer you on while you give those trucks a lesson. So long, smiled Oliver bravely, but he felt dreadfully nervous inside. I expect, Mr. Oliver, you'll want me on the middle road as a stop block, like. Uh, yes, please. Oliver marshalled the worst trucks two by two in front of Toad. 
This way, Mr. Oliver, takes longer, but they can't give trouble. And if you leave that scruffy till last, you'll have him behind you. Then you can bump him if he starts his nonsense. Duck arrived to find them ready and waiting. Three cheers for Oliver and Toad, he called. Alice and Mirabel responded with a will, and so wonderingly did the passengers. Oh, back, whispered Scruffy. The trucks giggled as they passed the word. Oliver dug his wheels into the sand and gave a mighty heave. Whoa, groaned Scruffy. His couplings tightened. He was stretched between Oliver and the trucks. I don't like this. Go it, yelled Duck. Well done, boy. Well done. Ow, ow, wailed Scruffy, but no one bothered about him. Ow, ow, I'm, I'm coming apart. There came a rending, splitting crash. Oliver shot forward suddenly. Scruffy's front end bumped behind his bunker, while Scruffy's load spread itself over the track. Well, Oliver, so you don't know your own strength. Is that it? No, no, no sir, said Oliver nervously. The fat controller inspected the remains. As I thought, he remarked, rotten wood, rusty frames, unserviceable before it came. He winked at Oliver and whispered, don't tell the trucks that. Bad for discipline. He strode away, chuckling. Nowadays, Oliver only takes trucks when the other engines are busy. But they always behave well. Take care with Mr. Oliver, they warn each other. He's strong, he is. You play tricks on him, and he'll likely pull you in half. It was bank holiday morning. The small railway engines were working hard. Their station was crowded. No sooner had one train started than another was filled with people waiting to go. Duck, Oliver, Donald and Douglas were busy too. But they hadn't brought everybody. The yard was full of parked cars and coaches. Duck was waiting for his next turn. Alice and Mirabel complained of the heat, so he backed them into the good shed while he basked outside in the sun. Near him stood a huge red bus. He had never seen it before. The bus watched the passengers happily milling round the small railway. Stupid nonsense, he grumbled. Wouldn't have brought him if I'd known. I'd have had a breakdown or something. I'm glad you didn't, smiled Duck. You'd have spoilt their fun. Look how they're enjoying themselves. Pa, snorted the bus. Enjoyment's all you engines live for. Taking the petrol from the tanks of us workers. Come the revolution, he went on fiercely. Railways will be ripped up. Cars and coaches will trample their remains. Free the roads, he growled. Free the roads from railway tyranny. At the passing station, Duck told Oliver about the bus. I call him Bulgy, he chuckled. He's painted bright red and shouts down with railways. But next time they met, Oliver didn't laugh. Bulgy's friend has come, he said. He's red and rude, too. He's taking Bulgy's passengers home, so as to leave him free to steal ours. But he can't, objected Duck. Ours want to go to the big station. Bulgy bets he can get there before us. Rubbish. It's much further by road. Oliver looked anxious. Yes, but Bulgy says he knows a short cut. That evening, Donald, Oliver and Duck were preparing for the homeward rush. Duck's train was to be first out, but he had few passengers. He was soon to know why. Look, shrilled Oliver, look at Bulgy. He's a mean scarlet deceiver. Bulgy had turned to leave. They could now see his other side. It had on it railway bus. Stop, yelled staff and engines, but too late. Yah, boo, snubs jeered Bulgy. He roared away. The unsuspecting passengers waved happily. Come on, puffed Duck. He, Alice and Mirabel, trundled unhappily away. Alice and Mirabel chattered crossly. The nasty old thief. He's stolen our people. Duck wondered how to pay Bulgy out. Then, far ahead, a man clambered up the embankment, waving a red scarf. Danger, he shouted. The line here crosses a narrow road. Duck 
came as close as he could. So this was Bulgy's shortcut, he chuckled. Bulgy was wedged under the bridge. Drivers of cars trapped in front and behind were telling him what they thought. Angry passengers cornering the conductor demanded their money back. From time to time, loosened bricks fell, making Bulgy yelp. Bulgy's passengers swarmed round Duck. He tricked us, they complained. He said he was a railway bus, but wouldn't accept our return tickets. He wanted us to think railways are no good. Please help us. Duck's crew examined the bridge. It's risky, they said, but we must help the passengers. Passengers are urgent, agreed Duck. Besides, he chuckled, it'll pay Bulgy out. They laughed and told the passengers to wait on the other side of the bridge. Stop, wailed Bulgy. It might fall on me. That, said Duck severely, would serve you right for telling whoppers. Bulgy howled as he felt the bridge quiver, but it didn't collapse. Duck made good time to the big station, and all passengers caught their trains. The fat controller arranged a shuttle service on the branch. Passengers changed trains at Bulgy's bridge. Bulgy had to stay till it was mended, but he never learnt sense. He told whoppers till no one could believe his destination boards, and no passengers would travel in him. He's a hen house now, in a field beside the railway. If he still tells whoppers, they can do no harm. The hens never listen to them anyway. Puff. Once upon a time, three little engines lived in their own little shed on their own little railway. Duke was brown, Falcon blue, and Stuart green. Duke was the oldest. He had been the first engine on the line, and named after the Duke of Sodor. He was proud of this, and wanted everything just so. Whenever the others did anything they shouldn't, he would say, that would never suit his grace. Other engines came and went, but Duke outlasted them all. Stuart and Falcon used to call him Grand Puff. Duke was fond of them and tried to keep them in order. They were fond of him too, as he was so wise and kind. But they did get tired of hearing about his grace. Sometimes they would wink at each other and chant solemnly, Engines come and engines go, Grand Puff goes on forever. You impertinent scallywags, Duke would say indignantly. Whatever are young engines coming to nowadays? Never mind, Grand Puff, we're only young once. Well, you'd better mind, unless you want to end up like number two. Oh, Grand Puff, whatever happened? Number two, said Duke, was American and very cocky. He rode roughly and often came off the rails. I warned him to be careful. Listen, bud, he drawled. In the States, we don't care a dime for a few spills. We do here, I said. But he just laughed. But he didn't laugh when the manager took away his wheels and said he was going to make him useful at last. What, why? What, what, what did he do? He turned him into a pumping engine. That's what. He's still there, behind our shed. Stuart and Falcon were unusually good for several days. Stuart and Falcon became useful engines, and all three were happy together for many years. But hard times came, the mines closed one by one, and the engines had little to do. At last their line was closed, and people came to buy the engines. We'll take Stuart and Falcon, they said. But no one wanted Duke. They thought him too old. Cheer up, Grandpuff, called Stuart, as they went away. 
We'll find a nice railway, and then you can come and keep us in order. They all laughed bravely, but not one of them thought it would ever come true. Duke's driver and farman oiled and greased him. They sheeted him snugly and said goodbye. They had to go away and find work. Duke was alone, locked up in the shed. Where's his grace? he wondered. It's not like him to forget me. But his grace had been killed in the war, and the new duke, a boy, hadn't heard of his little engine. Oh, well, said Duke to himself. I'll go to sleep. It'll help to pass the time. Years passed. Winter torrents washed soil from the hills over the shed. Trees and bushes grew around. You wouldn't have known a shed was there, let alone a little engine asleep inside it. Have you guessed about Stuart and Falcon? Yes, you're right. They came to the Thin Controllers Railway. He gave them new coats and new names. Stuart became Peter Sam, and Falcon, Sir Handel. They prefer their new names. That was a long time ago, but they never forgot Grand Puff. They often talked about him when alone. They were excited to hear that the Duke was coming to Scar Lowy's and Renias's hundredth birthday, but most disappointed with the Duke who actually came. For he was only a man. But we must say no more, or we'll spoil the next story. Bulldog. Ever since Scar Lowry and Renias had their hundredth birthday, Peter Sam had been worried. He kept on saying that the real Duke never came. Rubbish, said Duncan. Of course he was real. All the same, Peter Sam persisted. He wasn't our Duke. Our Duke, said Sir Handel. He's an engine. You're as bad as he is. All engine dukes were scrapped. Ask Duck. Duck doesn't know everything, Starlowy put in quietly. Tell us about him, you two. Here is one of the stories that Peter Sam and Sir Handel told about Grandpuff. It happened when Sir Handel was new to the line. Now, have you remembered that in those days he was called Falcon and painted blue? You have. Now we can begin. The manager came to see him one day and said he was pleased with his work so far. Now, Falcon, he went on, you must learn the mountain road. Yes, please, sir, said Falcon, excited. So tomorrow you shall go double-heading on it with Duke. He'll explain everything. Falcon didn't like this. He thought Duke was a fusspot and a regular old fuddy-duddy. Duke's train was one for holidaymakers. He called it the picnic. Falcon was ready when Duke arrived. Duke drew forward beside him. Listen, he said, the mountain road is difficult. You take the train, and I'll couple in front. No, said Falcon, I'll lead. How can I learn the road with you lumbering ahead, blocking the view? Suit yourself, said Duke shortly, but never mind the view. Attend to the track. Look at the track, he puffed again on starting. Never mind the view. Fuss pot, fuss pot, puffed Falcon on starting. Fuddy duddy, fuddy duddy, fuddy duddy. They rattled through the first tunnel, looped round, recrossed the river, and entered the second, climbing all the time. Their speed grew slower and slower. Don't dawdle, don't dawdle, urged Falcon. No hurry, no hurry, puffed Duke stolidly. The tunnel was curved and pitch dark. Falcon felt stifled. He wanted to get out. Presently the light grew. Two ribbons of track appeared ahead in the gloom. Watch the track! Watch the track! warned Duke. Puss pot! Puss pot! scoffed Falcon. The tunnel mouth grew larger and larger, till at last they burst into the sunshine. The line here swung sharply right. It was laid on a ledge cut in the hillside. Below lay the valley up which they had come. 
Kraken buildings look tiny, like toys. No one quite knows what happened next. Duke said there must have been something on the track, and Falcon hadn't kept a good lookout. Falcon said he was dazzled, so how could he keep a good lookout? Anyway, their coaches had barely cleared the tunnel when Falcon lurched. His front wheels derailed, crunched over sleepers and ballast. He came to rest with one wheel uncomfortably near the edge. Dew could save Falcon. Now he held on grimly with locked wheels and taut couplings. Young idiot, he hissed. Stop it! I can't hold you if you shake. Falcon tried hard to stop shuddering. Quickly, Duke's driver and fireman chopped his wheels and strengthened the coupling between the two engines. Thank you, said Duke. Now I'll manage. With Duke secure, the two crews, helped by a plate layer, propped up Falcon's front end. They were looking forward to a rest when Duke began wheezing in an alarming way. His fireman ran to his cab. Water, he cried. We want water, quickly. The plate layer's cottage stood nearby. He explained to his wife, and the passengers borrowed jugs, buckets, kettles, saucepans, anything, in fact, which would hold water. They formed a chain from the wells of the engine and passed them from hand to hand. The fireman, meanwhile, reduced his fire and anxiously watched the gauge. It was hot and tiring work, for Duke needed many gallons. But at last the fireman shouted cheerfully, We're winning! Don't weaken! And they all set to work again with a will. They cheered again when the breakdown gang arrived. They showed other passengers how to help them lever Falcon back to the rails. The manager was at the top station. He said he was sorry about the accident and thanked the passengers for their help. Not at all, they said. We admired the way you put things right and enjoyed the adventure. They thanked Duke and his crew for preventing a nasty accident. Your Duke, they said, is a hero. He stood firm like a bulldog and just wouldn't let go. Falcon said thank you, too. I don't know why you bothered after I'd been so rude. Oh, well, replied Duke. You just had a new coat of paint. It would have been a pity if you rolled down the mountain and spoilt it. That would never have suited his grace. You can't win. Duke's picnic was a train for summer visitors. It was his special train. Many people came year after year just to see him. He always pulled it, even if he felt poorly. I mustn't disappoint my friends, he would say. That would never suit his grace. The morning run gave no trouble. He took his passengers up the line and stopped anywhere they wanted. He and his driver knew all the best places for picnics. Beep, 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 he whistled as they waved goodbye. Please don't be late when I come back. We might miss the boat, and that would never do. One day, Duke felt poorly at the end of his first picnic journey. He'd been short of steam and was glad of a rest before starting back. His driver and fireman had just finished cleaning his tubes when Stuart bustled in. Hello, Grandpuff. Are you short of puff? Nothing of the sort. Routine maintenance. Tell you what, Grandpuff, you're getting old. You need to take care. We'll have to keep you in order, or one day you'll break down. Ha! said Duke. That'll be the day. You keep me in order. Impudence. He puffed away, whooshing crossly from his drain cocks. Duke couldn't stay cross for long. It was a lovely evening. All the picnic parties were ready, the coaches ran well, and they lost no time anywhere. Couldn't be better. Couldn't be better, he chunted happily. They began to climb. The work was harder, but Duke didn't mind. I've plenty of steam, he panted. We'll be up in a couple of puffs. 
He needed more than that, though. His puffs changed to wheezes. It's not so easy. It's not so easy. My old valves would start glowing now. And I'll manage. I'll manage. But the leaks became worse. And soon he was... <coughs> hoarsely, with escaping steam. Duke's driver examined him carefully at the next station, while a guard went to telephone. Anxious passengers gathered round. Two engines are coming, the guard reported. With luck, we'll be away in fifteen minutes. You'll easily catch your boat. Falcon buffered up in front. Poor old Grandpa, he hushed importantly. What a shame you've broken down. Peep, 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 peep. This is the day, whistled Stuart cheekily. He was coupled on behind. Peep, 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 are you ready, whistled Falcon. Peep, 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 yes I am, replied Stuart. And away they went. Falcon had left his train at the middle station. Arrived there, the cavalcade split up. Falcon went down to the port with Duke's picnic, while Stuart headed Falcon's train with Duke couple behind. Stuart was excited. Fancy me rescuing Grandpa! This is the day! This is the day! This is the day! He chortled gleefully. Poor Grandpa! he thought. He's much too old. We'll have to keep him in order now. Kindly, but firmly, that's it. We'll allow him to have runs sometimes, but Falcon and I'll do the real work. Grandpa will be cross, but we can't help that. Poor old engine, poor old engine, he puffed kindly. Duke was by no means crippled. His valves sounded worse than they were. He could have kept his train, but his driver said, No, our passengers will only be worried. Duke agreed. He didn't want to spoil their day. He listened to Stuart chortling and smiled. He and his driver had their own joke ready. At first they used just enough steam to keep moving, but the last half mile was uphill. Now, said his driver. He advanced the regulator and Duke responded with a will. He puffed and roared as though the whole train's weight was on his buffers. People heard the noise from far away. They ran to see what was happening. At the work station, Duke uncoupled and went along the loop to the water tank. A boy on the platform asked, Why were there two engines on this train, Daddy? It's most unusual. It is, said his father. But today was different. Stuart broke down, you see, and they had to call Duke out to help him. Duke had a hard job, too, by the sound of it. Well, for crying out loud, exclaimed Stuart. He vanished in a cloud of steam. Duke wheezed alongside. <laughs> Poor old engine, he chuckled. It's no good, Stuart. You can't win. Sleeping Beauty Duke's story soon spread. The engines told Mr. Hugh, Mr. Hugh told the thin controller, the thin controller told the owner, the owner told his grace, his grace told the small controller, the small controller told the thin clergyman, and the thin clergyman told the fat one. That's why one morning, the two clergymen and the small controller were looking at maps. Our railway, said the small controller, is laid on the bed of the old one, but swings round to end at the road south of that village. The old line kept straight on. It went north of the village and then to the mountains. The maps show the works at the old station. If Duke is anywhere, He's there. Are you writing another book, sir? Yes, said the thin clergyman. But not about you. He smiled at their downcast faces. Cheer up, he went on. It's about a nice old engine who is lost. But if you're good, the artist might put you in the pictures. Oh, thank you, sir. So the clergyman told them about Duke and Falcon and Stuart. So you see, he continued, 
Poor Duke was left alone. Three small engines sighed sympathetically. And we want to find him and mend him and make him happy again. Your controller wants to help, but he can't if you're naughty. Three small engines promised to be as good as gold. The three men spent days and days at the old station. They came up every morning on Bert's train. He always whistled good luck as they walked up the track, but they had nothing in the evening except scratches and torn clothes. They wouldn't give up, though. Duke's there somewhere, they said. The fat clergyman found him in the end. Scrambling over a hillock, he trod on something which wasn't there, crashed through a hole, and landed legs astride on Duke's saddle tank. Our sleeping beauty himself, he shouted. The thin clergyman and the small controller peeped through the hole above. Excuse me, inquired Duke. Are you a vandal? Driver told me vandals break in and smash things. The fat clergyman ruefully felt his bruises. Bless you, no, he laughed. I'm quite respectable. I dropped in because I couldn't find your door. And he told Duke about Falcon and Stuart. So they did remember, said Duke softly. Then, does his grace approve? Yes, he's coming. To see me. How kind. And I'm all dirty. That will never do. Oh, please clean me. So they set to work. And by the time the small controller had fetched his grace, Duke was the cleanest of anyone in the shed. Early next morning, Mike brought workmen and tools. They enlarged the fat clergyman's hole, lifted Duke out, and put him on a low loader to take him away by road. I'd be ashamed, Duke protested, to travel by road. It's, it's, it's undignified. I'm sorry, Duke, said his grace, but the small railway has no suitable trucks. Duke gave in then, but so many people came out and greeted him that he felt better. So they still remember me, he thought happily. Donald was waiting with a flat truck. Everyone cheered when Duke was lifted onto it, and still more when he started along the big railway on the last stage of his journey to his new home. Peter, Sam and Sir Handel were on early turn. They peeped out of the shed. He's there, they whispered. Shh, shh, shh. Duke opened his eyes. You woke me, he grumbled. In my young days, engines were seen and not heard, Grandpuff, remember? I remember, said Duke. Two idle good-for-nothings called Falcon and Stuart. Good for you, Grandpuff. We're glad you've come. We can keep you in order now. Keep me in order? Impertinence. Be off. The pair chuffed away, well content. Impudent scallywags, murmured Duke. But his old eyes twinkled, and for the first time in years he smiled as he dozed in the sun. Ghost Train And every year on the date of the accident it runs again plunging into the gap shrieking like a lost soul Percy, what are you talking about? The Ghost Train Driver saw it last night Where? asked Thomas and Toby together he didn't say, but it must have been on our line. He says ghost trains run as a warning to others. Oh, he went on, it makes my wheels wobble to think of it. Pooh, said Thomas, you're just a silly little engine, Percy. I'm not scared. Thomas didn't believe in your ghost, said Percy next morning. His driver laughed. Neither do I. It was a pretend ghost on television. Percy was disappointed. 
but he was too busy all day with his stone trucks to think about ghosts. That evening he came back, light engine, from the harbour. He liked running at night. He coasted along without effort, the rails humming cheerfully under his wheels, and signal lights changing to green at his approach. He always knew just where he was, even in the dark. Crow's Farm Crossing, he chunted happily. We shan't be long now. <whistles> Sam had forgotten that Mr. Crow wanted a load of lime taken to Forty Acre Field. When he remembered, it was nearly dark. He drove in a hurry, bumped over the crossing, and sank his cart's front wheels in mud at the field gate. The horse tried hard, but couldn't move it. The cart's tail still fouled the railway. Sam gave it up. He unharnessed the horse and rode back to the farm for help. There's still time, he told himself. The next train isn't due for an hour. But he'd reckoned without Percy. Percy broke the cart to smithereens, and lime flew everywhere. They found no one at the crossing, so went on to the nearest signal box. Hello, said the signalman. Why are you going to Percy? He's white all over. Percy's driver explained. I'll see to it, said the signalman. But you'd better clean Percy, or people will think he's a ghost. Percy chuckled. Do let's pretend I'm a ghost and scare Thomas. That'll teach him to say I'm a silly little engine. On their way, they met Toby, who promised to help. Thomas was being oiled up for his evening train, when Toby hurried in, saying, Percy's had an accident. Poor engine, said Thomas. Botheration. That means I'll be late. They cleared the line for you, Toby went on. But there's something worse. Out with it, Toby, Thomas interrupted. I can't wait all evening. I've just seen something, said Toby in a shaky voice. It looked like Percy's ghost. It said it was, was coming here to warn us. Pooh, who cares? Don't be frightened, Toby. I'll take care of you. Percy approached the shed quietly and glided through it. Peep! 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 He shrieked. As had been arranged, Toby's driver and farmer quickly shut the doors. Let me in! Let me in! said Percy in a spooky voice. No, no, answered Toby. Not by the smoke of my chimney, chim, chim. I'll chaff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. Oh, oh dear, exclaimed Thomas. It's getting late. I've no idea. I must find Annie and Clarabelle. He hurried out the other way. Percy was none the worse for his adventure. He was soon cleaned, but Thomas never returned. Next morning, Toby asked him where he'd been. Oh, well, said Thomas, I knew you'd be sad about Percy, and uh, I didn't like to um, intrude. I slept in a good shed, and, uh, oh, uh, he went on hurriedly, sorry, I uh, can't stop, I uh, got to see a coach about a train, and he shot off like a jackrabbit. Percy rolled up alongside. Well, 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 he exclaimed. What do you know about that? Anyone would think chuckled Toby, that our Thomas had just seen a ghost. Woolly Bear Gangers had been cutting the line-side grass and cocking it. The fat controller sells the hay to hill farmers who want winter feed for their stock. At this time of year, when Percy comes back from the harbour, he stops where they have been cutting. The men load up his empty wagons and he pulls them to Farker. Toby then takes them to the hills. The farmers collect the hay from Toby's top station. When in the wagons, the hay is covered to prevent it blowing about. But on the line side, 
It is stacked in the open air to dry. Whee! Percy gave his ghostly whistle. Don't be frightened, Thomas, he laughed. It's only me. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone, said Thomas crossly. You're like... Ugly indeed! I'm... A green caterpillar with red stripes, continued Thomas firmly. You crawl like one too. I don't. Who's been late every afternoon this week? It's the hay. I can't help that, said Thomas. Time's time. And the fat controller relies on me to keep it. I can't if you crawl in the hay till all hours. Green caterpillar indeed, fumed Percy. Everyone says I'm handsome. Or at least nearly everyone. Anyway, my curves are better than Thomas's corners. He took his trucks to the harbour and spent the morning shunting. Thomas says I'm always late, he grumbled. I'm never late. Or at least only a few minutes. What's that to Thomas? He can always catch up time further on. All the same, he and his driver decided to start home early. It was most unfortunate that just before they did, a crate of treacle was upset over him. They wiped the worst off, but he was still sticky when he puffed away. The wind rose as they puffed along. Soon it was blowing a gale. Look at that, exclaimed his driver. The wind caught the piled hay, tossing it up and over the track. The gangers tried to clear it, but more always came. The line climbed here. Take a run at it, Percy, his driver advised. So whistling warningly, Percy gathered speed. But the hay made the rails slippery, and his wheels wouldn't grip. Time after time he stalled with spinning wheels and had to wait till the line ahead was cleared before he could start again. The signal man climbed a telegraph pole. The station master paced the platform. Passengers fussed, and Thomas seized impatiently. Ten minutes late. I warned him. Passengers will complain. And the fat controller. The signalman shouted. The station master stood amazed. The passengers exclaimed and laughed as Percy approached. Sorry, I'm late, Percy panted. So I should hope, scolded Thomas. But he spoilt the effect as Percy drew alongside. Look what's crawled out of the hay, he chortled. What's wrong? asked Percy. Talk about hairy caterpillars, puffed Thomas as he started away. It's worth being late to have seen you. When Percy got home, his driver showed him what he looked like in a mirror. Bust my buffers, exclaimed Percy. No wonder they all laughed. I'm just like a woolly bear. Please clean me before Toby comes. But it was no good. Thomas told Toby all about it. And instead of talking about sensible things like playing ghosts, Thomas and Toby made jokes about woolly bear caterpillars and other creatures which crawl about in hay. They laughed a lot. But Percy thought they were really being very silly indeed. <laughs> Mavis. Mavis is a diesel engine belonging to the Farker Quarry Company. They bought her to shunt trucks in their sidings. She is black and has six wheels. These, like Toby's, are hidden by side plates. Mavis is young and full of her own ideas. She is sure they are better than anybody else's. She loves rearranging things and put Toby's trucks in different places every day. This made Toby cross. Trucks, he grumbled, should be where you want them, when you want them. Fudge, said Mavis, and flounced away. At last Toby lost patience. I can't waste time playing hunt the trucks with you, he snapped. Take them yourself. Mavis was delighted. Taking trucks made her feel important. At Farker she met Daisy. Toby is an old fusspot. She complained. Daisy liked Toby, but was glad of a diesel to talk to. Steam engines, she said, have their uses, but they don't understand. Toby says only steam engines can manage trucks properly. What rubbish! 
put in Daisy. They knew nothing about trucks. Depend upon it, my dear. Anything the steam engines do, we diesels can do better. Toby's line crosses the main road behind Farker Station, and for a short way follows a farm lane. The rails here are buried in earth and ashes almost to their tops. In wet weather, animals, carts and tractors make the lane muddy and slippery. Frost makes the mud rock hard. It swells it too, preventing engine wheels from gripping the rails properly. Toby found this place troublesome. So when Frost came, he warned Mavis and told her just what to do. I can manage, thank you, she said cheekily. I'm not an old fusspot like you. The trucks were tired of being pushed around by Mavis. It's slippery, they whispered. Let's push her around instead. On, 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 they yelled as Mavis reached the stop board. But Mavis had heard about Percy and took no chances. She brought them carefully down to the lane and stopped at the level crossing. There, her second man halted the traffic while the guard unpinned the wagon brakes. One in the headlamp for fusspot Toby, she chortled. She looked forward to having a good giggle about it with Daisy. But she never got her giggle. She was so sure she was right that she'd stopped in the wrong place. In frosty weather, Toby stops before reaching the lane, and while some of his trucks are still on the slope. This ensures that they can't hold him back, and their weight helps him forward till his wheels can grip again. But Mavis had given the trucks the chance they wanted. Hold back, hold back, they giggled. Crawl up, ordered Mavis. The trucks just laughed, and a wheel spun helplessly. She tried backing, but the same thing happened. They sanded the rails and tried to dig away the frozen mud, but only broke the spade. Cars and lorries tooted impatiently. Gah! wailed Mavis in helpless fury. I warned her, fumed Toby. I told her just where to stop. I can manage, she said, and call me an old fusspot. She's young yet, soothed his driver. And she can manage her trucks herself. They're your trucks, really, his driver pointed out. Mavis isn't supposed to come down here. It's a fat controller. You wouldn't tell, would you? Of course not. Well then, but, his driver went on, if we don't help clear the line, he'll soon know all about it. And so shall we. Hmm, yes, said Toby thoughtfully. An angry farmer was telling Mavis just what she could do with her train. Toby buffered up. Having trouble, Mavis? I am surprised. Good! said Mavis. With much puffing and wheel slip, Toby pushed the trucks back. Mavis hardly helped at all. The hard work made Toby's fire burn fiercely. He then reversed, stopping at intervals while his farmer spread hot cinders to melt the frozen mud. Goodbye, he called as he reached the crossing. You'll manage now, I expect. Mavis didn't answer. She took the trucks to the sheds and scuttled home as quickly as she could. Toby's tightrope. The manager spoke to Mavis severely. You are a very naughty engine. You have no business to go jauntering down Toby's line instead of doing your work up here. It's that Toby, protested Mavis. He's a fussman. He... Toby has forgotten more about trucks than you will ever know. You will put the trucks where he wants them and nowhere else. But there are no buts, said the manager sternly. You will do as you are told or else. Mavis stayed good for several days. Mavis soon got tired of being good. Why shouldn't I go on Toby's line, she grumbled. She started making plans. At the top station, the siding arrangements were awkward. To put trucks where Toby wanted them, Mavis had to go backwards and forwards, taking a few at a time. If, she suggested to her driver, we use the teeniest bit of Toby's line, we could save all this bother. Her driver, unsuspicious, spoke to the manager. 
who allowed them to go as far as the first level crossing. Mavis chuckled, but she kept it to herself. Frost hindered work in the quarry, but a thaw made them busy again. More trucks than ever were needed. Some trains were so long that Mavis had to go beyond the level crossing. This gave her ideas, and a chance to go further down the line without it seeming her fault. Can you keep a secret? she asked the trucks. Yes, 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 they chattered. Will you bump me at the level crossing and tell no one I asked you? The trucks were delighted and promised. It was unfortunate that Toby should have arrived while Mavis was elsewhere and decided to shunt them himself. They reached the level crossing and Toby's brakes came on. This was the signal for the trucks. On, 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 they yelled, giving him a fearful bump. His driver and farman, taken unawares, were knocked over in the cab, and before they could pick themselves up, Toby was away, with the truck screaming and yelling behind him. What none of them realised was that with the warmer weather, melted snow from the mountains had turned a quiet stream into a raging torrent, and that the supports of the bridge they were approaching had already been undermined. Toby and his crew saw it together. The bridge vanished before their eyes, leaving rails like tightropes stretched across the gap. Peep, 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 whistled Toby. His driver, still dazed, fought for control. Shut regulator, reverse a hard over, full steam against the trucks. Hold them, boy, hold them, it's up to you. Nearer and nearer they came. Toby whistled despairingly. Though their speed was reduced, braking was still risky. But it was all or nothing now. The driver braked hard. Toby went into a squealing slide, groaned fearfully, and stopped, still on the rails, but with his wheels treading the tightrope over the abyss. Mavis was horrified. She brought some men who anchored Toby with ropes, while she pulled the trucks away. Then she ran to the rescue. Hold on, Toby, she tooted. I'm coming. Ropes were fastened between the two engines. Toby still had steam and was able to help. So he was soon safe on firm track, and saying thank you to Mavis. I'm sorry about the trucks, said Mavis. I can't think how you managed to stop them in time. Oh, well, said Toby. My drivers told me about circus people who walk tightropes. I just didn't fancy doing it myself. The fat controller thanked the manager and his men for rescuing Toby from his tightrope. A very smart piece of work, he said. Mavis did well, too, I hear. Mavis looked ashamed. It was my fault about those trucks, sir, she faltered. I didn't know. But if I could... Could what? smiled the fat controller. Come down the line sometime, sir. Toby says you'll show me how to go on. Certainly, if your manager agrees. And so it was arranged. Mavis is now a welcome visitor at Farker Shed. She's still young and still makes mistakes. But she's never too proud to ask Toby. And Toby always helps her to put things right.